The Adventure of Self-Discovery, Dimensions of Consciousness and New Perspectives in Psychotherapy and Inner Exploration Stanislav Grof Introduction If you will know yourselves, then you will be known and you will know that you are the sons of the Living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you are in poverty and you are poverty. Jesus, the Gospel according to Thomas Knowing others is wisdom, knowing the self is enlightenment. Mastering others requires force, mastering self needs strength. Lao Tzu, Tao Te I Ching Know thyself. Socrates Several profound personal experiences with psychedelic substances and clinical observations of their effects in psychiatric patients attracted my attention early in my professional career to the remarkable healing and transformative potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Systematic exploration of the theoretical significance and practical value of these states has been the central focus on my research for over three decades. During the first 20 years, this work focused almost exclusively on various psychedelic substances, it was carried out initially in several research facilities in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and later in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in Baltimore, Maryland. This work convinced me that psychedelics if used properly and judiciously under expert guidance represent extraordinary tools for psychiatry and psychology. Instead of inducing drug-specific states like other pharmaca, they function more like unspecific catalysts or amplifiers of the unconscious processes. By increasing the energetic niveau of the human psyche, they reveal its deep contents and intrinsic dynamics. Clinical work with LSD and other psychedelics thus is not the study of a powerful and exotic psychoactive substance or a group of compounds, but probably the most promising avenue of research of the human psyche and nature. The findings from psychedelic explorations are directly applicable to other situations in which consciousness is altered by various non-pharmacological means. They throw entirely new light on the material from history, comparative religion and anthropology concerning the ancient mysteries of death and rebirth, rites of passage of various cultures, shamanic procedures of all times, aboriginal healing ceremonies, spiritual practices of various religious and mystical traditions, and other phenomena of great cultural significance. Non-ordinary states of consciousness that occur in these various contexts are in some instances induced by the use of sacred psychedelic plants, see the discussion in the appendix of this book, and in others by powerful non-drug techniques that combine in various ways respiratory maneuvers, chanting, drumming, monotonous dancing, sensory overload, social and sensory isolation, fasting, and sleep deprivation. It is interesting to notice that the spectrum of experiences induced by psychedelic compounds is practically indistinguishable from those resulting from various non-drug techniques. Similar phenomena can also be observed in the work with modern laboratory methods that can facilitate non-ordinary states of consciousness. Here belong, for example, various forms of biofeedback, sessions in a sensory isolation cabin or tank, application of optical or acoustic overload, sleep and dream deprivation, the use of kinesthetic devices, such as the witch's cradle or the rotating couch, photic and acoustic stimulation of the brain, and others. Also the phenomena experienced by some subjects in a hypoxic chamber can resemble psychedelic states. It is of special interest in view of the main focus of this book that the entire spectrum of experiences observed in psychedelic sessions can be induced by various forms of non-drug experiential psychotherapies, such as exploratory hypnosis, primal therapy, neo reikian work, gestalt practice, nude marathon, and aqua energetics, and different varieties of rebirthing. As I will describe later in detail, this experiential spectrum is also characteristic of holotropic therapy, a powerful technique that my wife Christina and I have been using in the last 10 years. I should also mention in this context two situations where non-ordinary states of consciousness occur unsolicited under the circumstances of everyday life. Here belong, above all, episodes of unusual experiences, that certain individuals experience spontaneously for unknown reasons. These are currently seen by traditional psychiatry as medical problems, manifestations of diseases of mysterious etiology. The second category of unsolicited non-ordinary states of consciousness are near-death experiences, NDE, 
that are reported by approximately 40% of the individuals facing life-threatening situations. In some of the situations described above, we have to rely on historical reconstructions. Others require field research in alien cultures and under difficult conditions, or are too elemental and unpredictable for systematic scientific study. The fact that the phenomena involved have their parallels in psychedelic states offers a unique opportunity to study them under controlled conditions of a clinical or laboratory experiment. This is of particular interest, because the observations of non-ordinary states of consciousness have important implications for many other fields of research. The new data are of such far-reaching relevance that they could revolutionize our understanding of the human psyche, of psychopathology, and of the therapeutic process. Some of the observations transcend in their significance the framework of psychology and psychiatry and represent a serious challenge to the current Newtonian-Cartesian paradigm of Western science. They could change drastically our image of human nature, of culture, and history, and of reality. Because of widespread unsupervised use of psychedelic drugs, and ensuing legal political, and administrative measures, psychedelic research has become increasingly difficult and unpopular. It has been, therefore, particularly exciting for me to discover during the last decade of my professional work that it is possible to induce practically the entire spectrum of the psychedelic phenomena by simple and safe non-pharmacological means. Together with my wife Christina, I have been able to develop a technique that is particularly effective in this regard. This approach that we call holonernic integration, or holotropic therapy, is based theoretically on the observations from psychedelic research. It combines in a particular way controlled breathing, music and other types of sound technology, focused body work, and mandala drawing. Our own experience with this technique has been limited to experiential workshops lasting up to four weeks. We have not had the opportunity to subject it to rigorous evaluation in controlled clinical studies, comparable to my research in psychedelic therapy in Baltimore. However, most participants in our workshops found this technique to be an effective and exciting tool for surf exploration with an unusual potential for mediating transformative and mystical experiences. They repeatedly described it as being far superior to any form of verbal therapy they had tried earlier. Even within the limited framework of short workshops, we have seen many dramatic improvements of various emotional and psychosomatic conditions, often quite severe and of long duration. In many instances, informal feedback by correspondence, by telephone calls, or during a later meeting, confirmed that these changes were lasting. Several colleagues who had trained with us and later started using this approach in their hospitals reached similar conclusions. During the last 10 years, we have used holotropic breathing with many thousands of participants in our workshops in North and South America, different European countries, Australia and Asia and have found it equally effective in all these areas of the world, in spite of the great cultural differences involved. This book is a response to repeated requests for a manual presenting the basic information on the theory and practice of holotropic therapy in a simple and easily readable form that could be used both by professionals and general public. In my previous books, the primary focus was on psychedelic work, which certainly narrowed considerably the circles of interested readers. Because many of the new observations could not be reconciled with traditional conceptual frameworks, I had to present the material in the context of technical discussions about psychological theories and to include the dialogue between Newtonian Cartesian science and the emerging paradigm. The present book differs from my previous writings in many important aspects. Although it contains many references to psychedelic research and descriptions of psychedelic states, its main emphasis is on simple, non-pharmacological techniques of surf exploration that are easily available to the general public and are not restricted by anti-drug laws and other issues that complicate psychedelic experimentation. All interested readers should be able to find an opportunity to test the claims of this book in special experiential workshops under proper guidance. I have also refrained from including technical discussions relating the new material to the body of accepted knowledge in psychology and other scientific disciplines. I presume that the general intellectual climate has changed to such an extent that many readers either are familiar with the arguments I would bring forth or will be able to accept the data without it. Since I have covered the above topics in my previous writings, 
I will include references to these books for those readers who would find the theoretical context necessary, useful, or interesting. The basic findings of my clinical research with psychedelics are discussed in considerable detail in my book LSD Psychotherapy. The relationship between the new concepts and the major schools of depth psychology has been thoroughly explored in my last book, Beyond the Brain, Birth, Death, and Transcendence in Psychotherapy. The section on the architecture of emotional disorders is of particular relevance for the present volume and can be considered its important complement. The book Beyond the Brain also has an extensive discussion on scientific paradigms and on the limitations of Newtonian Cartesian thinking in science. In this context, the data from modem consciousness research are compared with the revolutionary developments in other scientific disciplines and with different aspects of the emerging paradigm. I would like this book to be an easily readable guide for self-exploration and effective psychotherapy and do not want to burden it by lengthy excursions into related problem areas to justify certain statements or to make them more believable. The ultimate proof for the readers will have to be personal experience. Without it, much of what is described in this book will probably remain unconvincing, even when supported by the most elaborate intellectual arguments. The first part of this book focuses on the extended cartography of the psyche that I have developed during my clinical work with psychedelics. It describes the basic types of experiences that become available to an average person whenever he or she gets involved in serious self-exploration with psychedelics or various powerful non-pharmacological experiential techniques. While the model of the human psyche used in traditional academic psychotherapy is conceptually limited to the recollective analytical level, this new cartography includes two additional levels that are transbiographical. These are the perinatal level, characterized by emphasis on the twin phenomena of birth and death, and the transpersonal level that can in principle mediate experiential connection with any aspect of the phenomenal world and with various mythological and archetypal domains. I consider the knowledge of this cartography to be indispensable for safe and effective inner quest. The second part of the present volume discusses for the first time in detail the basic principles of holotropic therapy, an eclectic technique of non-drug psychotherapy that I have briefly mentioned earlier. This approach can be used as an independent procedure, as a complement to psychedelic therapy, or in combination with other types of experiential psychotherapy and various forms of body work. Although the description and discussion of holotropic therapy presented in this book cannot replace actual training that has to involve personal experience and supervised work with others, it contains all the necessary information for experiencers as well as facilitators. A special section focuses on those effective mechanisms of healing and personality transformation that operate in non-ordinary states of consciousness, whether spontaneous, drug-induced or occurring during sessions of various non-pharmacological forms of psychotherapy. Although most of these mechanisms represent new principles in the Western therapeutic armamentarium, they are actually ancient, since time immemorial, they have played an important role in shamanic practices, healing rituals, and rites of passage. They are now being rediscovered and reformulated in modern scientific terms. The book then closes with a discussion of the potential and the goals of experiential self-exploration utilizing the therapeutic and transformative power of non-ordinary states of consciousness. It describes how, in this process, emotional and psychosomatic healing is combined with a movement toward a more fulfilling strategy of life and a search for answers to the fundamental ontological and cosmological questions of existence. The appendix on psychedelic therapy is included to complete the book both historically and thematically. As I mentioned earlier, the technique of holotropic therapy grew out of the work with psychedelics and is perfectly compatible with it. Although psychedelic therapy is nowadays practically unavailable, some readers might find this section of interest, either because they already have had some psychedelic experiences, or for purely theoretical reasons. It is my hope that sometime in the not-too-distant future these unique tools will be returned to psychiatry and psychology. If and when that happens, psychedelics could then become part of a therapeutic continuum that would include transpersonally oriented interviews, Jungian sand play, various forms of meditation, gestalt practice, body work, holotropic therapy, an entire spectrum of psychedelic substances, and possibly other approaches compatible with the above.
All these techniques that complement each other and work in the same direction could then be used with flexibility and sensitivity for safe and effective psychotherapy and self-exploration. I have written this book in the hope that at least some of the readers would find it a useful companion and guide in their adventure of self-discovery and pursuit of self-knowledge that many great philosophers and sages considered to be among the noblest goals of human beings. 1. Dimensions of Consciousness New Cartography of the Human Psyche Traditional psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy use a model of the human personality that is limited to biography and to the individual unconscious as described by Sigmund Freud. This approach might appear adequate in the context of psychotherapeutic self-exploration that uses techniques relying on verbal exchange, such as free associations or face-to-face -face interviews. However, such a model is inadequate for understanding the dynamics of emotional and psychosomatic healing, personality transformation, and consciousness evolution that occur with powerful techniques, such as psychedelic therapy, healing trance dance, or certain experiential approaches in modem psychotherapy. Such techniques activate and mobilize deep unconscious and superconscious levels of the human psyche and require a vastly expanded conceptual framework. An individual who uses them for self-exploration or as a therapist has to have a model or cartography of the psyche that includes trans-biographical domains. We ourselves consider the knowledge of such a cartography to be a necessary prerequisite for any serious inner work and include its discussion in the preparation for both the psychedelic work and holotropic therapy. Although the model described in the following text was first developed for understanding the dynamics of psychedelic sessions, it is equally applicable to in-depth experiential work with non-drug approaches. The new cartography includes the traditional biographical recollective level and two major transbiographical levels the perinatal domain related to the experiences of birth and death, and the transpersonal domain. The experiences of all the above categories. Biographical, perinatal, and transpersonal are quite readily available for most people. They can be observed in sessions with psychedelic drugs, in those forms of experiential psychotherapy using breathing, music, dance, and body work, and, quite regularly, in dreams. Laboratory mind-altering techniques, such as biofeedback, sleep deprivation, sensory isolation, or sensory overload, and various kinesthetic devices can also induce many of these phenomena. There exists a wide spectrum of ancient and oriental spiritual practices that are specifically designed to facilitate access to the perinatal and transpersonal domains. For this reason, it is not accidental that the new model of the psyche shows great similarity to those developed over centuries or even millennia by various great mystical traditions. The entire experiential spectrum has also been described by historians, anthropologists, and students of comparative religion in the context of various shamanic procedures, aboriginal rites of passage and healing ceremonies, death-rebirth mysteries, and trance-dancing in ecstatic religions. Recent consciousness research has thus made it possible for the first time to review seriously ancient and non-Western knowledge about consciousness and to approach a genuine synthesis of age-old wisdom and modern science. The fact that many perinatal and transpersonal experiences can also occur during spontaneous episodes of non-ordinary states of consciousness has far-reaching consequences for the understanding and treatment of many conditions that traditional psychiatry interprets as psychotic and thus indicative of mental disease. In the light of the new observations, they can be seen as transpersonal crises or spiritual emergencies. When properly understood and treated, such crises can be conducive to emotional and psychosomatic healing, personality transformation, and consciousness evolution. The sensory barrier and the recollective biographical level. The techniques that mediate experiential access to the unconscious tend to activate initially the sensory organs. As a result of this, deep self-exploration starts for many people with a variety of unspecific sensory experiences, such as elementary visions of colors and geometrical patterns, hearing of ringing or buzzing sounds, tactile sensations in various parts of the body, tastes, or smells. These are of a more or less abstract nature, they do not seem to have any deeper symbolic meaning, and have little significance for self-exploration and self-understanding. They seem to represent a sensory barrier that one has to pass through before the journey into one's psyche can begin. As the process continues, 
the next most easily available realm of the psyche is usually the recollective biographical level and the individual unconscious. Although the phenomena belonging to this category are of considerable theoretical and practical relevance, it is not necessary to spend much time on their description. The reason for this is that most of the traditional psychotherapeutic approaches have been limited to this level of the psyche. Abundant professional literature discusses the nuances of psychodynamics in the biographical realm. Unfortunately, various schools contradict each other and there is little agreement as to what the significant factors in the psyche are, why psychopathology develops, and how effective psychotherapy should be conducted. The experiences belonging to the recollective biographical level are related to significant biographical events and circumstances of the life of the individual from birth to the present. On this level of self-exploration, anything from the life of the person involved that is an unresolved conflict, a repressed memory that has not been integrated, or an incomplete psychological gestalt of some kind, can emerge from the unconscious and become the content of the experience. One condition necessary for the emergence of the memory is that the issue be of sufficient emotional relevance. Here lies one great advantage of experiential psychotherapy in comparison with verbal approaches. The techniques that can directly activate the unconscious seem to reinforce selectively the most relevant emotional material and facilitate its emergence into consciousness. They thus provide a kind of inner radar that scans the system and detects material with the strongest charge and emotional significance. This not only saves the therapist the effort of sorting the relevant from the irrelevant, but also relieves him or her from having to make such decisions, which would be necessarily biased by professional training adherence to a particular school, or personal factors. By and large, biographical material that emerges in experiential work is in agreement with the Freudian theory or one of its derivatives. However, there are several major differences. In deep experiential psychotherapy, biographical material is not remembered or reconstructed, it can actually be fully relived. This involves not only emotions, but also physical sensations, visual perceptions, as well as vivid data from all the other senses. This happens typically in complete age regression to the stage of development when the original events occurred. We have been able to demonstrate that the age regression observed in unusual states of consciousness is complete and authentic. A brief neurological examination of a person who is regressed to early childhood would give results characteristic for an infant and not an adult. This includes the presence of the sucking reflex and other so-called axial reflexes, and even a positive Babinski, a fan-like extension of the toes in response to stimulation of the lateral part of the sole of the foot by a sharp object. Another important distinction is that relevant memories and other biographical elements do not emerge separately, but form distinct dynamic constellations, for which I have coined the term COEX systems, or systems of condensed experience. A COEX system is a dynamic constellation of memories, and associated fantasy material, from different periods of the individual's life, whose common denominator is a strong emotional charge of the same quality, intense physical sensation of a particular kind, or shared additional important elements. Several typical examples of COEX systems, clinical illustrations of their dynamics, and a detailed discussion of their role in experiential surf exploration can be found in my book Realms of the Human Unconscious, Observations from LSD Psychotherapy. I first became aware of the COEX systems as principles governing the dynamics of the individual unconscious and realized that the knowledge of them was essential for understanding the inner process on this level. However, it later became obvious that the systems of condensed experience represent general organizing principles operating on all levels of the psyche. Most biographical COEX systems are dynamically connected with specific facets of the birth process. Perinatal themes and their elements then have specific associations with related experiential material from the transpersonal domain. It is not uncommon for a dynamic constellation to comprise material from several biographical periods, from biological birth, and from certain areas of the transpersonal realm, such as past incarnation memories, animal identification, and mythological sequences. In this context, experiential similarity of these themes from different levels of the psyche is more important than the conventional criteria of the Newtonian-Cartesian worldview, 
such as the fact that years or centuries separate the events involved, that there ordinarily seems to exist an abysmal difference between the human and the animal experience of the world, or that elements of objective reality are combined with archetypal and mythological themes. The last major difference between verbal and experiential psychotherapies is the emphasis that experiential therapies place on the importance of direct physical traumatization for the psychological history of the individual. In traditional psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy, the exclusive emphasis is on psychological traumas. Physical traumas are not seen as having a direct influence on the psychological development of the individual and as participating in the psychogenesis of emotional and psychosomatic disorders. This perspective contrasts sharply with the observations from deep experiential work, where memories of physical traumas appear to be of paramount importance. In psychedelic work, holotropic therapy and other powerful experiential approaches, Reliving of life-threatening diseases, injuries, operations, or situations of near-drowning are extremely common, and their significance exceeds by far that of the usual psychotraumas. The residual emotions and physical sensations from situations that threaten survival or the integrity of the organism appear to have a significant role in the development of various forms of psychopathology, as yet unrecognized by academic science. Let us consider as an illustration a child who has a serious disease that threatens his or her life, such as diphtheria, and almost chokes to death. The parents call the ambulance and an emergency transfer to the hospital and a tracheotomy saves the life of this child in the last minute. In the context of traditional psychotherapy, the experience of vital threat and extreme physical discomfort would not be considered to be a trauma of lasting significance. Rather, the focus would be on the fact that the child was separated from his or her mother at the time of hospitalization, experienced emotional deprivation, and was frightened by the shrill sound of the ambulance siren, the interaction with strangers, and the stay in an alien environment. Conversely, a psychosomatic symptom such as asthma, psychogenic pain, or hysterical paralysis would be interpreted as somatization of primarily psychological conflicts. Experiential work makes it obvious that traumas involving vital threat leave permanent traces in the system and contribute significantly to the development of emotional and psychosomatic problems, such as depressions, suicidal tendencies, anxiety states, and phobias, sadomasochistic inclinations, sexual dysfunctions, migraine headaches, or asthma. As a matter of fact, problems that have clearly psychosomatic manifestations can always be traced to unconscious themes on the biographical, perinatal, or transpersonal level, that involve physical traumatization as a significant element. The memories of serious physical traumas represent a natural link between the biographical realm of the psyche and the perinatal realm, which has as its main constituents the twin phenomena of birth and death. Physical traumas involve events from the individual's postnatal life and are thus biographical in nature. However, the fact that they brought the person close to death and involved extreme discomfort and pain connects them to the birth trauma. For obvious reasons, memories of diseases and traumas that involved severe interference with breathing, such as pneumonia, diphtheria, whooping cough, or near drowning, are particularly significant in this context. Encounter with birth and death, dynamics of the perinatal matrices. As the process of experiential self-exploration deepens, the elements of emotional and physical pain can reach extraordinary intensity. They can become so extreme that the individual involved feels that he or she has transcended the boundaries of individual suffering and is experiencing the pain of entire groups of unfortunate people, all of humanity, or even all of life. It is not uncommon that persons whose inner process reaches this domain report experiential identification with wounded or dying soldiers of all ages prisoners in dungeons and concentration camps, persecuted Jews or early Christians, mothers and children in childbirth, or even animals who are attacked by predators or tortured and slaughtered. This level of the human unconscious thus clearly represents an intersection between biographical experiences and the spectrum of transpersonal experiences that will be described in the next section. Experiences on this level of the unconscious are typically accompanied by dramatic physiological manifestations, such as various degrees of suffocation, accelerated pulse rate and palpitations, nausea and vomiting, changes in the color of the complexion, oscillation of body temperature, 
spontaneous occurrence of skin eruptions and bruises, or tremors, twitches, contortions, twisting movements and other striking motor manifestations. In psychedelic sessions and occasionally in non-drug experiential sessions or in spontaneously occurring states of mind, these phenomena can be so authentic and convincing that the person involved can believe that he or she is actually dying. Even an inexperienced sitter or witness of such episodes can perceive such situations as serious vital emergencies. On the biographical level, only those persons who actually have had during their lifetime a serious brush with death would be dealing with the issue of survival or impermanence. In contrast, when the inner process transcends biography, the problems related to suffering and death can entirely dominate the picture. Those individuals whose postnatal life history did not involve serious threat to survival or body integrity can enter this experiential domain directly. In others, reliving of serious physical traumas, diseases, or operations functions as an experiential bridge to this realm. Thus reliving of childhood pneumonia, diphtheria, whooping cough, or near drowning can deepen into reliving of the suffocation experienced at birth. Profound confrontation with death characteristic for these experiential sequences tends to be intimately interwoven with a variety of phenomena that are clearly related to the process of biological birth. While facing agony and dying, individuals simultaneously experience themselves as struggling to be born and slash or delivering. In addition, many of the physiological and behavioral concomitants of these experiences can be naturally explained as derivatives of the birth process. It is quite common in this context to identify with a fetus and relieve various aspects of one's biological birth with quite specific and verifiable details. The element of death can be represented by simultaneous or alternating identification with sick, aging or dying individuals. Although the entire spectrum of these experiences cannot be reduced just to reliving of biological birth, the birth trauma seems to represent an important core of the experiential process on this level. For this reason, I refer to this realm of the unconscious as perinatal. The term perinatal is a Greek Latin composite word in which the prefix peri means around or near, and the root natalis denotes relation to birth. It is commonly used in medicine to describe processes that immediately precede childbirth, are associated with it, or immediately follow it. Medical texts thus refer to perinatal hemorrhage, infection, or brain damage. In contrast to the traditional use of this word in obstetrics, the term perinatal is used in this book in relation to experiences. Current neurophysiology denies the possibility of birth memories, the reason usually given is the lack of maturity of the not yet fully myelinized cerebral cortex of the newborn. However, the existence of authentic perinatal experiences cannot be denied. The frequency of their occurrence and paramount clinical significance should serve as an incentive for brain researchers to review and revise their outdated theories. The connection between biological birth and perinatal experiences described above is quite deep and specific. This makes it possible to use the clinical stages of delivery in constructing a conceptual model that helps us to understand the dynamics of the perinatal level of the unconscious and even to make specific predictions in relation to the death-rebirth process in different individuals. Perinatal exuriances occur in typical clusters whose basic characteristics are related through deep experiential logic to anatomical, physiological, and biochemical aspects of those clinical stages of birth with which they are associated. Thinking in terms of the birth model provides new and unique insights into the dynamic architecture of various forms of psychopathology and offers revolutionary therapeutic possibilities. In spite of its dose connection to childbirth, the perinatal process transcends biology and has important psychological, philosophical, and spiritual dimensions. It should not be, therefore, interpreted in a mechanistic and reductionistic fashion. An individual who is dealing with the powerful dynamics of the perinatal process experientially or as a researcher can get deeply immersed in it and tend to see birth in all explanatory principle. From a broader perspective, this is a limited approach that must be transcended. Currently, thinking in terms of the birth process is a very useful model whose applicability is limited to the phenomena of a specific level of the unconscious. When the process of experiential self-exploration moves to transpersonal realms of the psyche, an entirely new way of thinking becomes mandatory. 
Certain important characteristics of the perinatal process clearly suggest that it is a much broader phenomenon than reliving a biological birth. Observations from clinical work with non-ordinary states of consciousness show that many forms of psychopathology have deep roots in the biological aspects of birth. Experimental sequences of death and rebirth have profound therapeutic effect on various emotional and psychosomatic problems related to the traumatic impact of childbirth, both on the child and the mother. However, they have also important transpersonal dimensions and are conducive to profound changes in the philosophical and spiritual belief system, basic hierarchy of values, and general life strategy. Deep experiential encounter with birth and death is typically associated with an existential crisis of extraordinary proportions during which the individual seriously questions the meaning of his or her life and existence in general. This crisis can be successfully resolved only by connecting with the intrinsic spiritual dimensions of the psyche and deep resources of the collective unconscious. The resulting personality transformation and consciousness evolution can be compared to the changes described in the context of ancient death rebirth mysteries, initiation to secret societies, and various aboriginal rites of passage. The perinatal level of the unconscious, therefore, represents an important interface between the individual and the collective unconscious, or between traditional psychology and mysticism. The experiences of death and rebirth reflecting the perinatal level of the unconscious are rich and complex. Sequences related to various stages and facets of biological birth are typically intertwined or associated with many mythological, mystical, archetypal, historical, sociopolitical, anthropological, or phylogenetic transpersonal experiences. These tend to appear in four characteristic experiential patterns or constellations, and a deep connection seems to exist between these thematic clusters and the clinical stages of childbirth. Connecting with the experiences of the fetus in the stages of the biological birth process functions as a selective stencil providing experiential access to specific domains of the collective unconscious involving similar states of consciousness. It has proved very useful for the theory and practice of deep experiential work to postulate the existence of four hypothetical dynamic matrices governing the processes related to the perinatal level of the unconscious and refer to them as basic perinatal matrices, BPMS. In addition to having specific emotional and psychosomatic content, they also function as organizing principles for material from other levels of the unconscious. From the biographical level, Elements of important COEX systems that deal with physical abuse and violation, threat, separation, pain, and suffocation or, conversely, with states of biological and emotional satisfaction, are closely related to specific aspects of BPMS. The perinatal unfolding is also frequently accompanied by transpersonal experiences, such as archetypal visions of the Great Mother or the Terrible Mother Goddess, Heft, Purgatory, Heaven, or Paradise identification with animals, and past incarnation experiences. As it is the case with the various associated COEX systems, the connecting link between these transpersonal phenomena and the BPMS is similarity of the emotions or physical sensations involved. The basic perinatal matrices have also specific relations to different aspects of the activities in the Freudian erogenous zones and to various forms of psychopathology. In the following text, I will describe the BPMS in the order in which the corresponding stages of birth follow each other during childbirth. This order is seldom repeated in the process of deep experiential self-exploration, here the themes of the different matrices can occur in many variations of sequential patterns. First basic perinatal matrix, BPM1 The Amniotic Universe the biological basis of this matrix is the original symbiotic unity of the fetus with the maternal organism at the time of the prenatal intrauterine existence. During episodes of undisturbed life in the womb, the conditions of the fetus can be close to ideal. However, a variety of factors of physical, chemical, biological, and psychological nature can seriously interfere with this state. Also, during later stages of pregnancy the situation might become less favorable because of the size of the child, increasing mechanical constraint, and the relative insufficiency of the placenta. Perinatal experiences can be relived in a concrete biological form or in combination with a variety of symbolic images and other phenomena with which they are connected. 
The relationship between the individual stages of birth and the associated themes is quite specific and selective and reflects deep experiential logic. Identification with the fetus in various stages of the birth process seems to provide selective access to themes in the transpersonal domain that involve similar emotional states and psychosomatic experiences. Some of these themes have the form of archetypal sequences, others depict situations from the collective memory banks of humanity, or even from the holographic archives of nature related to the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdoms. Thus, the elements of the undisturbed intrauterine state can be accompanied by, or alternate with, experiences that share with it the lack of boundaries and obstructions. Here belong deep experiential identification with the ocean or various aquatic life forms, algae, kelp, anemone, jellyfish, fish, dolphin, or whale, or with the cosmos, interstellar space, galaxy, or with an astronaut floating in weightless condition in cosmic space or in an orbiting spaceship. Also images of nature at its best, which is beautiful, safe, and unconditionally nourishing, Mother Nature, represent characteristic and quite logical concomitants of the blissful fetal state. Archetypal themes from the collective unconscious that can be accessed in this context involve heavens and paradises of different cultures of the world. This seems to make deep sense, since archetypal descriptions of heavens often refer to vast open spaces, sky, radiant celestial bodies such as the sun or stars, and other elements and characteristics of the astronomical cosmos. Similarly, the images of paradise in different cultures reflect nature at its best, with descriptions of beautiful flowers, luscious fruits, exotic birds, the luster of gold, silver and precious stones and streams or fountains of the water of life. All the above experiences have a very strong numinous aspect. However, the extreme expression of the sacred and spiritual quality of BPM-1 is the experience of cosmic unity and unio mystica. This is characterized by transcendence of time and space, overwhelmingly strong ecstatic feelings, Apollonian or oceanic ecstasy, a sense of unity of all existence with no boundaries, and deep reverence and love for all creation. The disturbances of intrauterine life are associated with images and experiences of underwater dangers, polluted streams, lakes, or oceans, and contaminated or otherwise inhospitable nature, such as toxic soil and mud after volcanic eruptions, industrial dumps, and junkyards, deserts and wastelands. These are appropriate images, considering the fact that most intrauterine disturbances involve toxic placentary influences or insufficient nourishment. More violent interferences, such as an imminent miscarriage or attempted abortion, are experienced as some form of a universal threat or are associated with bloody apocalyptic visions of the end of the world. Equally as common as the above imagery is identification with soldiers exposed to chemical warfare, prisoners dying in the gas chambers of the Nazi concentration camps, and persons or animals who have been poisoned. The most common concomitant archetypal images involve various insidious demons, evil metaphysical forces, and malefic astral influences experienced in the mythological framework of various cultures of the world. In the context of such experiences, the mystical dissolution of boundaries characteristic of blissful fetal episodes is replaced by psychotic distortion and disintegration of all familiar and reliable structures, accompanied by terror and paranoia. Positive aspects of the first perinatal matrix are closely related to memories of the symbiotic union with mother on the breast, to positive COEX systems, and to recollections of situations associated with relaxation, satisfaction, security, peace of mind, and beautiful natural scenery, and exquisite artistic creations. Similar selective connections exist also to various forms of positive transpersonal experiences with related themes. Conversely, negative aspects of BPM-1 tend to associate with certain negative COEX systems and with corresponding negative transpersonal matrices. With regard to the Freudian erogenous zones, the positive aspects of BPM-1 coincide with the biological and psychological condition in which there exist no tensions in any of these areas and in which all the partial drives are satisfied. Negative aspects of BPM-1 seem to have specific links to nausea, dyspepsia, and intestinal dysfunction. I will illustrate the dynamics of the individual perinatal matrices with examples from the records of my own psychedelic training sessions. The following is an excerpt from a high-dose LSD experience 
300 micrograms, that was influenced primarily by BPM-1. We have observed many similar experiences in sessions of holotropic breathing. I felt the need to curl up and had a sense of getting progressively smaller. I was floating in a luminescent liquid surrounded by some translucent gossamer veils. It was easy to identify this state as a deep regression, a return into fetal existence. A subtle, but profound feeling of bliss and imperturbable peace, peace that passeth all understanding was filling my entire being. My state involved a strange paradox, I was becoming smaller and smaller, shrinking into absolute nothingness, and yet it seemed that I had no boundaries and was reaching into infinity. My fantasy playfully offered the idea that I was a graceful jellyfish, leisurely floating in the ocean, propelled by gentle squirts of water. This initially tentative, almost dreamlike, identification became gradually more and more real. I had very primitive phylogenetic sensations that were extremely convincing and experienced a variety of strange processes that had nothing to do with ordinary human experience. This slowly changed into equally convincing identification with various kinds of fish, seahorses, anemones, and even kelp, all which were authentic and astonishing in biological detail. But underlying all these experiences was an overarching feeling of being a fetus floating in the amniotic sac and connected with the maternal organism by the umbilical cord and the placentary circulation. I was aware of a complex and rich exchange between us that was partly biochemical and physiological, partly emotional, and even telepathic. At one point the theme of blood as a sacred life-giving substance dominated my experience. I was aware of the placentary connection with my mother and clearly sensed the flow of blood through the arterial and venous circuits, the passage of oxygen and nourishment, and the disposal of metabolic products. This was interspersed with various archetypal, mythological themes focused on the significance of blood and its numinous properties. With a subtle shift of emphasis, I could also connect with a more superficial aspect of the same experience and authentic identification with a nursing infant where the sacred nourishing substance was milk. Occasionally, the positive experiences were interrupted by waves of strong physical and emotional discomfort and a sense of some mysterious undefined threat. This condition seemed to have a definite chemical component. I felt sick, nauseated, intoxicated, poisoned. A horrible taste in my mouth made me want to vomit. At the same time I felt possessed or overtaken by some dark metaphysical forces. When these episodes of demonic assault subsided, my experiential field cleared and I returned to deep oceanic bliss. I concluded that this must have been reliving of situations when the intrauterine conditions were disturbed by some adverse events in the maternal organism. As the experience was subsiding, the oceanic milieu changed into vast interstellar space. I felt like an astronaut floating in the immense cosmic ocean without boundaries, connected by a life-supporting pipeline to the mother ship, while simultaneously maintaining identification with a fetus. The star-filled universe with its distinct Milky Way and its millions of galaxies gave me a sense of tranquility and equanimity that I had never imagined were possible. Its immensity and timelessness made events of any kind and scope appear to be insignificant ripples. As the session was coming to an end, the experience focused on the Earth, yet its timeless quality continued in a somewhat different form. Like a gigantic statue of Buddha that cannot be moved by the turmoil and chaos of human life in repeated cycles of death and rebirth, I became a sequoia tree witnessing unperturbed the passage of time throughout millennia. And as if to emphasize that size is of no import in the world of consciousness, the experience transformed me into a tiny bristle cone pine in the high Sierra mountains whose existence also bridges thousands of years. Returning to my normal consciousness, I was filled with gratitude for the miracle of life and the gifts of nature. I saw many images of Mother Earth nourishing all her children, green luscious pastures, fields of ripening wheat and corn, orchards abounding in fruits, agricultural terraces of the Peruvian Andes, the life-giving valley of the Nile, and the earthly paradise of the Polynesian Islands. Second Basic Perinatal Matrix, BPM2 Cosmic Engulfment and No Exit this experiential pattern is related to the onset of biological delivery and to its first clinical stage. Here the original harmony and equilibrium of the fetal existence is disturbed, first by alarming chemical signals and later by mechanical contractions of the uterus. 
With this stage fully developed, the fetus is periodically constricted by uterine spasms. At this point, the system is entirely closed, the cervix is not dilated and the way out is not yet available. Since the arteries supplying the placenta follow a winding course through the complex spiral, circular and longitudinal fabric of the uterine musculature, each contraction restricts the supply of blood and thus oxygen, nourishment and warmth to the fetus. Concrete memories of the threat that the onset of the delivery represents for the fetus have their symbolic concomitant in the experience of cosmic engulfment. This involves overwhelming feelings of increasing anxiety and the awareness of an imminent vital danger. The source of this danger cannot be clearly identified and the subject has a tendency to interpret the world in paranoid terms. This can result in a convinced sense of being poisoned, influenced by hypnosis or by a diabolic machine, possessed by a demonic force, or attacked by extraterrestrials. Characteristic of this situation is the experience of a three-dimensional spiral, funnel, or whirlpool sucking the subject relentlessly toward its center. A closely related equivalent to this annihilating maelstrom is the experience of being swallowed by a terrifying monster, such as a giant dragon, leviathan, python, crocodile, or whale. Equally frequent in this context are experiences of attack by a monstrous octopus or tarantula. A less dramatic version of the same experience is the theme of descent into a dangerous underworld, realm of the dead, system of dark grottos, or mystifying labyrinth. Corresponding mythological themes are the beginning of the hero's journey, the fall of the angels, and paradise lost. Some of these images might appear strange to the analytical mind, however, they show deep experiential logic. Thus the whirlpool represents a serious danger to an organism enjoying free-floating in a watery environment and imposes on it a dangerous unidirectional motion. Similarly, the situation of being swallowed changes freedom into a life-threatening confinement comparable to the situation of a fetus wedged into the pelvic opening. An octopus entangles, confines, and threatens organisms living in the oceanic milieu. A spider traps and restricts insects who previously flew freely in an unobstructed world and seriously endangers their life. The symbolic counterpart of a fully developed first clinical stage of delivery is the experience of no exit or hell. It involves a sense of being stuck, encaged, or trapped in a claustrophobic, nightmarish world and an experience of incredible psychological and physical tortures. The situation is typically unbearable and appears to be endless and hopeless. The individual loses the sense of linear time and cannot see the possibility of an end to this torment or any form of active escape from it. This can be associated with experiential identification with prisoners in dungeons or concentration camps, inmates of insane asylums, sinners in hell, or archetypal figures, such as Ahasuerus the Wandering Jew, the Flying Dutchman, Sisyphus, Ixion, Tantalus, or Prometheus. Quite frequent also are images and experiences of people and animals dying lonely deaths of starvation or in inhospitable natural settings, such as deserts and the freezing cold of Siberia or of the Arctic ice. The logic of these themes reflects the fact that the contractions of the uterus cut off the placentary blood supply for the fetus, which represents not only meaningful connection with the world and human contact, but also the source of nourishment and warmth. While under the influence of this matrix, the subject is also selectively blinded for anything positive in the world and in his or her life. Agonizing feelings of metaphysical loneliness, helplessness, hopelessness, inferiority, inadequacy, existential despair, and guilt are standard constituents of this state of consciousness. Through the prism of this matrix, human life appears as an absolutely meaningless theater of the absurd, as a farce staging cardboard characters and mindless robots, or as a cruel circus sideshow. As far as the organizing function of BPM2 is concerned, it attracts and is connected with COEX systems which involve situations of a passive and helpless victim subjected to an overwhelming destructive force without a chance of escaping. It also has affinity to transpersonal themes with similar qualities. With regard to the Freudian erogenous zones, this matrix seems to be related to conditions that involve unpleasant tension, pain, and frustration. On the oral level, it is hunger, thirst, nausea, and painful stimuli, on the anal level, retention of feces, and on the urethral level, retention of urine. 
The corresponding sensations on the genital level are sexual frustration and the pains experienced by delivering women in the first clinical stage of labor. The following account of my psychedelic session with 300 micrograms of LSD is a typical illustration of an experience governed predominantly by BPM2, with a few initial themes bridging the biographical and perinatal levels and with elements of BPM4 in the terminal phase. The experiences characterizing the second matrix are separated in the text by brackets. The session started on an optimistic note about 40 minutes after the ingestion of the drug. I felt that I was rapidly regressing into the carefree world of a satisfied infant. My physical feelings, emotions, and perceptions were extremely primitive and authentically infantile, this was associated with automatic sucking movements of my lips, profuse salivation, and occasional burping. This was periodically interrupted by visions depicting various aspects of the hectic and driven life of an average adult, full of tension, conflict, and pain. As I compared these with the paradisaical state of an infant, I suddenly connected with the deep craving that we all have to return to this primal condition of infantile happiness. I saw the image of the Pope with a bejeweled cross and an ornate ring with a large gem on his hand, masses of people looked up to him full of great expectation. This was followed by visions of countless thousands of Muslims surrounding the Kaaba in Mecca with the same sense of deep longing. And then anonymous crowds with red banners looked up to gigantic images of communist leaders during a parade in Moscow's Red Square and millions of Chinese worshipped Chairman Mao. I felt strongly that the driving force behind such great religious and social movements was the need to reenact the state of fulfillment and satisfaction experienced in early infancy. As the effect of the drug increased, I suddenly felt an onslaught of panic anxiety. Everything became dark, oppressive, and threatening, the entire world seemed to be closing in on me. The images of the everyday misery that had previously appeared as contrasts to the problem-free world of the infant became overwhelming and unrelenting. They portrayed the absolute hopelessness of human existence, fraught with suffering from birth till death. At that point, I understood existential philosophers and authors of the theater of the absurd. They knew. Human life is absurd, monstrous, and utterly futile, it is a meaningless farce and a cruel joke played on humanity. We are born in suffering, we suffer throughout life, and we die suffering. I felt I was in touch simultaneously with the pain of birth and with the agony of dying. They merged for me into an inextricable amalgam. This led to a truly horrifying realization, human life ends in an experience that is similar to the one in which it began. The rest is just a matter of time t waiting for Godot. Was this what the Buddha was so clearly aware of? It seemed essential to me to find some meaning in life to counteract this devastating insight, there had to be something. But the experience was mercilessly and systematically destroying all my efforts. Every image I was able to conjure up to demonstrate there was meaning in human life was immediately followed by its negation and ridicule. The ancient Greek ideal of a brilliant mind in a beautiful body did not last very long. The physical shrines of the most enthusiastic and persistent bodybuilders end in the same senile marasmus to be eventually destroyed by death like all the others. The knowledge accumulated in thousands of hours of voracious study is partially forgotten and partially falls prey to the organic degeneration of the brain that comes with old age. I had seen individuals known for great intellectual accomplishments who in senility had to struggle with the simplest and most trivial tasks of everyday life. And the death of the body and the brain brings the final and complete annihilation of all the knowledge stored by the efforts of a lifetime. What about having children is that not a noble and meaningful goal? But the images of beautiful smiling children were immediately replaced by scenes showing them growing, getting older, and ultimately dying, too. One cannot give meaning to one's life by producing offspring whose lives are as meaningless as one's own. The images of absurdity and futility of human life eventually became unbearable. The world appeared to be full of pain, suffering, and death. Either I was selectively blinded to any positive aspects of existence, or there simply were not any. There were only incurable diseases, of which life was one, insanity, cruelties of all kinds, crime and violence, wars, revolutions, prisons, and concentration camps. How was it possible that I did not see all this before? To find anything positive in life, 
one must wear distorting rosy glasses and play a game of perpetual self-deception. It seemed that now my glasses had been broken, and I would never be able to fool myself again as I did before. I felt caught in a vicious circle of unbearable emotional and physical suffering that would last forever. There was no way out of this nightmarish world. It seemed clear that not even death, spontaneous or by suicide, could save me from it. This was hell. Several times, the experience actually took the form of archetypal images of infernal landscapes. However, I was gradually becoming aware that in all this gloomy philosophical perspective on life, there seemed to be a dimension that I previously had not noticed. My entire body felt mechanically squeezed and compressed and the maximum of this pressure was around my forehead. I realized that all this was somehow related to reliving of the memory of my biological birth, of the agonizing experience of the confinement in the birth canal. If that was the case, maybe there was a way out, maybe the situation only seemed to be hopeless, as it must have appeared to the struggling infant. Maybe the task was to complete the reliving of birth by an experience of emerging into the world. However, for a long time period that seemed like eternity, I was uncertain that this completion would actually happen, since it would require finding meaning in life. That dearly appeared to be an impossible task and if that was a necessary condition for liberation from this hellish situation, there was not much hope. Suddenly, without warning, the pressure was magically lifted in one single instant, and I was released from the clutches of the infernal birth canal. I felt flooded with light and indescribable joy and connected in a new way to the world and to the flow of life. Everything seemed fresh and sparkling, exploding into brilliant colors, as in the best of Van Gogh's paintings. I sensed a healthy appetite, a glass of milk, a simple sandwich, and some fruit tasted like the nectar and ambrosia of the Olympian gods. Later, I was able to review the experience in my mind and formulate for myself the great lessons about life I had learned. Deep religious and utopian craving in human beings does not reflect only the need for the simple happiness of the infant as I had seen it early in the session, but also the urgency to escape from the nightmarish memories of the trauma of birth into postnatal freedom and the oceanic bliss of the womb. And even that was only the surface. Behind all biologically determined needs there was also dearly a genuine craving for transcendence that could not be reduced to any simple formula of natural sciences. I understood that the lack of fulfillment in human life results from the fact that we have not come to terms with the trauma of birth and with the fear of death. We have been born only anatomically and have really not completed and integrated this process psychologically. Questions about meaning of life are symptomatic of this situation. Since life is cyclical and includes death, it is impossible to find meaning in it using reason and logic. One must be tuned into the flow of the life energy and enjoy one's existence, then the value of life is self-evident. And I felt after this experience like a surfer riding with great joy the wave of life. Third Basic Perinatal Matrix, BPM 3 The Death Rebirth Struggle Many important aspects of this complex experiential matrix can be understood from its association with the second clinical stage of childbirth. In this stage, the uterine contractions continue, but, unlike in the previous stage, the cervix is now dilated and allows gradual propulsion of the fetus through the birth canal. This involves an enormous struggle for survival, crushing mechanical pressures, and often a high degree of anoxia and suffocation. I have already mentioned that, because of the anatomical conditions, each uterine contraction restricts the blood supply to the fetus. In this stage of delivery, many complications can further reduce the circulation and cause suffocation. The umbilical cord can be squeezed between the head and the pelvic opening or be twisted around the neck. A cord that is short anatomically or shortened by forming loops around various parts of the body can pull on the placenta and detach it from the uterine wall. This disrupts the connection with the maternal organism and can cause a dangerous degree of suffocation. When the delivery culminates, the fetus can experience intimate contact with various forms of biological material, in addition to fetal liquid, this includes blood, mucus, urine, and even feces. From the phenomenological point of view, BPM-3 is an extremely rich and complex experiential pattern. In regressive therapy, it takes the form of a determined death-rebirth struggle. 
Beside actual realistic reliving of different aspects of the struggle in the birth canal, it involves a wide variety of archetypal and other phenomena which occur in typical thematic clusters and sequences. The most important of these are the elements of titanic fight, sadomasochistic experiences, intense sexual arousal, demonic episodes, scatological involvement, and encounter with fire. All these aspects and facets of BPM-3 again reflect deep experiential logic and can be meaningfully related to certain anatomical, physiological, and emotional characteristics of the corresponding stage of birth. The titanic aspect is quite understandable in view of the enormity of the forces encountered in this stage of the childbirth. At this time, the frail head of the fetus is wedged into the narrow pelvic opening by the power of uterine contractions that oscillates between 50 and 100 pounds. The subject facing this aspect of BPM-3 can experience overwhelming streams of energy building up to explosive discharges. One of the characteristic forms that this experience can take is identification with raging elements of nature, such as volcanoes, electric storms, earthquakes, tidal waves, or tornadoes. Another variety of this experiential pattern involves scenes of wars or revolutions and enormous energies generated by high-power technology, thermonuclear reactors, atomic bombs, tanks, spaceships, rockets, lasers, and electric power plants. A mitigated form of the titanic experience includes participation in dangerous adventures, such as hunting of wild animals or physical fight with them, gladiator combats, exciting explorations, and conquest of new frontiers. Related archetypal and mythological themes are images of the Last Judgment, Purgatory, extraordinary feats of superheroes, and battles of cosmic proportions involving the forces of light and darkness or gods and titans. Aggressive and sadomasochistic aspects of this matrix reflect the biological fury of the organism whose survival is threatened by suffocation combined with the interject destructive forces of the birth canal. From this association, it is clear why sadism and masochism form a logical unit, sadomasochism, being two aspects of the same experiential process, two sides of the same coin. Frequent themes occurring in this context are scenes of violent murder and suicide, mutilation and automutilation, torture, execution, ritual sacrifice and self-sacrifice, bloody man-to-man -man combats, boxing, freestyle wrestling sadomasochistic practices, and rape. The experiential logic of the sexual component of the death-rebirth process is not as immediately obvious. It can be explained by the fact that the human organism has an inbuilt physiological mechanism that translates in human suffering and particularly suffocation into a strange kind of sexual arousal and eventually ecstatic rapture. Examples of this can be found in the history of religious sex and in the lives of individual martyrs, in the material from concentration camps and from the fries of the Amnesty International, and in the observations of individuals dying on the gallows. The experiences that belong to this category are characterized by the enormous intensity of the sexual drive, its mechanical and unselective quality, and its pornographic or deviant nature. The fact that on this level of the psyche sexuality is inextricably connected with death, danger, anxiety, aggression, self-destructive impulses, physical pain, and various forms of biological material, blood, mucus, feces, urine, forms a natural basis for the development of the most important types of sexual dysfunctions, variations, deviations, and perversions. The connection between the sexual orgasm and the orgasm of birth makes it possible to add a deeper and highly relevant perinatal layer to the dynamic interpretations of Freudian analysis which have a superficial biographical and sexual emphasis. The implications of these interrelations for the understanding of various forms of sexual pathology is discussed in detail in my book Beyond the Brain, Birth, Death and Transcendence in Psychotherapy. The demonic element of this stage can present specific problems for the experiencers, as well as for the therapists and facilitators, since the uncanny quality of the material often leads to reluctance to face it. The most common themes observed in this context are scenes of the Sabbath of the Witches, Walpurgis Night, Satanic Orgies and Black Mass Rituals, and Temptation by Evil Forces.
The common denominator connecting this stage of childbirth with the themes of the Sabbath or with the Black Mass rituals is the peculiar experiential amalgam of death, deviant sexuality, fear, aggression, scatology, and distorted spiritual impulse that they share. The scatological facet of the death-rebirth process has its natural biological basis in the fact that in the final phase of the delivery, the fetus can come into close contact with feces and other forms of biological material. However, these experiences by far exceed what the newborn might have actually experienced during birth. Experiences of this aspect of BPM-3 involve scenes of crawling in awful or through sewage systems, wallowing in prize of excrement, drinking blood, or urine, or participating in revulsive images of putrefaction. It is an intimate and shattering encounter with the worst aspects of biological existence. The element of fire is experienced either in its ordinary form, with the subjects witnessing scenes of conflagrations and identifying with the immolation victims, or in an archetypal form of purifying fire, pyrocatharsis, which seems to destroy whatever is corrupted and to prepare the individual for spiritual rebirth. This thematic motif is the least comprehensible aspect of the birth symbolism. Its biological counterpart might be the overstimulation of the fetus with indiscriminate firing of peripheral neurons. It is interesting that it has its experiential parallel in the delivering mother who often feels in this stage that her vagina is on fire. The religious and mythological symbolism of this matrix focuses particularly on the themes that involve sacrifice and self-sacrifice or combine spiritual pursuit and sexuality. Quite frequent are scenes of pre-Columbian sacrificial rituals, visions of crucifixion or identification with Christ, experiential connection with deities symbolizing death and rebirth, such as Osiris, Dionysus, Attis, Adonis, Persephone, Orpheus, Votan, or Baldur, and sequences involving worship of the terrible goddesses Kali, Kotlaku, Lilith, or Renga. Sexual motifs are represented by episodes of phallic worship, temple prostitution, fertility rites, ritual rape, and various aboriginal tribal ceremonies involving rhythmic sensual dancing. A classical symbol of the transition from BPM-3 to BPM-4 is the legendary bird phoenix who dies in fire and rises resurrected from the ashes. Several important characteristics of this experiential pattern distinguish it from the previously described no-exit constellation. The situation here does not seem hopeless and the subject is not helpless. He or she is actively involved and has the feeling that the suffering has a definite direction and goal. In religious terms, this situation relates to the concept of purgatory rather than hell. In addition, the individuals involved do not play only the roles of helpless victims. They are observers and can at the same time identify with both the aggressor and the victim to the point of having difficulty separating the roles. Also, while the no-exit situation involves sheer suffering, the experience of the death-rebirth struggle represents the borderline between agony and ecstasy and the fusion of both. It seems appropriate to refer to this type of experience as Dionysian or volcanic ecstasy in contrast to the Apollonian or Oceanic ecstasy of the cosmic union which is associated with the first perinatal matrix. Specific experiential characteristics connect BPM-3 to COEX systems that include memories of intense sensual and sexual experiences in a dangerous and precarious context, such as parachuting, car racing, exciting but hazardous adventures, wrestling, boxing, fights, battles, conquests, red light districts, rape or sexual orgies, and amusement parks. A special group of memories related to BPM-3 involves intimate encounter with biological material, such as bedwetting, soiling, toilet training, exposure to blood, or witnessing dismemberment and putrefaction in war or in accidents. Memories of large fires tend to occur during the transition from BPM-3 to BPM-4. With regard to the Freudian erogenous zones, the third matrix is related to those physiological activities which bring sudden relief and relaxation after a prolonged period of physiological tension. On the oral level, it is the act of chewing and swallowing of food or conversely vomiting, on the anal and urethral level, the process of defecation and urination, and on the genital level, the build-up to sexual orgasm and the feelings of delivering women in the second stage of labor. I will use here the record from one of my high-dose LSD sessions, 300 micrograms, 
To illustrate the phenomenology of BPM3 that governed the first few hours of this experience, the continuation of the same psychedelic session and its resolution will be described later in the section on the fourth perinatal matrix. The session started with an incredible upsurge of instinctual forces. Waves of orgastic sexual feelings alternated or combined with aggressive outbursts of immense power. I felt trapped by steel-like machinery threatening to choke me to death, yet mesmerized and carried along by this irresistible outpouring of life energies. My visual field was glowing with a spectrum of red colors that had an awesome and numinous quality. I somehow sensed that it symbolized the mystical power of blood uniting humanity in strange ways throughout the ages. I felt connected with the metaphysical dimensions of cruelties of all kinds, torture, rape, and murder, but also to the mystery of the menstrual cycle, birth, delivery, death, ancestral bloodlines, and sacred blood bonds of brotherhood, true friendship, and loyalty. The underlying theme behind all this seemed to be a profound identification with an infant's struggle to free himself from the clutches of the birth canal. I felt that I was in touch with the strange force that connects mothers and children in a bond of life and death. I understood instinctively, on a gut level, both the symbiotic and uniting aspects of this relationship and its restricting and suffocating influence that can interfere with independence and autonomy. The strange bond of uterine connection between grandmother, mother and daughter took on a special significance, as if it were a profound mystery of life from which males were excluded. Against this background, I was identifying with masses of people connected by some higher cause revolutionaries and patriots of all ages fighting for freedom against any form of oppression, or pursuing some other collective goal. At one point, I strongly identified with Lenin and felt that I understood intimately the unquenchable thirst for liberation of the masses from oppression that he must have experienced and the fire of revolution that burned M his heart. Fraternité. Egalité. Liberté. Images of the French Revolution and the opening of the gates of the Bastille flashed through my mind followed by memories of similar scenes from Beethoven's Fidelio. I felt moved to tears and sensed profound identification with freedom fighters of all times and all countries. As I was moving into the second half of the session, the emphasis shifted from death to sex and violence. Colorful images and experiences of rapes, sadomasochistic practices of all kinds, obscene burlesque shows, Red light districts, prostitutes, and pimps attacked all my senses with extraordinary power. I seemed to be deeply identified with all the persons involved in the most amazing variety of roles, and yet was also watching it all as an observer. And then picturesque visions, partly figurative, partly woven from the most intricate arabesques, created an irresistibly seductive atmosphere suggestive of oriental harems, Shiharazade, and the Thousand and One Nights. Gradually a strong spiritual element was added to this highly sensual experience. It seemed that I participated in hundreds of scenes depicting African tribal ceremonies, Babylonian temple prostitution, obscure ancient fertility rites, and some aboriginal ritual orgies involving group sex, which took place possibly in New Guinea or Australia. And then, without a warning, came a sudden shift. I felt surrounded by some indescribably disgusting stuff drowning in some kind of archetypal cesspool epitomizing biological garbage of all ages. Foul stench seemed to penetrate my whole being, my mouth was full of excrement that was robbing me of my breath. The experience opened repeatedly into scenes of complex labyrinths of the sewage systems of the world. I felt that I became intimately familiar with the biological fallout of all the metropolises of the world, with every manhole and every leech line there is. This seemed to be a shattering encounter with the worst that can come from biology, excreta, offals, pus, decomposition, and putrefaction. Amidst this appalling aesthetic horror an interesting idea flashed through my mind, what I was experiencing was a typical response of a human adult. A child or a dog might have an entirely different reaction. And there are clearly many forms of life, such as bacteria, worms, or insect larvae for whom this would be a highly desirable milieu in which they would thrive. I tried to tune into such an attitude and explore it from their perspective. Gradually, I was able to accept and even in a strange way enjoy where I was, see continuation under BPM-4. Fourth Basic Perinatal Matrix, BPM-4 The Death-Rebirth Experience 
This perinatal matrix is related to the third clinical stage of the delivery, the actual birth of the child. Here the agonizing process of the birth struggle comes to an end. The propulsion through the birth canal associated with an extreme buildup of anxiety, pain, pressure, and sexual tension is followed by a sudden release and relaxation. The child is born and after a long period of darkness faces for the first time the bright light of the day or the artificial illumination of the delivery room. After the umbilical cord is cut, the physical separation from the maternal organism has been completed. Far-reaching physiological changes have to be accomplished so that the organism can begin its new existence as an anatomically independent individual providing its own supply of oxygen, digesting its food, and disposing of its waste products. As in the case of the other matrices, the specific aspects of this stage of birth can be relived as concrete memories of the physiological events and also of the various obstetric interventions involved. Even subjects who do not know anything about the circumstances of their birth can through these experiences correctly identify in great detail the initial position, the mechanism of labor, the type of anesthesia used, the nature of the instrumental or manual intervention, as well as the specifics of postnatal care. The symbolic counterpart of this final stage of childbirth is the death-rebirth experience, it represents the termination and resolution of the death-rebirth struggle. Paradoxically, while only a small step from an experience of phenomenal liberation, the individual has a feeling of impending catastrophe of enormous proportions. This frequently results in a desperate and determined struggle to stop the process. If allowed to happen, the transition from BPM-3 to BPM-4 involves a sense of total annihilation on all imaginable levels, physical destruction, emotional disaster, intellectual and philosophical defeat, ultimate moral failure, an absolute damnation of transcendental proportions. This experience of ego death seems to entail an instant merciless destruction of all previous reference points in the life of the individual. The ego death and rebirth is not a one-time experience. During deep systematic self-exploration, the unconscious presents it repeatedly with varying emphasis and increasing proportions until the process is completed. Under the influence of Freudian psychoanalysis, the concept of the ego is associated with one's ability to test reality and to function adequately in everyday life. Individuals who share this limited point of view see the perspective of the ego death with horror. However, what actually dies in this process is a basically paranoid attitude toward the world which reflects the negative experience of the subject during childbirth and later in life. It involves a sense of general inadequacy, a need to be prepared for all possible dangers, a compulsion to be in charge and in control, constant efforts to prove things to oneself and others, and similar elements of problematic value. When experienced in its final and most complete form, the ego death means an irreversible end to one's philosophical identification with what Alan Watts called skin-encapsulated ego. When the experience is well integrated, it results not only in increased ability to enjoy existence, but also in better functioning in the world. The experience of total annihilation and of hitting the cosmic bottom that characterizes the ego death is immediately followed by visions of blinding white or golden light of supernatural radiance and beauty. It can be associated with astonishing displays of divine archetypal entities, rainbow spectra, intricate peacock designs, or pristine natural scenery. The subject experiences a deep sense of spiritual liberation, redemption, and salvation. He or she typically feels freed from anxiety, depression, and guilt, purged and unburdened. This is associated with a flood of positive emotions toward oneself, other people, and existence in general. The world appears to be a beautiful and safe place and the zest for life is considerably increased. It should be emphasized, however, that this description reflects the situation of normal and uncomplicated birth. A prolonged and debilitating course of delivery, the use of forceps, the administration of general anesthesia, and other complications and interventions can introduce specific experiential distortions and abnormalities into the phenomenology of this matrix. The specific archetypal symbolism of the death-rebirth experience can be drawn from many different realms of the collective unconscious, since every major culture has the appropriate mythical forms for this process. The ego death can be experienced in connection with various destructive deities, 
such as Shiva, Hutsilapakli, Moloch, Kali, or Kotlaku, or in full identification with Christ, Osiris, Adonis, Dionysus, or other sacrificed mythical personages. The divine epiphany can involve an entirely abstract image of God as a radiant source of light, or more or less personified representations from different religions. Equally common are experiences of encounter or union with great mother goddesses, as exemplified by the Virgin Mary, Isis, Lakshmi, Parvati, Hera, or Sibylle. Related biographical constellations involve memories of personal successes, fortuitous terminations of dangerous situations, ends of wars or revolutions, survivals of accidents, or recoveries from serious diseases. In relation to the Freudian erogenous zones, BPM-4 is associated on all levels of libidinal development with the states of satisfaction immediately following the activities that released unpleasant tension, satiation of hunger by swallowing of food, relieving vomiting, defecation, urination, sexual orgasm, and delivery of a child. The following is a continuation of my LSD session described earlier under BPM-3. It focuses on the transition between BPM-3 and BPM-4 and then specifically on experiential elements that belong to the fourth matrix. I was quite pleased with myself, having achieved the demanding and difficult task of accepting an aspect of my biological nature that our culture abhors. However, the worst was yet to come. All of a sudden, I seemed to be losing all my connections to reality, as if some imaginary rug was pulled from under my feet. Everything was collapsing and I felt that my entire world was shattered to pieces. It was like puncturing a monstrous metaphysical abscess of my existence, a gigantic bubble of ludicrous self-deception had burst open and exposed the lie of my life. Everything that I ever believed in, everything that I did or pursued, everything that seemed to give my life meaning suddenly appeared utterly false. These were all pitiful crutches without any substance with which I tried to patch up the intolerable reality of existence. They were now blasted and blown away like the frail feathered seeds of a dandelion, exposing a frightening abyss of ultimate truth, the meaningless chaos of the existential void. Filled with indescribable horror, I saw a gigantic figure of a deity towering over me in a threatening pose. I somehow instinctively recognized that this was the Hindu god Shiva in his destructive aspect. I felt the thunderous impact of his enormous foot that crushed me, shattered me to smithereens, and smeared me like an insignificant piece of excrement all over what I felt was the bottom of the cosmos. In the next moment, I was facing a terrifying giant figure of a dark goddess whom I identified as the Indian Kali. My face was being pushed by an irresistible force toward her gaping vagina that was full of what seemed to be menstrual blood or repulsive afterbirth. I sensed that what was demanded of me was absolute surrender to the forces of existence and to the feminine principle represented by the goddess. I had no choice but to kiss and lick her vulva in utmost submission and humility. At this moment, which was the ultimate and final end of any feeling of male supremacy I had ever harbored, I connected with the memory of the moment of my biological birth. My head was emerging from the birth canal with my mouth in close contact with the bleeding maternal vagina. I was flooded with the divine light of supernatural radiance and beauty whose rays were exploded into thousands of exquisite peacock designs. From this brilliant golden light emerged a figure of a great mother goddess who seemed to embody love and protection of all ages. She spread her arms and reached toward me, enveloping me into her essence. I merged with this incredible energy field, feeling purged, healed, and nourished. What seemed to be ambrosia, some archetypal essence of milk and honey, was poured through me in absolute abundance. Then the figure of the goddess gradually disappeared, absorbed by an even more brilliant light. It was abstract, yet endowed with definite personal characteristics and radiating infinite intelligence. It became clear to me that what I was experiencing was the merging with an absorption into the universal self, or Brahma, as I have read about it in books of Indian philosophy. This experience subsided after about 10 minutes of clock time, however, it transcended any concept of time and felt like eternity. The flow of the healing and nourishing energy and the visions of golden glow with peacock designs lasted the night. The resulting sense of well-being stayed with me for many days. The memory of the experience has remained vivid for years and has profoundly changed my entire life philosophy.
I would like to close this section on perinatal dynamics with an account from a holotropic breathing session of Albert, a clinical psychologist who participated recently in one of our five-day seminars. At the beginning of the workshop, he described himself to the group as a high-strung individual with a strong workaholic life pattern, who thrived on difficult projects and enjoyed challenges and struggles. His breathing session resulted in a profound sense of release and relaxation. This report is a good example of a powerful birth experience that, by its elemental power and meaningful connection to everyday life, convinced an intelligent, skeptical, and scientifically trained individual. It contains a surprising accurate detail. At the beginning, I identified with a scaly, worm-like animal and got involved in a number of appropriate movements. I turned repeatedly in a spiral fashion from my back to my belly and back again. Suddenly, I felt on my feet touches that I experienced as bothersome and confining. I began to fight against them, at first lightly and later with increasing strength and determination. This intensified gradually to such an extent that I was sure I was fighting for my life. I found later that I had to be held down by five persons, because I was moving forcefully into the spaces of other people around me. I developed the idea that I would never give up, even if the entire world were against me. With tricks and strength and loud screaming, I fought against the helplessness and the overpowering foes. As I was held down, Stark kept repeating that he and the others around me were not my enemies, that they were helping me to get through. After some time I was able to identify this struggle as the reliving of my birth. I have to say that the feeling of helplessness kept triggering in me massive resistance, never resignation. I know a similar pattern also from my everyday life. My strong movements and loud screams reached a culmination point and then subsided, I moved into a phase of relaxation. At this point, I decided to sit up. When Stark told me it was too early, a sudden realization flashed through my mind, I am a premature birth. I lay down again, got all covered up, and had the feeling that I was able to make up for all the lost time in the uterus. This was very beautiful. I felt happy and was able to let go internally. Suddenly, I noticed a very intense and full smell of fresh leather, I smelled it again and again and it was very, very pleasant. I was in a state of extreme relaxation, a condition unfamiliar to me from my everyday life. I was able to really enjoy my visions. This strong and intense smell of leather was the most remarkable aspect of my experience. I found it utterly puzzling and did not know what to do with it. During the group sharing, I asked Stan what it could be. He told me that leather, or the smell of it, does not seem to belong to the symbolic and archetypal aspects of birth and that it must somehow reflect the actual circumstances of my delivery. Later that evening, I found out that my mother worked in a leather shop and on the day of my birth stayed at work till late at night, sewing leather pants, later hosen, on her lap. She did not expect the labor to start that day and when her water broke, she misinterpreted it as some kind of bladder problem. Also, my early postnatal life was closely connected to the smell of fresh leather, since my mother continued to work on leather pants at home shortly after my delivery. I am convinced that I have relived the experience of my birth and that the smell of fresh leather was in some way an authentic memory too. Beyond the brain, transpersonal dimensions of the psyche, like the giraffe and the duck-billed platypus, the creatures inhabiting these remoter regions of the mind are exceedingly improbable. Nevertheless they exist, they are facts of observation, and as such, they cannot be ignored by anyone who is honestly trying to understand the world in which he lives. Aldous Huxley, Heaven and Hell Experiential sequences of death and rebirth typically open the gate to a transbiographical domain in the human psyche that can best be referred to as transpersonal. The perinatal level of the unconscious clearly represents an interface between the biographical and the transpersonal realms, or between the individual and the collective unconscious. In most instances, transpersonal experiences are preceded by a dramatic encounter with birth and death. However, there exists also an important alternative, occasionally, it is possible to access experientially various transpersonal elements and themes directly, without confronting the perinatal level. 
The common denominator of the rich and ramified group of transpersonal phenomena is the subject's feeling that his or her consciousness has expanded beyond the usual ego boundaries and has transcended the limitations of time and space. In the ordinary or normal states of consciousness, we experience ourselves as existing within the boundaries of the physical body, the body image, our perception of the environment is restricted by the range of our sensory organs. Both our internal perception, interoception, and external perception, exteroception, are confined by the usual spatial and temporal boundaries. Under ordinary circumstances, we can experience vividly and with all our senses only the events in the present moment and in our immediate environment. We can recall the past and anticipate or fantasize about future events, however, the past and the future are not available for direct experience. In transpersonal experiences, as they occur in psychedelic sessions, in self-exploration through non-drug experiential techniques, or spontaneously, one or more of the above limitations appear to be transcended. On the basis of the above discussion, transpersonal experiences can be defined as experiential expansion or extension of consciousness beyond the usual boundaries of the body ego and beyond the limitations of time and space. They cover an extremely wide range of phenomena which occur on different levels of reality, in a sense, the entire spectrum of transpersonal experiences is commensurate with existence itself. At this point, before continuing the discussion of the transpersonal experiences, I would like to introduce two new terms, which will be explained and discussed at some length later in the book, they refer to two complementary modes of consciousness in which we can experience ourselves and the world. The hylotropic, or matter-oriented, mode of consciousness is the term I am using for the normal, everyday experience of consensus reality. The holotropic mode of consciousness, or consciousness aiming toward wholeness and totality of existence, characterizes certain non-ordinary psychological states, such as meditative, mystical, or psychedelic experiences. It can also be observed in many spontaneously occurring episodes referred to as psychotic by contemporary psychiatry. In the hylotropic mode of consciousness, we experience only a limited and specific segment of the phenomenal world or consensus reality from one moment to another. The nature and scope of this experiential fragment of reality is quite unambiguously defined by our spatial and temporal coordinates in the phenomenal world, the anatomical and physiological limitations of our sensory organs, and the physical characteristics of the environment. In the holotropic mode of consciousness, it is possible to reach, in addition, all the remaining aspects of existence. These include not only access to one's biological, psychological, social, racial, and spiritual history in the past, present, and future of the entire phenomenal world, but access to many other levels and domains of reality described by the great mystical traditions of the world. Comparative study of mystical literature shows that most of these systems seem to agree on a complex, layered, and hierarchical model of reality that includes phenomenal as well as trans-phenomenal aspects of existence. The gross experiential realm reflects the world of ordinary waking consciousness and consensus reality based on the evidence of the sensory organs. The corresponding worldview and way of being in the world is limited to information derived from the physical body and the material world to linear causality as the only connecting principle, and to Newtonian understanding of space and time. Many systems of perennial philosophy have identified and explored, in addition, several transphenomenal levels or realms of existence, usually referred to as subtle, causal, and ultimate or absolute. Both the subtle and the causal levels can be further subdivided into lower and higher. The lower subtle, or astral psychic, level contains traditionally out-of-body experiences, astral travel, occult and psychic phenomena, precognition, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, auras, and similar experiences. The higher subtle level comprises archetypal forms of deities, supreme presences, and spiritual guides, experiences of divine inspiration, visions of light, and audible illuminations. The lower causal level is the realm of Savi Kulpa Samadhi, the final god, creator of all the realms, the audible light of Bija Mantra, the source of all individual deities. The higher causal realm is characterized by ultimate transcendence and release into boundless radiance, or Nirvikalpa Samadhi. On this level, there is no subject or object, 
no self or God, only formless consciousness as such. On the level of the Absolute, consciousness awakens to its original condition and suchness, which is also suchness of all of existence, gross, subtle, and causal. The observations from modern consciousness research with or without psychedelic drugs bring, in general, strong supportive evidence for this understanding of reality. However, in specific details, the cartography of consciousness found in perennial philosophy would have to be extended and modified to fit the findings of experimental psychiatry and the new experiential psychotherapies. In the following text, I will attempt to outline a classification of transpersonal experiences that is based on the scheme of perennial philosophy, but incorporates, at the same time, the findings of modern scientific research. To create a transpersonal taxonomy that would reflect in an accurate and comprehensive way the introspective data and objective observations from modern consciousness research is not an easy task. The spectrum of transpersonal experiences is not only extremely rich, ramified, and variegated, but includes levels of reality governed by laws and principles that are different from those that rule ordinary reality. Many transpersonal experiences, being ineffable, elude adequate verbal description and occur on levels of reality where those very aspects that could ordinarily serve as principia divisiones, such as time, space, duality, and polarity, or linear causality, are transcended. The problem is further complicated by the holographic nature of consciousness and mutual interpenetration of its different levels and domains. However, I believe that in spite of all these inherent limitations, the following discussion of transpersonal phenomena will reflect the experiential realities to a sufficient degree to provide useful information to future researchers and explorers of these fascinating territories of the human mind. I hope that they will, in turn, complement, refine, and revise in the future, on the basis of their own experiences and observations, the scheme I am proposing here. Before I start outlining a system of classification of transpersonal phenomena, I would like to clarify the relationship between the holotropic mode of consciousness and transpersonal experiences. Holotropic consciousness has the potential to reach all aspects of existence. This includes the postnatal biography of the individual, events in the future, biological birth, embryonal and fetal development, the moment of conception, as well as the ancestral, racial, karmic, and phylogenetic history. Of these, biographical and perinatal experiences have already been discussed earlier. In a sense, full reliving of events from childhood and birth, as compared to just remembering, could be seen as true transcendence of time and space. In that case, the individual experiencing a sequence from infancy, childhood, and later life, or the struggle in the birth canal, would not be reconstructing these events from memory engrams in his or her nervous system, but actually connecting directly to the spatial and temporal coordinates of the original events. This would then be comparable to a situation known from science fiction, where astronauts visiting a planet with a strong gravitational field experience time-space loops and can exist simultaneously in two different spatio-temporal frameworks. Under these circumstances, they can actually see and meet themselves at different points of their past. Full reliving of events from childhood can be occasionally accompanied by experiential identification with the protagonists, e.g., identification with the aggressor, which gives these experiences a distinct transpersonal flavor. Reliving different stages of birth not only involves the possibility of full experiential identification with the delivering mother, but also mediates access to situations in different parts of the world and throughout history that include other individuals experiencing similar emotional states and physical sensations. These connections have been discussed in detail earlier in relation to the phenomenology of basic perinatal matrices. The most important distinction thus has to be made not between the transpersonal experiences and the biographical or perinatal ones, but between the hylotropic mode, ordinary waking consciousness experienced from one moment to another, and the holotropic mode, non-ordinary states of consciousness that mediate access to all other aspects of existence. This includes not only space-time of the phenomenal world, but also all the trans-phenomenal levels of reality. It is primarily for didactic reasons that biographical and perinatal experiences are discussed separately from transpersonal experiences. In the following scheme, embryonal, 
ancestral, racial, karmic, and phylogenetic experiences are included in the transpersonal domain. In general, transpersonal experiences can be divided according to their content into three large categories. Some of them involve phenomena from the material world of space-time that our culture sees as objectively real. Others reflect levels of reality denied by Western mechanistic science, but recognized and acknowledged by many ancient and non-Western cultures and by the great mystical traditions of the world, which are described by Aldous Huxley as the perennial philosophy. The first category of transpersonal experiences, which deals with the world of space-time, can be further subdivided into those experiences that involve transcendence of the ordinary spatial boundaries and those that involve transcendence of linear time. To these we can add a third category of experiences and phenomena that represent strange hybrids between the gross and subtle or causal levels of consciousness. They seem to occur on the interface between the inner world and the external reality, or between matter and consciousness. I have taken the liberty to adopt for this category the term psychoid phenomena, used in the past with different connotations by the German biologist and philosopher Hans Driesch, one of the main exponents of vitalism, by the Swiss psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler who coined the term schizophrenia, and, most recently, by Carl Gustav Jung in connection with synchronicities and archetypal phenomena. The following classification system is based on the principles discussed above. Transpersonal experiences Experiential extension within consensus reality and space-time 1. Transcendence of spatial boundaries Experience of dual unity Identification with other persons Group identification and group consciousness Identification with animals Identification with plants and botanical processes Oneness with life and all creation Experience of inanimate matter and inorganic processes Planetary consciousness Extraterrestrial experiences Identification with the entire physical universe Psychic phenomena involving transcendence of space. 2. Transcendence of the boundaries of linear time. Embryonal and fetal experiences. Ancestral experiences. Racial and collective experiences. Past incarnation experiences. Phylogenetic experiences. Experiences of planetary evolution. Cosmogenetic experiences. Psychic phenomena involving transcendence of time. Physical introversion and narrowing of consciousness. Experiential extension beyond consensus reality and space-time. Spiritistic and mediumistic experiences. Energetic phenomena of the subtle body. Experiences of animal spirits. Encounters with spirit guides and superhuman beings. Visits to other universes and meetings with their inhabitants. Experiences of mythological and fairy tale sequences. Experiences of specific blissful and wrathful deities. Experiences of universal archetypes. Intuitive understanding of universal symbols. Creative inspiration and the Promethean impulse. Experience of the demiurge and insights into cosmic creation. Experience of cosmic consciousness. The supercosmic and metacosmic void. Transpersonal experiences of psychoid nature. 1. Synchronistic links between consciousness and matter. 2. Spontaneous psychoid events. Supernormal physical feats. Spiritistic phenomena and physical mediumship. Recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, poltergeist. Unidentified flying objects, UFO phenomena. 3. Intentional psychokinesis. Ceremonial magic. Healing and hexing. Cities. Laboratory psychokinesis. The above classification represents a complete list of the types of transpersonal experiences that I have witnessed in psychedelic research, in sessions of holotropic breathing, and in the work with individuals in spontaneous episodes of non-ordinary states of consciousness. In addition, it contains a few transpersonal phenomena of the psychoid type that have been described repeatedly in mystical literature and by some modem researchers, but that I have not observed in my own work. This cartography is in general agreement with perennial philosophy, although it is more complete and differs in some details. 
the category of experiences involving extension of consciousness within consensus reality and space-time roughly corresponds to the astral psychic domain of the lower subtle realm. Most of the experiences characterized by experiential extension beyond consensus reality and space-time belong to the higher subtle realms. The experience of the final god or cosmic demiurge, Savi Kulpa Samadhi, seems to correspond to the lower causal level and the experience of formless. Consciousness transcending all dualities, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, or the void, Sunyata, to the higher causal level. The absolute or the ultimate then would be the experience of the suchness of all the levels and consciousness in its original condition. It is necessary to bear in mind that transpersonal experiences do not always occur in a pure form. It was mentioned before that, for example, Perinatal experiences characteristic of the individual matrices are frequently accompanied by specific types of transpersonal phenomena and that biographical experiences can have certain transpersonal features. Various forms of transpersonal experiences also tend to occur in dusters. Thus, embryonal experiences can appear in combination with phylogenetic memories, with the experience of cosmic unity, archetypal images of heavens or paradises, or with visions of various blissful deities or demons. These associations are very constant and they seem to reflect remarkable experiential logic and deep intrinsic interconnections among various phenomena in the world of consciousness. In the following text, I will briefly describe and discuss the major types of transpersonal experiences and illustrate them with typical examples. Experiential Extension Within Consensus Reality and Space-Time 1. Transcendence of Spatial Boundaries Transpersonal experiences which involve transcendence of spatial barriers suggest that the boundaries between the individual and the rest of the universe are not fixed and absolute. Under special circumstances, it is possible to identify experientially with anything in the universe, including the entire cosmos itself. Here belong the experiences of merging with another person into a state of dual unity or assuming another person's identity of tuning into the consciousness of a specific group of people, or of expansion of one's consciousness to such an extent that it seems to encompass all of humanity. In a similar way, one can transcend the limits of the specifically human experience and identify with the consciousness of animals, plants, or even inorganic objects and processes. In the extremes, it is possible to experience the consciousness of the entire biosphere, of our planet, or of the entire material universe. A. Experience of Dual Unity This type of transpersonal experience is characterized by loosening and melting of the boundaries of the body-ego and a sense of merging with another person into a state of unity and oneness. In spite of feeling fused with another, the subject retains awareness of his or her own identity. In psychedelic states, sessions of experiential psychotherapy, meditation, or spontaneous episodes of non-ordinary consciousness, this sense of dual unity can be experienced in relation to the persons in the environment, therapist, sitter, family members, or friends. It can also occur entirely in the inner experiential space in relation to imagined individuals not present in the session. The experience of dual unity occurs quite regularly in the sessions where the individual is reliving perinatal memories of the symbiotic fusion with the maternal organism, good womb and good breast. Under these circumstances, it is possible to have alternating experiences of identification with the child, the mother, and both of them simultaneously, dual unity. In states of mystical union with the universe, the state of dual unity can be experienced in relation to any aspect of existence not only people, but animals, plants, and inanimate objects. An important example of the experience of dual unity is the sense of fusion with the partner in a sexual situation, with or without the element of genital union. It can occur spontaneously under the circumstances of everyday life or in the context of intentional tantric practice. In the left-handed path of tantra, Vamamarga, the achievement of the experience of cosmic unity through sexual union with the partner, Madhuna, is the objective of a complex sacred ritual, Panchamakara. Experiences of dual unity also occur frequently during systematic spiritual practice, particularly in the Kadi tradition where the disciples can experience a sense of union with the Guru. The experiences of dual unity are often accompanied by profound feelings of love and a sense of sacredness, numinosity, of the event. 
There exist specific exercises in the spiritual traditions and in the human potential movement that can facilitate such experiences by looking into another person's eyes, attending to another person's breath, synchronizing breathing, or listening to each other's heartbeat. The following example from a therapeutic LSD session combines a regressive experience of dual unity with the mother during the intrauterine existence and nursing with an experience of merging with the therapist. The patient was treated by psycholytic therapy for a psychotic condition, the condensed history of her treatment is given in my book LSD Psychotherapy. At this point, Malada assumed a fetal position and seemed very regressed. I could see a remarkable change in her face. All her wrinkles had disappeared and she looked like a very small infant. She described that she felt a wonderful sense of oneness with her mother. There was no separation between the feelings of her mother and her own. She could shift freely from the experience of being herself as an infant in the womb or on the breast to the complementary experience of being her pregnant or nursing mother. She could also experience both of these roles at the same time, as if it were just one experiential continuum with absolutely no boundaries. When she opened her eyes, she noticed with great surprise that she was experiencing no boundaries between the two of us. She had the feeling that she could read my thoughts and my emotional processes. I could actually confirm this to be true on the few occasions when she verbalized her perceptions. Conversely, she felt that I had unlimited access to her mind and that I could read her as an open book. However, this aspect of her experience was clearly a projection and did not reflect correctly my own situation. At a certain point, Malada also showed an element of paranoid fear that all her thoughts were being broadcast not only to me, but to other people and the whole world. B identification with other persons. This transpersonal experience is closely related to the preceding one. While merging experientially with another person, the subject has a sense of complete identification to the point of more or less losing the awareness of his or her own identity. The sense of becoming another person is total and complex. It involves the body image, physical sensations, emotional reactions and attitudes, thought processes, memories, facial expression, typical gestures and mannerisms, postures, movements, and even the inflection of the voice. There exist many forms, degrees, and levels of this experience. It can happen in relation to persons who are in the presence of the subject, to currently living persons who are absent, or as part of an inner experience involving persons from the subject's childhood, ancestry, or past incarnation. Experiential identifications of this kind can involve famous personages from the present or past human history, or even mythological and archetypal characters. Reliving of emotionally important memories from childhood, or even later life, that involve other persons is frequently characterized by simultaneous or alternating identification with all protagonists. This mechanism can give a transpersonal flavor to many personal biographical experiences. In this context, the subject can identify with his or her parents, children, other close relatives, important friends, acquaintances, and teachers. This process can also involve prominent politicians, scientists, artists, religious leaders, or typical representatives of other professional, ethnic, or racial groups in the past and present. Among the famous historical and public figures that subjects have identified within various non-ordinary states of consciousness that I have witnessed were Alexander the Great, Emperor Nero, Cleopatra, Genghis Khan, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Martin Luther King, Muhammad Ali, John E. Kennedy, and a variety of famous movie actors. Full identification with Christ and his suffering is a frequent and typical occurrence in the context of BPM-3. Unlike the past incarnation experiences, simple identification with another person does not have the experiential quality of a memory and does not involve a sense of actually having been that person. The experience of dual unity and identification with another person is frequently available to accomplished psychics. Here the experience does not have the unpredictable and elemental form it does in psychedelic states, sessions of experiential psychotherapy, meditation, or in spontaneous episodes of non-ordinary consciousness, transpersonal crises, 
but can be voluntarily invoked and controlled. We have ourselves repeatedly witnessed most accurate and reliable readings by Ann Armstrong that involved, among others, these mechanisms. Also, experienced shamans seem to operate in this way while conducting healing or making psychic diagnosis. I would like to use here as an example an episode from our own life. It is a powerful experience of identification with another person that occurred to my wife, Christina, at the time when she was lying in bed with a febrile virus disease. It involved a good friend of ours, the late anthropologist and generalist Gregory Battison. At that time, Gregory was spending the last period of his life at the E. Salen Institute, fighting his lung cancer. The surgeons had found during an exploratory operation a tumor the size of a grapefruit located very near to his vena cava. It was inoperable and Gregory was given four weeks to live. He was invited by the E. Salen Institute to come and spend the rest of his life in the beautiful setting of the Big Sur coast. During his stay, he underwent a variety of alternative treatments and, with several ups and downs, he actually lived more than two and a half years. We had much interaction with him and his family and became close friends. One morning, Christina decided to stay in bed because she was not feeling well. Suddenly she had an overwhelming feeling that she was becoming Gregory. She had his giant body and his enormous hands, his thoughts and his staunch British humor. She felt connected to the pain of his cancer and somehow knew with every cell of her body that he slashed she was dying. This surprised her because it did not reflect her conscious assessment of his situation. His condition was worse in those days, but that had happened many times before, and she had no reason to suspect that this was anything more than a transient setback. Later that day, Christina saw our friend Carl Simonton, who was visiting E. Salen at that time. He was working with Gregory using the method of visualization that he had developed as an adjunct treatment of cancer. Christina found out that Carl and Gregory had worked together that morning. In the middle of the session, Gregory suddenly refused to continue and said, I do not want to do this anymore. I want to die. They called Gregory's wife Lois and started talking about dying instead of healing and fighting cancer. The timing of this episode exactly coincided with Christina's morning experience of identification with Gregory. Christina felt very ambivalent about this episode. On the one hand, it was an unsolicited intrusion into her consciousness that was very frightening. On the other hand, during the few minutes of this fascinating experience, she learned more about Gregory than she had in years of our ordinary everyday interaction. It seemed clear that experiences of this kind would be invaluable for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, if they could be brought under full voluntary control. C. Group Identification and Group Consciousness the experience of group identification is characterized by further extension of consciousness and melting of boundaries. Instead of identifying with individual persons, the subject has a sense of becoming an entire group of people who share some racial, cultural, national, ideological, political, or professional characteristics. In some other instances, the common denominator is the quality of physical and emotional experience or the predicament and destiny that brought these people together. In transpersonal experiences of this kind, the subject can have an overwhelming sense of tuning into the group consciousness of all the Jews who have been persecuted through centuries, of the Christian martyrs tortured and sacrificed by the Romans, of the victims of the Inquisition who were interrogated, tortured, and subjected to autos de fe, or of the prisoners of all ages suffering in dungeons or concentration camps. In these experiences, one can feel the quality of religious zeal of all the Muslims during their pilgrimage to Mecca, the devotion of the Hindus at the time of worship by the river Ganges, or the fanaticism of the members of extremist religious sects, such as the Flagellants, the Russian Skopsi, or the snake-handling Holy Ghost people. The depth, scope, and intensity of these experiences can reach extraordinary proportions. It is possible to experience the totality of suffering of all the soldiers who have ever died on the battlefields of the world since the beginning of history, the burning desire of the revolutionaries of all ages to overthrow the tyrant, or the love, tenderness, and dedication of all the mothers of the world taking care of their babies. Progressive melting of boundaries can result in experiences of identification with a social or political group, population of an entire country or continent, 
all people belonging to a particular race, or all the believers in one of the world's great religions. In the extremes, it is possible to identify with the experience of all humanity and of the human condition with its joy, anger, passion, sadness, glory, and tragedy. Numerous descriptions of transpersonal experiences of this kind can be found in the spiritual literature as they occurred in the lives of prophets, saints, and great religious teachers of all ages. The surprising discovery of modern consciousness research has been that transpersonal experiences of this kind are under certain special circumstances available to everyone. A particularly moving modern example is the mystical experience of the American astronaut Rusty Schwickart, who had a powerful sense of identification with all of humanity on a spacewalk while orbiting the Earth during the Apollo 9 mission. I will illustrate this type of transpersonal experience by two examples. The first of these is an excerpt from a high-dose LSD session of a psychiatrist. It took place shortly after his five-week visit to India. At this point, I was flooded by memories of my recent trip to India, experiencing again how deeply I was moved by the incredibly broad range of existence that one can encounter in that country. From the profound misery of unimaginable poverty, dirt, disease, and death to the timeless beauty of sublime temple architecture and sculpture and the highest achievements of human spirit. Before I could realize what was happening, the emphasis of my experience shifted. Instead of being a visitor and observer, I actually became identified with what I was perceiving. And then the spectrum of my experience moved beyond the range of my actual memories of India altogether. I realized that I became the people of India. As difficult as it might be to imagine in the everyday state of consciousness, I felt I was an immense organism whose ramifications and constituents were the countless millions of people inhabiting the subcontinent of India. The best parallel I can find is that of the human body. Each cell is in a way a separate entity, but also an infinitesimal part of the whole organism. And the consciousness and self-awareness reflects the whole not the individual parts. In a similar way, I was one single immense conscious entity, the population of India. However, at the same time, I was also identifying with individual lepers and crippled beggars in the streets of Bombay and Calcutta, peddlers selling bitty cigarettes or beetle nuts, little children starving or dying by the side of the roads of mouth cancer, pious crowds performing their purification ceremonies on the Ganges or burning their relatives on the cremation ghats in Banaras, the naked sadhus lying in samadhi in the ice and snow of the Himalayas, confused adolescent brides joining, strangers in marriage ceremonies arranged by their families, and the fabulously rich and powerful Maharajas. All the glory and misery of India appeared in my experience as different elements of one cosmic organism, a deity of immense proportions whose millions of arms were reaching out and becoming all possible aspects of my existence. Unimaginable depth and range of sensations filled my entire being, I felt an indescribable connection with India and her people. The following example comes from the account of a peyote experience of Crashing Thunder, a Winnebago Indian, who participated in the ceremony to find relief from profound guilt and alienation. He had lied to his people, pretending that he had a vision, and had subsequently ruined his life with drunkenness, womanizing, and even implication in a murder. His life was described in the autobiography of a Winnebago Indian by Paul Radden. All of us sitting there, we had all together one spirit or soul. At least that is what I learned. I instantly became the spirit, and I was their spirit or soul. Whatever they thought, I immediately knew it. I did not have to speak to them and get an answer to know what their thought had been. D. Identification with animals. This transpersonal experience involves a complete and realistic identification with members of various animal species. They. Most frequent objects of identification are other mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and various species of fish. However, it can include organisms that are lower on the evolutionary pedigree, such as insects, gastropods, snails and slugs, brachiopods, shellfish, cephalopods, octopus and squid, and salenterates, sea anemone and jellyfish. The experiential identification with various animals can be extremely authentic and convincing. It includes the body image, specific physiological sensations, instinctual drives, 
unique perception of the environment and emotional reactions to it. These phenomena have certain unusual characteristics that distinguish them clearly from the ordinary human experience. Their nature and specific features often transcend the scope of human fantasy and imagination. In the holotropic mode of consciousness, it is possible to gain experiential insight into what it feels like when a cat is curious, an eagle frightened, a cobra hungry, a turtle sexually aroused, or when a shark is breathing through the gills. After having had experiences of animal identification, subjects have reported that they obtained full organismic understanding of the drive that propels the eel or sake salmon on their heroic journeys against the stream and up the rapids, of the impulses and sensations of the spider spinning its web, or of the mysterious process of metamorphosis from the egg through the stages of the caterpillar and chrysalis to the butterfly. Experiences of this kind can be accompanied by acquisition of extraordinary knowledge about the animals and their processes. Numerous clinical observations of this kind find independent confirmation in a chapter of Bruce Lamb's Wizard of the Upper Amazon, Lamb 1971. This most interesting book bears some similarity to Carlos Castaneda's series describing his apprenticeship with the Mexican Yaqui sorcerer, Don Juan. In this story staged in the Amazonian jungle at the beginning of the century, the shaman of the preliterate Amawaka Indians of Peru sees in his clairvoyant visions induced by ayahuasca, yach, a psychedelic potion from the jungle vine Banisteriosis copy, the arrival of white people looking for rubber. He sends his warriors to capture a specific young man and he trains him for his future role as a cultural broker. According to this book, the Amawaka training for hunters included group ingestion of ayahuasca. Under the influence of the psychedelic brew, participants invoked visions of animals hunted by the tribe. They were able to tune into them and identify with them so fully that they got to know intimately their instincts and habits. Following this experience, their success in hunting increased considerably, since they were always able to switch from the consciousness of the hunter to the consciousness of the hunted animal and outweat their prey. The first example I would like to use here to illustrate this type of experience comes from an unsupervised LSD session of a person involved in serious systematic self-exploration. After having read my books, he decided to share with me his session notes and to receive feedback. Then I had a very real experience of being an eagle. I was soaring by skillfully using the air currents and subtle changes of the position of my wings. I was scanning with my eyes the area far below me looking for prey. Everything on the ground seemed magnified as if seen through a binocular I could recognize the most minuscule details of the terrain. It seemed that I was responding to changes in the visual field. When I spotted movement, it was as if my eyes froze and zoomed in. It was something like tunnel vision, looking through a long and narrow tube. The feeling that this experience accurately represented the mechanism of vision in raptor birds, something I had never thought about or had been interested in was so convincing and compelling that I decided to go to the library to study the anatomy and physiology of their optical system. The following illustration is a sequence of experiences that occurred during systematic self-exploration of a young woman. They began during holotropic breathing and continued in a psychedelic session. The animal identification is combined here in an interesting way with the motif of a ritual dance representing the animal. Several years ago, in a session of breath work with the groffs, I experienced becoming a large cat, a tiger, or jaguar striking out, attacking with claws extended. The impression from that experience was very strong and I made a drawing of it. A year or so later, during a therapeutic psychedelic session, I connected again with the feline energy. I experienced myself as being a young African woman, dancing a ritual dance, dancing an animal, a female lion. In letting my body move with the rhythm of this dance, the movement through my shoulders, upper back, neck, and head became very specific. I had a strong sense that I was not just representing a lioness, but actually became one. I felt that the lioness does not determine her need for food by feelings in her stomach, but rather that this rubbing of the head back into the area between raised shoulders is her means of finding out whether she needs more food to add to her storage of fat for fuel which is located between her shoulder blades. I had no doubt as to the function of the large pad on the neck and shoulders of large cats, but did nothing to research and confirm the fact empirically. Two weeks ago, 
I was listening to an educational tape on body weight. The speaker, William Bennett, briefly contrasted human adipose fat storage and animal fat storage. He described a type of fat not found in humans, but common in animals, called brown fat. Brown fat is stored as a pad between the scapulae of some animals and must be maintained at a certain level to ensure sufficient energy and health for the survival of the animal. The last example is Peter Stafford's report about his animal identifications during a session with Yujas that he experienced with his friends in the Valley of Fire near Las Vegas. The surface of the water shimmered and beckoned. Soon we went back down to the water's edge, eager to stretch and swim, to dive and swirl around. The only drag was keeping on a swimsuit. It seemed so unnecessary and unnatural. Especially since I had become a snake writhing about in the water. I maneuvered in and out of a swamp. Minutes later, I found myself a frog and started propelling myself with long kicks. In both cases, water seemed my natural habitat, and land was distant, alien, somewhat terrifying. After a while, my mind decided that I would like to climb a small mountain that looked down on this idyllic setting, but by now I was a sea lion, so it was difficult to get myself up and onto dry land. As I waited out, I felt awkward, silly, completely out of my element. When I say I felt as though I was first one water creature and then another, what I mean goes far beyond merely feeling slithery and reptilian. The experience had a different feel to it different from anything I had previously felt, both physically and mentally. Under the drug, I was conscious of having different types of memories, and I lost my normal self-awareness. Rather than empathy with what I might imagine a snake or frog might feel, I was sufficiently absorbed in snakeness and frogness as to wonder how the humans around me might feel. What does it mean that while under the urges I did not merely feel like a snake, but in some sense, I was a snake? that somehow I had reached a level of experience where I could contact a potential snakeness residing within. What does it mean that I felt my perceptions were being sorted in terms of new and different categories? E. Identification with plants and botanical processes. Transpersonal experiences involving plant life are common in non-ordinary states of consciousness, although less frequent than animal identification. An individual tuned into this experiential realm has a convinced sense of identification with various plants, parts of plants, or even physiological and biochemical processes in them. He or she can have a complex experience of becoming a tree, a wild, or garden flower, carnivorous plant, kelp, volvox globator, plankton in the ocean, and even a bacterial culture, or individual bacterium. In the holotropic mode, it is possible to identify experientially with a root system of a tree involved in the exchange of water and minerals, with the circulation of sap in the cambium, with a leaf in the course of photosynthetic activity, with the germinating seed and the thrust of the seedling, with the process of pollination, or with the cellular divisions during vegetable growth. On occasion, subjects have reported that they witnessed botanical processes on the subcellular and molecular level. They became experientially aware of the activities of the mitochondria or of the biochemical processes underlying the production of auxins, vegetable pigments, oils and sugars, aromatic substances, and various alkaloids. The experiences of plant consciousness represent an interesting category of transpersonal phenomena. No matter how fantastic and absurd their existence might seem to a traditional scientist and to our common sense, it is not possible to discard them as mere fantasies. They occur independently in many individuals at a certain stage of their consciousness evolution and have a quality of authenticity that cannot be easily communicated in words. They often lead to profound new understanding of the processes involved and are associated with fascinating philosophical and spiritual insights. The most common of these insights is the awareness of the special quality and purity of the existence of plants that make them important examples for human spiritual life. Unlike animals and man, most plants do not kill or lead a predatory type of existence. They are in direct contact with the sun, the life-giving principle of this planet and the most immediate expression of cosmic creative energy. Plants transform this cosmic energy directly into forms in which it can be useful to other organisms. It seems to be of special significance in this context that they provide oxygen for other life forms. 
In this way, they are absolutely indispensable for life on this planet. Another important aspect of vegetable life is that it is in direct and immediate contact with all the remaining elements of earth, water, and air. While not killing, hurting, or exploiting other living organisms, many plants themselves serve as sources of food, minerals, and vitamins for other life forms. In addition, they have many other uses in human life, providing numerous materials and substances and bringing beauty and joy. The life of plants is not confounded by inauthentic ambitions to become something other than what they are, by painful ruminations of the past, by conflicts about the pursuit of alternative goals, or by concerns about the future. They seem to represent pure being in the here and now in full contact with the immediate environment, which is the ideal of many mystical schools. In some subjects, this fascination with the purity of the vegetable kingdom together with the aversion toward slaughter generated by perinatal experiences can result in appreciation of an interest in a vegetarian diet. Trees known for their longevity, such as the gigantic sequoias and redwoods or the tiny bristlecone pines, are often experienced as representing a state of unperturbed, centered, and timeless consciousness independent of the turmoils and upheavals of the world. Experiences of plant identification also often mediate deep understanding as to why certain plants have been considered sacred by some cultures, such as the banyan tree by the Indians, the lotus by the Indians and Egyptians, the mistletoe by the Druids, or the corn by the North and South American Indians. More direct and obvious insights into the spiritual aspects of plants are related to those specimens that have been considered sacred and have been used ritually by different cultures and groups because of their psychedelic or entheogenic effects. Among the psychedelic plants that have played a critical role in the spiritual life of humanity are the legendary Vedic sacrament Soma whose botanical identity is unknown, the African Ebiga, Tabernanthiboga, various parts of hemp, cannabis indica and sativa, the fly agaric, Amanita muscaria, the Mexican sacred mushroom Stianonicatl, Psilocybe mexicana, the visionary cactus peyote, Lophophora williamsii, morning glory seeds or Olalia key, Turbinica rimbosa, and the Amazonian liana. Banisteriosis copy, the main ingredient of yash or ayahuasca. The insights into the numinous role of these plants will naturally be most likely when they are ingested and their specific psychedelic effect is directly experienced. A typical example of the of experience of plant identification is given later in this book in the context of the discussion of therapeutic mechanisms. F. Oneness with life and all creation. In some rare instances, an individual in the holotropic mode can have the experience of consciousness expanding to such an extent that it encompasses the totality of life on this planet, including all of humanity and the entire fauna and flora, from viruses and unicellular organisms to highly differentiated species. Instead of the ordinary identification with one living organism, this experience represents identification with life as a cosmic phenomenon. In some instances, the experience can focus on a particular aspect of life, such as the power of hunger, of the sexual drive, or of the maternal instinct. It can explore the mandatory nature of the law that life always lives on life, or display the astonishing intelligence governing the life processes on various levels of evolution. Sequences of this kind leave no doubt in the experiencer that the phenomena of life cannot be explained by mechanistic science and that they prove the existence of creative cosmic intelligence. Sometimes, the experience of identification with all of life is only horizontal, involving all the complex interactions and interdependences of various life forms in all the permutations of their synergisms and antagonisms that constitute the planetary ecology. Other times, it includes as well the longitudinal, evolutionary dimension of life that will be discussed later. Experiences of this kind can result in deep understanding of the cosmic and natural laws, enhanced ecological awareness, and great sensitivity to problems created by rapid technological development and industrialization. The following is a segment of an LSD session, 300 micrograms, of a psychiatrist, in which the identification with the totality of life on this planet was very prominent. I seem to have connected in a very profound way with life on this planet. At first, I went through a whole series of identifications with various species, but later the experience was more and more encompassing. 
My identity spread not only horizontally in space to include all living forms, but also vertically in time. I became the Darwinian evolutionary tree in all its ramifications. I was the totality of life. I sensed the cosmic quality of the energies and experiences involved in the world of living forms, the endless curiosity and experimentation characterizing life, and the drive for self-expression operating on many different levels. The crucial question I seemed to be dealing with was whether life on this planet would survive. Is it a viable and constructive phenomenon? or a malignant growth on the face of the earth that contains some fatal flaw in its blueprint condemning it to self-destruction? Is it possible that some basic error occurred when the design for the evolution of organic forms was originally laid down? Can creators of universes make mistakes as humans do? It seemed at the moment a plausible, but very frightening idea, something I had never considered before. Identifying with life I experienced and explored an entire spectrum of destructive forces operating in nature and in human beings and saw their dangerous extensions and projections in modem technology threatening to destroy this planet. In this context, I became all the countless victims of the military machinery of modem warfare, prisoners in concentration camps dying in gas chambers, fish poisoned in polluted streams, plants killed by herbicides, and insects sprayed by chemicals. This alternated with moving experiences of smiling infants, charming children playing in the sand, newly born animals and newly hatched birds in carefully built nests, wise dolphins and whales cruising the crystal clear waters of the ocean, and images of beautiful pastures and forests. I felt profound empathy with life, strong ecological awareness, and a real determination to join the pro-life forces on this planet. Gee experience of inanimate matter and inorganic processes. Experiential extension of consciousness in the holotropic mode is not limited to the world of biology, it can include macroscopic and microscopic phenomena of inorganic nature. Subjects have repeatedly reported that they had experientially identified with the water in rivers and oceans, with various forms of fire, with the earth and mountains, or with the forces unleashed in natural catastrophes, such as electric storms, earthquakes, tornadoes, and volcanic eruptions. Equally common is identification with specific materials, diamond and other precious stones, quartz crystal, amber, granite, iron, steel, quicksilver, silver, or gold. These experiences can extend into the microworld and involve the dynamic structure of molecules and atoms the Brownian movement, interatomic bonds, and even electromagnetic forces and the subatomic particles. On occasion, experiences of this kind involve highly sophisticated products of modem technology, such as jets, rockets and spaceships, lasers, or computers. Under these circumstances, the body image can assume all the qualities of the materials and processes involved, so that they become complex, conscious experiences. It seems that every process in the universe that one can observe objectively in the ordinary state of consciousness also has a subjective experiential counterpart in the holotropic mode. Experiences of this kind suggest that consciousness and creative intelligence are not products of inanimate matter, but that they play a critical role in the entire fabric of existence. This is a notion that is being increasingly confirmed by modem developments in subatomic physics, astrophysics, biology, thermodynamics, information and systems theory, and other branches of science. It is of particular interest that experiential identification with the inorganic world is not limited to the secular aspects, but has often distinct numinous or spiritual qualities. The identification with water can thus be experienced simultaneously as a state of consciousness characterized by timelessness, fluidity, melting of boundaries, quiet unassuming strength, purification and cleansing, and the paradoxical combination of immutability and dynamic change. Similarly, fire can be experienced as a spiritual force of awesome power with its capacity to create and destroy transform solid forms into energy, comfort and nourish or threaten and hurt, and potentially purify. The element of fire, particularly in the form of the sun, is often experienced as a direct manifestation of the cosmic creative force in the universe, the most immediate manifestation of the divine in the phenomenal world. In congruence with many mystical systems through the ages, 
the experiences related to various precious stones and metals, particularly diamond and gold, are associated with very high spiritual states characterized by ultimate purity, immutability, and special radiance. Their images often occur in connection with archetypal visions of paradises, heavens, or celestial cities. Aldous Huxley's famous talk The Visionary Experience in which he addresses the question why are precious stones precious, is particularly relevant from this point of view. His answer is that the enormous value that we attribute to precious stones and metals is based upon the fact that they are surrogates for us of a mystical experience. In our everyday consciousness, they represent the closest approximation to certain experiential characteristics of the visionary states. Experiential identification with inorganic matter is often accompanied by fascinating insights of a philosophical, mythological, religious, and mystical nature. The intimate relationship between the experiences of the inorganic world and spiritual states can convey an entirely new understanding of animism and pantheism, medieval alchemy, homeopathy, the systems of four and five elements found in Greek philosophy, Chinese medicine, or in tantric scriptures, and many other ancient and oriental teachings. For subjects who have had the experience of identification with water, it is easy to understand why it has such paramount significance in Taoism and is so often used as a spiritual metaphor. On the basis of a deep personal experience, it is also easy to comprehend why the sun has been worshipped by so many cultures as God, or why volcanoes have been perceived as deities of creation and destruction. Similarly, Experiential identification with granite can convey a deep insight into why the Hindus see the Himalayas as reclining Shiva, or why various cultures created gigantic granite sculptures. On a deeper level, these are not images of deities or idols, but the deities themselves. It is the state of consciousness associated with these materials undifferentiated, imperturbable, unchangeable, and transcending linear time that is the true deity. It is worshipped because it differs so dramatically from the mercurial, turbulent, and erratic states of consciousness characterizing ordinary human existence in the world of biology. The importance of the fact that time is different for different realms of the phenomenal world has been recently emphasized by Ilya Prigozhin and Eric Yance. I will illustrate this remarkable type of experience by an account of a session with 150 mg of Kettler, ketamine, a dissociative anesthetic used in surgery and veterinarian medicine. It seems that after the administration of this substance, experiential identification with inorganic matter is particularly frequent. The atmosphere was dark, heavy, and ominous. It seemed to be toxic and poisonous in a chemical sense, but also dangerous and evil in the metaphysical sense. I realized I was becoming petroleum, filling enormously large cavities in the interior of the earth. I was flooded with fascinating insights combining chemistry, geology, biology, psychology, mythology, economy, and politics. I understood that petroleum, immense deposits of mineralized fat of biological origin, had escaped the mandatory cycle of death and birth that the world of living matter is subjected to. However, the element of death was not completely avoided, it was only delayed. The destructive plutonic potential of death continues to exist in petroleum in a latent form and waits for its opportunity as a monstrous time bomb. While experiencing what I felt was consciousness of petroleum, I saw the death associated with it manifesting as killing based on greed and lust of those who seek the astronomical profits that it offers. I witnessed scenes of political intrigues and economic shenanigans motivated by oil money. It was not difficult to follow the chains of events to a future world war for the dwindling resources of a substance that has become vital for the survival and prosperity of all the industrialized countries. It became clear to me that it is essential for the future of the planet to reorient the economic life to solar energy and other renewable resources. The linear policy of fossil fuels that plunders the limited existing reserves and turns them into toxic waste and pollution is obviously fundamentally wrong being totally incompatible with the cosmic order that is cyclical. While the exploitation of fossil fuels was understandable in the historical context of the Industrial Revolution, its continuation once its fatal trajectory was recognized seemed suicidal and criminal. In a long series of hideous and most unpleasant experiences I was taken through states of consciousness related to the chemical industry based on petroleum. Using the name of the famous German chemical combinate, 
I referred to these experiences as the IG Farben Consciousness. It was an infinite sequence of states of mind that had the quality of aniline dyes, organic solvents, herbicides, pesticides, and toxic gases. Beside the experiences related to these various industrial poisons per se, I also identified with the states of consciousness associated with the exposure of different life forms to the petroleum products. I became every Jew who died in the Nazi gas chambers, every sprayed ant and cockroach, every fly caught in the sticky goo of the fly traps, and every plant dying under the influence of herbicides. And beyond all that lurked the highly possible future of all of life on the planet, death by industrial pollution. It was an incredible lesson. I emerged from the session with a deep ecological awareness and a clear sense as to which direction the economic and political development has to take should life on the planet survive. H. Planetary Consciousness In this type of transpersonal experience, the consciousness of the subject expands to such an extent that it seems to encompass all aspects of this planet, this includes its geological substance with the entire mineral kingdom, as well as the biosphere with all the life forms including humans. From this point of view, the entire Earth seems to be one complex organism, a cosmic entity whose different aspects geological, biological, psychological, cultural and technological phenomena, can be seen as manifestations of a sustained effort to reach a higher level of evolution, integration and self-actualization. This experience typically involves also the mythological dimension and has a distinctly numinous quality. In this context, the Earth can be perceived as Mother Earth or a divine being, in the sense of the Greek goddess Gaia. It is easy to see that the processes on Earth are guided by superior intelligence that by far supersedes ours, and that it should be respected and trusted and not be tempered and interfered with from a limited human perspective. This insight that has repeatedly emerged in non-ordinary states of consciousness in many individuals has recently received independent support from modern science. Gregory Battison who achieved in his work a brilliant synthesis of the perspectives of cybernetics, information and systems theory, theory of evolution, anthropology and psychology, came to the conclusion that it is not only legitimate, but logically inevitable to assume the existence of mental processes on all the levels of natural phenomena of sufficient complexity, cells, organs, tissues, organisms, animal and human groups, ecosystems, and even the earth and the universe as a whole. In this way of thinking, science has confirmed the old concept of Dies Sub Natura, or the existence of immanent God as articulated by Spinoza. Quite independently, James Lovelock amassed in his remarkable book Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth fascinating evidence about intricate homeostatic mechanisms maintaining the steadiness of the Earth's temperature and concentration of the key components in the atmosphere, ocean water, and soil, such as salt, oxygen, ammonia, and ozone. His findings are compatible with the assumption that the Earth is an intelligent organism. Theodore Roshik in his book Person Slash Planet and Peter Russell in his Global Brain reached similar conclusions. The following example of planetary consciousness comes from a holotropic breathing session of a young German woman who attended several years ago one of our five-day workshops. The experience of being the Great Mother Goddess, Mother Earth, then changed into actually becoming the planet Earth. There was no question that I, the Earth, was a living organism, an intelligent being trying to understand myself, struggling to evolve to a higher level of awareness, and attempting to communicate with other cosmic beings. The metals and minerals constituting the planet were my bones, my skeleton. The biosphere, the plant life, animals and humans, were my flesh. I experienced within myself the circulation of water from the oceans to the clouds and from there into little creeks and large rivers and back into the sea. The water system was my blood and the meteorological changes, the evaporation, air currents, the rainfall and the snow ensured its circulation, transport of nourishment, and cleansing. The communication between plants, animals and humans, including modern technology, the press, telephone, radio, television, and the computer network, was my nervous system, my brain. I felt in my body the injury of the industrial insults of strip mining, urbanization, toxic and radioactive waste, and pollution of air and water. 
The strangest part of the session was that I was aware of rituals among various aboriginal peoples and experienced them as very healing and absolutely vital for myself. It seems somewhat weird and bizarre to me now, when I have returned to my everyday rational thinking, but during my experience it was extremely convincing that doing rituals is important for the earth. I, extraterrestrial experiences. In these experiences consciousness extends to celestial bodies, parts of the universe, and astronomical processes that are outside of the terrestrial sphere. The individual can have a sense of travel to the moon, sun, other planets, stars and galaxies and can experience explosions of supernovas, contraction of stars, quasars and pulsars, and passage through black holes. This can occur in the form of simply witnessing such events, or actually becoming them and experiencing in one's own experiential field all the processes involved. Like the identification with inorganic matter described above, these experiences often have spiritual concomitants and counterparts. Thus, for example, experimental identification with the thermonuclear processes inside the sun can be associated with a sense of contact with the creative power of cosmic consciousness. The experience of passage through the black hole typically involves experiential collapse of time, space and of the philosophical belief in the material reality of the phenomenal world. The experience of the interstellar space connects similarly with the spiritual experience of the void described later in this chapter. Extraterrestrial experiences seem to be unusually frequent in the non-ordinary states of consciousness of John Lilly the famous neuroscientist known for his research of non-human intelligence and interspecies communication, as well as for his unparalleled marathons and psychedelic self-experimentation. In his sessions, he experienced numerous visits to alien worlds and encounters or communication with strange beings and presences. Here is his description of one of such events facilitated by the injection of 75 mg of the dissociative anesthetic kettler, ketamine, and his stay in a sensory isolation tank. I have left my body floating in a tank on the planet Earth. This is a very strange and alien environment. It must be extraterrestrial, I have not been here before. I must be on some other planet in some civilization other than the one in which I was evolved. I am in a peculiar state of high indifference. I am not involved in either fear or love. I am a highly neutral being, watching and waiting. This is very strange. This planet is similar to Earth but the colors are different. There is vegetation but it is a peculiar purple color. There is a sun but it has a violet hue to it, not the familiar orange of Earth's sun. I am in a beautiful meadow with distant, extremely high mountains. Across the meadow I see creatures approaching. They stand on their hind legs, as if human. They are a brilliant white and seem to be emitting light. Two of them come near. I cannot make out their features. They are too brilliant for my present vision. They seem to be transmitting thoughts and ideas directly to me. There is no sound. Automatically, what they think is translated into words that I can understand. J. Identification with the entire physical universe. This rare experience represents a further logical extension beyond the planetary and extraterrestrial experiences. Here the subject has the feeling that his or her consciousness has expanded to such an extent that it has encompassed the entire physical universe. All the cosmic processes are then experienced as intra-organismic and intrapsychic phenomena within this immense being. This is typically associated with the insight that while various entities of the phenomenal world are experiencing only certain specific aspects of the material reality, the cosmic or divine consciousness has a complete and total simultaneous experience of everything there is both from the point of view of the individual separate units of consciousness and from that of the undivided whole as experienced from the center. K. Psychic phenomena involving transcendence of space, out-of-body experiences, traveling clairvoyance and clairaudience, space travels, and telepathy. This subgroup of ESP phenomena traditionally studied by parapsychology can be seen as transpersonal experiences involving transcendence of spatial barriers and distances. They can occur in a pure form or in combination with simultaneous transcendence of linear time. The experience of consciousness detaching from one's body, or out-of-body experience, OLBE, has various forms and degrees. 
It can take the form of isolated episodes, or can occur repeatedly as part of psychic opening and other types of transpersonal crises. Among the circumstances that are particularly conducive to OOBs are vital emergencies, near-death situations, experiences of clinical death, sessions of deep experiential psychotherapy, and ingestion of psychedelic substances, especially the dissociative anesthetic ketamine, Kettler. Classical descriptions of OLBEs can be found in spiritual literature and philosophical texts of all ages, particularly in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Bardo the Troll or the Dal, and other similar literature. These descriptions were not taken seriously by traditional science until recently, when modem research in experimental psychiatry and thanatology confirmed their authenticity. During less extreme forms of OLB, one has a sense of leaving the body, detaching from it, and seeing oneself from various distances as an object, hedidoscopy. In more advanced forms of OLB, the individual experiences himself or herself in other rooms of the building, in remote locations, astral projection, flying above the earth, or moving away from it. A particularly dramatic and moving description of an OLB in a near-death state can be found in the autobiography of Carl Gustav Jung, Jung 1961. In these states, the subject can accurately witness events in the areas to which detached consciousness projects. Although this should be, in principle, impossible according to Cartesian Newtonian science, the authenticity of this phenomenon has been repeatedly confirmed and is beyond any doubt. The research of Raymond Moody, Kenneth Ring, Michael Sabam, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, my own study, and work of many others have repeatedly confirmed that clinically dead people can have OOBEs, during which they accurately witness the resuscitation procedures from a position near the ceiling, or perceive events in remote locations. According to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, even blind persons have under these circumstances the ability to perceive the environment visually in colors. Modem thanatological research thus confirms the descriptions from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, according to which an individual after death assumes the Bardo body that transcends the limitations of time and space and can freely travel around the earth. Observations from psychedelic research, holotropic breathing, and other types of experiential psychotherapy similarly confirm the possibility of authentic OLBEs during visionary states, as they have been reported in various mystical sources and in anthropological literature. Clairvoyance and clairaudience of remote events can occur without a sense of actually being there, in the form of astral travel to the location involved, or as instant astral projection. In rare instances, the subject can actually actively control and direct the astral space travel. The famous OLBE veteran and researcher Robert Monroe, who had struggled for many years with spontaneous and elemental OLBEs, not only learned how to control them, but also developed specific exercises and electronic technology to facilitate their occurrence. The authenticity of OLBEs has been demonstrated in controlled clinical experiments by the famous psychologist and parapsychologist Charles Tart at the University of California at Davis. A highly successful series of scientifically designed remote viewing experiments has been conducted at the Stanford Research Institute in California by the physicists Russell Tark and Harold Puthoff. Among the most remarkable performances in remote viewing were the sessions with the psychic Ingo Swan, who repeatedly demonstrated his ability to describe accurately any place on the globe when given the numerical coordinates for its longitude and latitude. However, even more interesting were the findings of these scientists indicating that practically everybody can be trained to perform successfully in these experiments. Telepathy is direct access to the thought processes of another individual without the mediation of words, nonverbal clues, or other conventional means of communication. Telepathic flashes occur occasionally in ordinary states of consciousness. However, the incidence of telepathic exchange increases considerably when the individual moves into the holotropic mode induced by meditation, experiential techniques of psychotherapy, ingestion of psychedelics, or vital emergency. Although it might not always be easy to distinguish telepathy from other types of parapsychological and transpersonal experiences, careful research leaves little doubt that it is a genuine phenomenon. The following example is a remarkable out-of-body experience with accurate perception of a remote location reported by Kimberly Clark, who works as a social worker in Seattle. 
The circumstances of this case were so extraordinary and convincing that the event instigated in her a lasting interest in OLBEs. My first encounter with a near-death experience involved a patient named Maria, a migrant worker who was visiting friends in Seattle and had a severe heart attack. She was brought into the hospital by the rescue squad one night and admitted to the coronary care unit. I got involved in her care as a result of her social and financial problems. A few days after her admission, she had a cardiac arrest. Because she was so closely monitored and was otherwise in good health, she was brought back quickly, intubated for a couple of hours to make sure that her oxygenation was adequate, and then extubated. Later in the day I went to see her, thinking that she might have some anxiety about the fact that her heart had stopped. In fact, she was anxious, but not for that reason. She was in a state of relative agitation, in contrast to her usual calmness. She wanted to talk to me about something. She said, the strangest thing happened when the doctors and nurses were working on me, I found myself looking down from the ceiling at them working on my body. I was not impressed at first. I thought that she might know what had been going on in the room, what people were wearing, and who would be there, since she had seen them all day prior to her cardiac arrest. Certainly she was familiar with the equipment by that time. Since hearing is the last sense to go, I reasoned that she could hear everything that was going on, and while I did not think she was consciously making this up, I thought it might have been a confabulation. She then told me that she had been distracted by something over the emergency room driveway and found herself outside, as if she had thought herself over the emergency room driveway and, in just that instant, she was out there. At this point, I was a little more impressed, since she had arrived at night inside an ambulance and would not have known what the emergency room area looked like. However, I reasoned that perhaps at some point in time her bed had been by the window, she had looked outside, and this had been incorporated into the confabulation. But then Maria proceeded to describe being further distracted by an object on the third floor ledge on the north end of the building. She thought her way up there and found herself eyeball to shoelace with the tennis shoe, which she asked me to try to find for her. She needed someone else to know that the tennis shoe was really there to validate her out-of-body experience. With mixed emotions, I went outside and looked up at the ledges but could not see much at all. I went up to the third floor and began going in and out of patients' rooms and looking out their windows, which were so narrow that I had to press my face to the screen just to see the ledge at all. Finally, I found a room where I pressed my face to the glass and looked down and saw the tennis shoe. My vantage point was very different from what Maria's had to have been for her to notice that the little toe had worn a place in the shoe and that the lace was stuck under the heel and other details about the side of the shoe not visible to me. The only way she would have had such a perspective was if she had been floating right outside and at very close range to the tennis shoe. I retrieved the shoe and brought it back to Maria. It was very concrete evidence for me. The experience of extraordinary perception can be associated with deep metaphysical fear, since it challenges and undermines the worldview that the Western culture subscribes to and associates with sanity. The following episode from my psychedelic training session with 250 micrograms of LSD at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center can be used here as an example. A similar situation involving an out-of-body experience with directed space travel was described in my book Realms of the Human Unconscious. When I was feeling strongly the effects of the drug, my guide for the session, Walter Pank, introduced his ESP experiment as we had agreed upon before we started. It was a modification of the famous center deck of cards. I was given a keyboard with five different symbols, a circle, square, cross, star and two wavy lines resembling the astrological sign for Aquarius, the keys were also color-coded. This keyboard was connected to an identical one in the adjacent room, on which the keys could be lit either manually by the experimenter or electronically following a pattern based on the table of random numbers. The experiment was structured so that the subject operated with or without feedback as to the success of the guesses. At first, my approach was very casual and playful. I was either pressing one of the keys automatically, or was using as a clue the nature and color of my visions. After a while, I started feeling that this experiment was a serious matter. 
Testing of ESP cannot be isolated from some very fundamental questions about human consciousness, role of the psyche in the world, and the nature of reality. What we were testing was not the existence or non-existence of extrasensory perception, but the validity of the current scientific worldview. Unquestionably positive results would destroy the present belief system and shatter the sense of certainty and security that an average Westerner draws from it. At the same time, it seemed clear that this alternative worldview was obvious and self-evident, extrasensory perception seemed an easy task, a child's play. I felt total identification with John, Lennox, who was in the other room supervising the keyboard. I could taste the menthol flavor of the gum he was chewing on and was sure that I could see the panel through his eyes. It also seemed that, in a similar way, I could use Helen, Bonnie, who was much more emotional and sensitive, to connect with the colors. Just at this time, Walter announced through the microphone that he would give me feedback about correct and incorrect guesses. I got the first symbol correct and started having a strange sense of excitement and adventure. When I got the next one correct immediately following the first, this feeling increased enormously. The third correct answer in a row sent me into a state of metaphysical panic. The possibility of transcending the limitations of space and time was becoming a reality, confirmed by objective scientific testing. I saw clearly the image of the fourth symbol, but became strangely afraid to report it to the experimenters. I decided to name a different one choosing on purpose a 1 to 4 probability that I was right, instead of risking the certainty of another correct guess. As I checked after the session, the image I saw, but decided not to report was the correct one, this was a result that could occur by chance in one of 625 trials. At this point, I refused to continue any further, to Wally's great disappointment. The reason for discontinuing the experiment was a strange mixture of conviction that it was absurd to test the obvious and of fear to have this confirmed by the methods of Western science. 2. Transcendence of the boundaries of linear time In non-ordinary states of consciousness, many subjects experience concrete and realistic episodes which they describe as fetal and embryonal memories. It is not unusual under these circumstances to identify with the embryo in very early stages of its intrauterine development, or even with the sperm and the ovum at the time of conception. Sometimes the historical regression goes even further and the individual has a convinced feeling of reliving memories from the lives of his or her ancestors, or even drawing on the memory banks of the racial or collective unconscious. When such sequences are associated with a sense of personal memory from one's spiritual rather than biological history, we can refer to them as karmic or past incarnation experiences. On occasion, subjects report experiences in which they identify with specific animal ancestors in the evolutionary pedigree, or with the entire phylogenetic tree. It is even possible to experience the history of the universe before the origin of life on Earth and witness dramatic sequences of the Big Bang formation of the galaxies, birth of the solar system, and the early geophysical processes on this planet. A. Embryonal and fetal experiences I have already briefly mentioned some experiences of this kind in the context of the first perinatal matrix, BPM-1. Since the concept of perinatal experiences and matrices refers to processes immediately associated with biological birth, only intrauterine experiences in advanced stages of pregnancy belong to BPM-1, however, in the process of systematic self-exploration with psychedelics, powerful non-drug techniques of psychotherapy, or meditation, the subject can connect experientially with any stage of embryonal and fetal development. These experiences portray in a concrete, realistic, and detailed way various prenatal situations, usually those that are dramatic and associated with a strong emotional charge. The sequences of undisturbed intraterran existence are experienced as episodes of oceanic ecstasy with a mystical connection to life and to the cosmic creative force, while the various crises of prenatal development are experienced as states of anguish, paranoia, physical distress, and attacks of demonic forces. Both types of prenatal sequences typically associate with other types of transpersonal phenomena, most frequently with phylogenetic, karmic, and archetypal experiences and with organ, tissue, and cellular consciousness. These phenomena will be discussed later in this book. 
Many prenatal experiences are related to intrauterine psychotraumatization resulting from various noxious and disturbing stimuli of a mechanical, physiological, or biochemical nature. Observations from psychedelic and holotropic sessions suggest that the fetus can experience not only gross disturbances of the intrauterine existence, such as imminent miscarriage and attempted abortion, intense mechanical concussions and vibrations, loud sounds, toxic influences, and somatic disease of the mother, but also share the mother's emotions. Many subjects have repeatedly reported that during experiences of intrauterine existence they could clearly participate in their mother's emotional shocks, anxiety attacks, outbursts of hate or aggression, depressive mood, and sexual arousal, or, conversely, in their feelings of relaxation, satisfaction, happiness, and love. This complex exchange and experiential sharing is not limited to intense and dramatic physical and emotional events. It can often include nuances and subtleties of feeling qualities and even telepathic transfer of thoughts and images. During the reliving of episodes from intrauterine existence, subjects have repeatedly reported that they were keenly aware of being unwanted and resented, or, conversely, desired and loved. It was as if they were receiving a clear organismic message expressing their mother's feelings about the pregnancy, as well as specific loving or hostile communications directed toward them. For many individuals, memories of fetal traumatization seem to be among important factors underlying general emotional instability and various specific forms of psychopathology. Similarly, the question of having been wanted or unwanted by one's mother appears again and again as an issue of critical importance that requires much time and effort in deep experiential therapy of any kind. For those individuals who were born as twins, the problems of sharing the womb with a partner and competitor represent a special challenge and can have profound effects on future psychological development. The authenticity of embryonal memories in experiential psychotherapy with or without psychedelics is an important question that has far-reaching practical and theoretical implications. It is comparable to the problems related to reliving memories from early infancy, only more difficult and fundamental. Perinatal and prenatal material has been repeatedly reported in psychoanalytic literature, but with a few exceptions, such as Otto Rank, Sander Ferenczi, Nander Fodor, and Leoteric Pierbolt, it has not been taken seriously. While postnatal events remembered or reconstructed by patients during psychoanalysis, unless too fantastic and incredible, have always been given serious consideration as possibly reflecting real events, references to birth and to the intrauterine state have been routinely referred to as fantasies. Having witnessed over the years countless episodes of embryonal and fetal experiences in other people and having experienced several prenatal episodes myself, both in psychedelic sessions and in non-drug contexts, I find it impossible to discard them simply as figments of imagination. Many professionals from various fields have repeatedly reported their astonishment about the authenticity of these phenomena and the richness of information concerning anatomy, physiology, embryology, obstetrics, and even histology that they entailed. Even lay persons often volunteer descriptions of such details as certain characteristics of the heartbeat of the mother and child, murmurs in the blood vessels and in the intestinal tract, specific details about the position and behavior of the fetus relevant facts about fetal circulation, and even about exchange of blood in the placentary villi. Sophisticated and well-educated individuals have often emphasized that experiences of this kind had occurred in their sessions in spite of the fact that they did not believe in the possibility of prenatal memories and that the existence of this phenomenon was contrary to their scientific worldview. The authenticity of prenatal experiences as well as the richness of information that they mediate have given me sufficient confidence in the importance of this phenomenon. Whenever possible, I would make every effort to get independent information from the mother, prenatal records, the obstetrician, the relatives, or some other sources, and compare it with the subjective account of the client. This has often brought astonishing confirmation of the insights reached during the reliving of prenatal memories concerning various crises of pregnancy, attempted abortions, and emotional upheavals or physical diseases of the mother. These observations provide more than sufficient reason for a future serious and systematic research of this fascinating phenomenon. On occasion, the experiences of prenatal existence depict very early stages of the individual's biological history including identification with the sperm and the ovum on the cellular level of consciousness, 
ovulation, passage of the ovum or spermatozoids through the fallopian tube, the moment of conception, implantation of the fertilized egg in the mucous membrane of the uterus, and the early embryonal growth. Sequences of this kind can be associated with insights into hereditary influences, cosmobiological and astrological energy fields, or spiritual, karmic, and archetypal forces governing the development of the embryo. The example I would like to use here to illustrate the phenomenon of fetal experience comes from the psychedelic therapy of Richard, a gay male suffering from chronic suicidal depressions. The condensed history of his treatment was described in my earlier book Realms of the Human Unconscious. The same book also contains a detailed description of a cellular memory of the germinal cells and of conception. In one of the LSD sessions of his psycholytic series, Richard described what appeared to be an authentic intrauterine experience. He felt immersed in fetal liquid and fixed to the placenta by the umbilical cord. He was aware of nourishment streaming into his body through the navel area and experienced wonderful feelings of symbiotic unity with his mother. They were connected with each other through the placentary circulation of blood that seemed to be a magical life-giving fluid. Richard heard two sets of heart sounds with different frequencies that were merging into one undulating acoustic pattern. This was accompanied by peculiar hollow and roaring noises that Richard identified after some hesitation as those produced by the blood gushing through the pelvic arteries and by movements of gas and liquid during the peristaltic movements of the intestines adjacent to the uterus. He was fully aware of his body image and recognized that it was very different from his adult one. He was small and his head was disproportionately large as compared with the body and the extremities. On the basis of various experiential clues and with the use of adult judgment, he was able to identify himself as being a mature fetus just before delivery. In this state, he suddenly heard strange noises coming from the outside world. They had a very unusual echoing quality, as if they were resounding in a large hall or coming through a layer of water the resulting effect reminded him of the sound quality that music technicians achieve on purpose through electronic means and modem recordings. He finally concluded that the abdominal and uterine walls and the fetal liquid were responsible for this effect and that this was the form in which external sounds reach the fetus. He then tried to identify what produced these sounds and where they were coming from. After some time, he could recognize human voices that were yelling and laughing and what seemed to be sounds of carnival trumpets. Suddenly, the idea came to him that these had to be the sounds of the fair held annually in his native village two days prior to his birthday. After having put together the above pieces of information, he concluded that his mother must have attended this fair in an advanced stage of pregnancy. Richard's mother, when asked independently about the circumstances of his birth, without being told about his LSD experience, volunteered among other things the following story. In the relatively dull life of the village, the annual fair was an event providing rare excitement. Although she was in a late stage of pregnancy, she would not have missed this opportunity for anything in the world. In spite of strong objections and warnings from her own mother, she left home to participate in the festivities. According to her relatives, the noisy environment and turmoil of the mart precipitated Richard's delivery. Richard denied ever having heard this story and his mother did not remember ever having told him about this event. B. Ancestral Experiences this group of transpersonal experiences is characterized by a strong sense of historical regression along biological lines to periods preceding the subject's conception and by an authentic identification with one's ancestors. Sometimes these experiences are related to comparatively recent family history and to more immediate ancestors on the maternal and paternal side, such as parents and grandparents. However, in their extreme form, they can reach back several generations and even centuries. In general, the content of these experiences is always compatible with the individual's racial history and cultural background. Thus, a Jewish subject may experience ancestral episodes from the Holocaust during World War II, from medieval pogroms, or from tribal life in Israel during biblical times and may develop a deep bond with his or her racial, cultural, and religious heritage. A person of Scandinavian origin may witness various scenes from the adventurous explorations and conquests of the Vikings, these scenes may be accompanied by vividness of detail with regard to garments, weapons, jewelry, or techniques of navigation and naval warfare. Similarly, 
an Afro-American can relieve sequences from the lives of African natives that involve daily village activities, rites of passage, healing ceremonies, and various festivities, or traumatic events from the history of slavery. Such experiences are usually associated with interesting psychological insights, the subject can relate these archaic elements to his or her present personality and current psychological problems. Ancestral experiences are multiform and complex. Sometimes they take the form of the actual reliving of short episodes or entire sequences from the life of one's ancestors that are concrete, specific, and rich in detail. They can involve full experiential identification with the ancestors, including the body image, facial expression, gestures, emotional reactions, and thought processes. Other times, they are of a much more generalized and diffuse nature, here the subject senses the emotional atmosphere and quality of interpersonal relations in the family, clan, or tribe, and can reach intuitive insights into cultural attitudes, belief systems, customs, and habits, traditions, idiosyncrasies, prejudices, and superstitions. Some subjects have reported in this context that as a result of such experiences they have developed a new understanding of their personality structure and some of their problems and conflicts that did not make sense before. They could trace them back to various incongruences, incompatibilities, and friction points between their maternal and paternal lineages. What they had tried to understand without success as personal problems suddenly appeared to be interjected and internalized conflicts between generations of their dead ancestors. There are two important characteristics of ancestral experiences that differentiate them from the following group of racial and collective phenomena. The first of these is an experiential quality that is hard to describe. The subject who has an ancestral experience has a firm subjective feeling that the protagonist belongs to his or her own bloodline, that the experience involves reading of the genetic code of the DNA. In addition, objective investigation, if it can be carried out, typically brings results that are congruent with the subject's experience. In several instances where there was a seeming discrepancy, for example, in the case of an ancestral memory of an Anglo-Saxon that involved a gypsy or a black person exploration of the family pedigree confirmed the accuracy of the experience. I will illustrate this phenomenon by an interesting observation from a session of holotropic breathing that we conducted in our last workshop in Stockholm, Sweden. Two additional examples of ancestral experiences can be found in my book Realms of the Human Unconscious, Groff 1975, the first one reaches back one generation, the other over three centuries. A young woman who had come to the seminar from Finland experienced during this session a very powerful sequence of scenes involving aggression and killing in various types of war. It was happening in the context of the death-rebirth process and reliving of biological birth. All of these sequences had typical features of BPM-3. One of these scenes was unusual and different from the others. She experienced herself as a young soldier participating in a battle during World War II that had taken place 14 years before she was conceived. She suddenly realized that she actually became her father and experienced this battle from his point of view. She was fully identified with him and felt his body, his emotions, and his thoughts. She could also perceive very clearly what was happening in the environment around her. At one moment, as she slash he was hiding behind a tree, a bullet came and scraped her slash his cheek and ear. The experience was extremely vivid, authentic, and compelling. She did not know where it came from and what to make of it. Intellectually she knew that her father had participated in the Russo-Finnish war, but was sure that he had never talked about the above episode. Finally, she concluded that she must have connected with her father's memory of an actual historical event and decided to check it out by telephone. She came back to the group very excited and in awe. When she called her father and told him about her experience, her father was absolutely astounded. What she experienced was an episode that had actually happened to him in the war, her description of the scene and of the environment was absolutely accurate. He also reassured her that he had never discussed this particular event with her or other members of the family, because it was not sufficiently serious. C. Racial and Collective Experiences These experiences represent a further movement away from one's individual life and history. In racial experiences, 
the protagonists involved are not the ancestors connected with the individual by bloodlines, but are any of the members of the same race. In collective experiences, this process transcends even racial barriers and extends to humanity as a whole. These phenomena are dearly related to Carl Gustav Jung's concept of the racial and collective unconscious and thus represent important supportive evidence for one of the most controversial aspects of his conceptual framework. Individuals in non-ordinary states of consciousness who tune into these experiential realms participate in dramatic, usually brief, but occasionally complex and elaborate, sequences that take place in more or less remote historical periods and in various countries and cultures. These scenes can be experienced from the position of an observer, but more frequently from experiential identification with the protagonists. This is typically associated with many general, or specific and detailed insights concerning social structure, religious practices, rituals, moral codes, art, and technology of the cultures and the historical periods involved. Collective memories can be related to any country, historical period, racial group, or culture, although there seems to be a certain preference for ancient civilizations with highly developed spiritual, philosophical, and artistic traditions. Sequences from ancient Egypt, India, Tibet, China, Japan, pre-Columbian Mexico, and Peru, Greece and Rome tend to occur with surprising frequency. The choice of the cultures and geographical areas can be quite independent from the subject's own racial and ethnic background country of origin, cultural tradition, and slash or even previous education and interests. Thus an individual of Slavic origin can experientially participate in the conquests of Genghis Khan's Mongolian hordes, identify with African Kalahari Bushmen during their trance dance, experience a ritual initiation of the Australian Aborigines, or identify with a sacrificial victim of the Aztecs. An Anglo-Saxon can experience dramatic sequences from the history of Afro-American slavery or participate in the role of an American Indian in the massacres during the conquest of the Wild West and develop as a result of it a new awareness of and sensitivity to American racial problems. A person of Jewish heritage can tune into the cultures of the Far East and acquire as a result of profound experiences in this context surprising understanding of the Japanese, Chinese, or Tibetan psyche certain aspects of Taoist or Buddhist teachings, martial arts, or oriental music and drama. Sometimes the above experiences can be accompanied by complex gestures, postures, and movement sequences that correctly and accurately reflect certain specific aspects of the culture or tradition involved. We have repeatedly observed in psychedelic and holotropic sessions that naive subjects have assumed at appropriate times and in the right context symbolic gestures, madras, and postures, asanas, from the yogic tradition and have spontaneously discovered their meaning. In several instances, subjects experientially tuned into a specific cultural context felt a strong need to dance. Without any previous specific training or even intellectual knowledge of the culture involved, they were able to perform spontaneously various dance and movement forms, such as the Cone Bushman trance dance, whirling of the dervishes in the Sufi tradition, Indonesian dances performed in Java or Bali, and symbolic dancing of the Indian Kathakali or Manipuri schools. During collective memories, the individual has the feeling that he or she is witnessing episodes from human history, displays of cultural diversity and the richness of mankind, or illustrations of the cosmic drama and divine play, Lila. These experiences are not associated with the sense of reading the DNA code characteristic for ancestral memories with racial belonging usually accompanying racial memories, or with a sense of personal recall and spiritual or karmic continuity which is a regular concomitant of past incarnation phenomena. The following example of racial experiences comes from an unsupervised LSD session of a Jewish subject who subsequently shared with me some highlights of his inner quest. I suddenly realized that shame was a split common to all of humanity. Being ashamed of my father, just like my father was, I had a strong feeling that shame is communicated at birth and has something important to do with sexual organs. I felt tired and old, like my father, and his father, and his father's father before him. It was the fatigue before death and a desire to die. I sensed a deep connection with my Jewish heritage through the whole line of male ancestors and the thousand years of rabbis. And then I felt a burning and itching pain around my penis and I realized that I was going through circumcision. 
The wine of the ceremony and my father's presence seemed to be related to the tired feeling. This was the deep source of shame. All the men participating in the ceremony were subconsciously ashamed and embarrassed at the incident and communicated their feelings to the infant, passing the feelings of pain, shame, and tiredness to the infant along with the religious tradition. I felt deeply ashamed of myself. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? You should be ashamed of yourself. My mother and my father telling me hundreds of times to be ashamed of myself. I am so ashamed that I am being ashamed to be ashamed. Ashamed of my needs, ashamed of my feelings. The common bond of the Jewish people is shame. The wedding song in Fiddler on the Roof contains a wish, May God keep you from shame. Adam ate the apple and knew shame. The legacy handed down from father to son from the time of Abraham is shame. The covenant of Abraham, passed on to the male infant for four thousand years. I found myself holding my penis and my testicles. All of a sudden came a vision that totally clarified everything for me. Circumcision was a substitute for child sacrifice. Abraham brought Isaac as a sacrifice to God, but then was ordered to circumcise him instead. Circumcision is symbolic castration. The offering of the most precious part of a male child to God, sacrificing his manhood instead of life. The castrating Jewish mother syndrome. My father offered me up for sacrifice to win my mother's approval. The sacrifice of the firstborn. Jesus was the Son of God and he was sacrificed. It is as though God originally allowed Abraham's son to live, but all his offspring belong to God and will be claimed in the latter days. That is why the Jews are the chosen people, chosen for sacrifice. Later, I decided to do some historical research related to the insights from this experience. A local Jewish authority assured me that nothing like sacrifice of the firstborn had ever taken place in the Jewish tradition. He referred me to the Jewish Encyclopedia and the Fast of the Firstborn. However, I was able to find numerous references to sacrifices of the firstborn that had been practiced for 2,000 years, up until the time of the judges. My experience of deep identification with this ancestral heritage convinced me that it has left an indelible mark on the racial unconscious of the Jews and other Mediterranean people. D. Past Incarnation Experiences this is probably the most fascinating and controversial group of transpersonal phenomena. As I suggested earlier, past incarnation memories resemble in many ways ancestral, racial, and collective experiences. However, they are usually dramatic and are associated with an intense emotional charge of a negative or positive quality. Their essential experiential characteristic is a convinced sense of remembering something that happened once before to the same entity, to the same unit of consciousness. The subjects participating in these dramatic sequences maintain a sense of individuality and personal identity, but experience themselves in another form, at another place and time, and in another context. This sense of reliving something that one has seen before, déjà vu, and experienced before, déjà vu, in a previous incarnation is basic and cannot be analyzed any further. It is comparable to the ability to distinguish in everyday life our memories of events that actually happened from our dreams, fantasies, and daydreams. It would be difficult to convince a person who is relating to us a memory of something that happened last week that the event involved did not really occur and that it is just a figment of his or her imagination. Past incarnation memories have a similar subjective quality of authenticity and reality. Past incarnation experiences usually involve one or several other persons. In rare instances, various animals can appear as protagonists in dramatic scenes of this kind. The individual then feels that he or she became karmically imprinted on a scene in which they were killed by a tiger, trampled to death by a wild elephant, gored by a frenzied bull, or bitten by a venom mouse snake. Sequences of this kind seem to be similar to karmic scenes in their lasting impact on the individual, but they lack the reciprocity of repetition in subsequent incarnations. They thus resemble situations where the psychological effect transcending individual incarnations involves impersonal causes. Typical examples of such situations would be bitterness, hatred, and envy associated with a painful and disabling disease or a crippling injury, and the anxiety and agony experienced in connection with an accidental death under a rock slide, in swamps or quicksand.
or during a volcanic eruption or fire. Karmic experiences fall into two distinct categories characterized by the quality of the emotions involved. Some of them reflect highly positive connections with other persons, deep friendship, passionate love, spiritual partnership, a teacher-disciple relationship, blood bonds, life and death commitment, extraordinary mutual understanding, or nourishing and supportive exchange. More frequently, they involve dramatic negative emotions. The experiences belonging to this category cast subjects into various internecine past life situations characterized by agonizing physical pain, murderous aggression, inhuman terror, prolonged anguish, bitterness and hatred, insane jealousy, insatiable vengefulness, uncontrollable lust, or morbid greed and avarice. Many individuals who have experienced negative karmic experiences were able to analyze the nature of the destructive bond between the protagonists of such sequences. They realized that all these seemingly different emotional qualities such as murderous passion, insatiable desire, consuming jealousy, or mortal anguish, when intensified beyond a certain point, actually begin to resemble each other. There seems to exist a state of high biological and emotional arousal in which all the extreme affective qualities converge and attain metaphysical dimensions. When two or more individuals reach this universal melting pot of passions and instincts, they get imprinted on the situation that caused them, irrespective of the role which they played. In situations of extreme experiential intensity, the sadistic arousal of the torturer and the inhuman pain of the victim increasingly resemble each other, and the rage of the murderer merges at a certain point with the anguish and suffering of the dying victim. It seems that it is this emotional fusion that is instrumental in karmic imprinting, rather than a specific role in the experiential sequence. Whenever two individuals get involved in a situation where their emotions reach the state described above, they will have to repeat in subsequent lives in alternating roles the same pattern until they reach the level of awareness which is necessary for the resolution of a karmic bond. Sophisticated subjects familiar with spiritual literature equated this state of undifferentiated emotional arousal that generates karmic bondage with the Buddhist concept of Ortanha, the thirst of flesh and blood the force that drives the cycle of death and rebirth and is responsible for all human suffering. Others reported their insights into the deep similarity between this state and the strange experiential mixture characterizing the final stages of biological birth, BPM3, where murderous aggression, vital anguish, extreme sexual arousal, demonic tendencies, scatological indulgence and religious fervor merge into a strange, inextricable amalgam. Biological birth thus seems to represent something like a transformation station, where the intangible morphogenetic fields of the karmic record, referred to as the Akashic record in the spiritual literature, enter the biopsychological life of the individual. The opening of the realm of past incarnation experiences is sometimes preceded by or associated with complex insights and instructions communicated by nonverbal means. In this way, the individual is introduced to the understanding that the law of karma is an important part of the cosmic order mandatory for all sentient beings. On the basis of this new comprehension, he or she accepts responsibility for the deeds in previous lifetimes that at the time are still covered by amnesia. In addition to this general information, such insights can include details of the mechanisms involved in the cycles of rebirth and the necessary strategies for attaining liberation from karmic bonds. To reach a complete resolution of a karmic pattern or bond, the individual has to experience fully all the painful emotions and physical sensations involved in a destructive past incarnation scene. In addition, it is necessary to transcend the event emotionally, ethically, philosophically, and spiritually, to rise above it entirely, and to forgive and be forgiven. Such a full liberation from a karmic pattern and the bondage involved is typically associated with a sense of paramount accomplishment and triumph that is beyond any rational comprehension. When it occurs, it is associated with an overwhelming feeling that one has waited for this moment and worked for the achievement of this goal for centuries. At this point, nothing in the world seems more important than to free oneself from karmic bondage. This is typically associated with an ecstatic rapture and feelings of overwhelming bliss. In some instances, the individual can see a rapid replay of his or her karmic history and have clear insights as to how this pattern repeated itself in different variations through ages and has contaminated lifetime after lifetime.
Several subjects reported in this context the experience of something like a cleansing karmic hurricane or cyclone blowing through their past and tearing their karmic bonds in all the situations that involve the pattern that they just resolved. Past incarnation phenomena are extremely common in deep experiential psychotherapy and have great therapeutic potential. They also have far-reaching theoretical significance, since several of their aspects represent a serious challenge to the mechanistic and materialistic worldview. A therapist who does not allow experiences of this kind to develop in his clients or discourages them when they are spontaneously happening is giving up a powerful mechanism of healing and personality transformation. Since the major hindrance in this sense is a philosophical disbelief in reincarnation and karma based on insufficient knowledge of the facts, I would like to explore this issue at some length. It seems clear that the past incarnation phenomena observed in deep experiential psychotherapy, in meditation, and in spontaneous episodes of non-ordinary states of consciousness are identical with those that are responsible for the fact that the belief in reincarnation is so widespread and universal. The concept of karma and reincarnation represents a cornerstone of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, the Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism, and Taoism. Similar ideas can be found in such geographically, historically, and culturally diverse groups as various African tribes, American Indians, pre-Columbian cultures, the Polynesian Kahunas, practitioners of the Brazilian Umbanda, the Gauls, and the Druids. In ancient Greece, several important schools of thought subscribed to it, among these were the Pythagoreans, the Orphics, and the Platonists. This doctrine was also adopted by the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Karaites, and other Jewish and semi-Jewish groups, and it formed an important part of the Kabbalistic theology of medieval Jewry. It was also held by the Neoplatonists and Gnostics and in modern times by the Theosophists, Anthroposophists, and certain Spiritualists. It is not very well known that concepts similar to reincarnation and karma existed also among the early Christians. According to Saint Jerome, 340 to 420, reincarnation was given an esoteric interpretation that was communicated to a selected elite. The most famous Christian thinker speculating about the pre-existence of souls and world cycles was Origen, 186 to 253, one of the greatest church fathers of all times. In his writings, particularly in the book on first principles, De Principes, Origen's Adamantius, 1973, he expressed his opinion that certain scriptural passages could only be explained in the light of reincarnation. His teachings were condemned by the Second Council of Constantinople, convened by the Emperor Justinian in 553, and became a heretical doctrine. The Constantinople Council decreed, if anyone assert the fabulous pre-existence of souls and shall submit to the monstrous doctrine that follows from it, let him be anathema. However, some scholars believe that they can detect traces of the teachings in the writings of St. Augustine, St. Gregory, and even St. Francis of Assisi. In addition to the universality of the concept of reincarnation, it is important to emphasize that past life experiences occur in experiential sessions without any programming and often despite the disbelief of the therapist and client. I have observed experiences of this kind long before I, myself, became open to their existence and started taking them seriously. On many occasions, they emerged in sessions of scientists who had previously considered the belief in reincarnation to be an absurd superstition and a cultural delusion of primitive nations, or even a manifestation of individual psychopathology. In several instances, subjects who had not been familiar with the concept of karma and reincarnation not only experienced dramatic past life memories, but also gained complex and detailed insights into various specific aspects of this doctrine, identical with those found in various spiritual systems and occult literature. I can mention as an example an uneducated patient who participated in our program of psychedelic therapy for cancer patients in Baltimore, Maryland. He was almost illiterate and worked as an unskilled laborer, despite this, he experienced in his psychedelic session complex insights into reincarnation and the cycles of rebirth and emerged from this session a firm believer in the continuity of lives. The experience helped him greatly to face the grim reality of his terminal cancer with its multiple metastases and ultimately to die with equanimity. 
The condensed history of this patient and the account of his psychedelic session can be found in my book The Human Encounter with Death. After this general introduction, I would like to describe certain specific aspects of past life experiences that are extremely interesting and deserve serious attention of researchers of consciousness and of the human psyche. The persons who experience karmic phenomena often gain amazing insights into the time and culture involved and occasionally even into specific historical events. In some instances, it is beyond any doubt that they could not possibly have acquired this information in the conventional way, through the ordinary sensory channels. In this sense, past life memories are true transpersonal experiences that share with the other transpersonal phenomena the capacity to provide instant and direct extrasensory access to information about the world. Another interesting aspect of karmic experiences is that they are dearly connected with various emotional, psychosomatic, and interpersonal problems of the individual. Most frequently, they represent the deepest roots of problems, in addition to specific biographical and perinatal determinants. In some instances, they immediately and directly underlie psychopathological symptoms. In the latter case, deep experiential therapy will activate these symptoms and lead the individual instantly to the karmic theme that explains them and provides the context for their resolution. These experiences thus not only contribute to the understanding of psychopathology, but also represent one of the most effective therapeutic mechanisms. Among the characteristic features of past life phenomena that cannot be explained by mechanistic science is their association with astonishing synchronicities in the Jungian sense. I have observed in many instances that individuals experiencing karmic sequences identified the protagonists in these scenes as specific people in their lives, parents, children, spouses, boyfriends, and girlfriends, superiors, and other important figures. When they completed the reliving of the karmic pattern and reached a sense of resolution and forgiveness, they often felt that the respective partner was in some sense involved in the process and must have felt something similar. When I became sufficiently open-minded to make attempts at verification of the relevance of these statements, I discovered to my great surprise that they were often accurate. I found out that in many instances the persons the subject denoted as protagonists in the karmic sequence experienced at exactly the same time a dramatic shift of attitude in the direction that was predicated by the resolution of the past incarnation pattern. This transformation happened in a way that could not be interpreted by linear causality. The individuals involved were often hundreds or thousands of miles away, they did not know anything about the subject's experience and the changes in them were produced by an entirely independent sequence of events. They had a deep transformative experience of their own, received some information that entirely changed their perception of the subject, or were influenced by some other independent development in their environment. The timing of these synchronistic happenings was often remarkable, in some instances they were minutes apart. This aspect of past life experiences suggesting non-local connections in the universe seems to bear some similarity to the phenomena described by Bell's theorem in modern physics. To clarify my position on past life experiences, I would like to emphasize that I do not consider their characteristics described up to this point to be necessarily a proof that we have lived before. However, I feel very strongly that this phenomenon cannot be adequately explained by mechanistic science and represents a serious conceptual challenge to the existing paradigms in psychiatry and Western science in general. It is certainly conceivable that some of the essential features of the karmic memory's universality, sense of authenticity, experiential quality of a memory, accurate intuitive insights into the time and culture involved, therapeutic potential, and synchronistic events surrounding them could be explained by a modern paradigm that would not require the assumption of a separate entity surviving biological death and carrying responsibility for its past deeds, the semantic model based on. Probability theory developed by the Soviet mathematician B. V. Nalimov can be mentioned here as an example of such an effort. It is interesting to notice that in the mystical tradition literal belief in reincarnation of separate individuals is seen as an inferior and less sophisticated interpretation of karmic experiences. In its complete form, the reincarnation theory suggests that all divisions and boundaries in the universe are illusory and arbitrary. In the last analysis it is only the creative principle, or cosmic consciousness, that actually exists. An individual who penetrates to this ultimate knowledge will see the realm of karmic appearances as just another level of illusion. 
The Hindu concept of the universe as divine play, Lila, of one supreme being, Brahma, can be used here as example. In rare instances, the evidence supporting the reincarnation theory can be much more specific. A small fraction of past life experiences involve unambiguous information about the personality and life of the individual that the subject feels karmically connected with. This can be names of persons and places, dates, descriptions of objects of unusual shapes, and many others. On occasion, the nature of this material and the circumstances can be such that they allow for independent testing. In these cases, historical research brings often extraordinary surprises in terms of verification of these experiences, down to minuscule details. There exists another most interesting independent source of data on reincarnation. It is the study of children who claim that they remember various things from their previous lives. This can include the name of the place where they were born, detailed knowledge of its topography, names, and life histories of their alleged former relatives, acquaintances and friends, and other details. Ian Stevenson, who has studied many such cases in different parts of the world, has described his findings in his famous book 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation and in a sequel to this work. It is interesting to mention in this context the Tibetan tradition of testing the identity of the reincarnated Lama by presenting the child, discovered by a special delegation of priests on the basis of various clues and omens, an extraordinary test. To confirm the authenticity of his incarnation, the boy has to identify from several series of similar objects those that belong to the deceased. I hope that the above analysis of the available data will leave the reader with the impression that the area of past life experiences and the phenomena surrounding them deserve systematic and careful research. While the observations cannot be interpreted as unambiguous evidence for the continuity of separate individual existence through lifetimes and for the law of karma, it is hardly possible for an unbiased and informed scientist to discard this possibility on the basis of metaphysical adherence to a mechanistic worldview. In the following text, I will illustrate some important aspects of past life experiences by an interesting case history. The protagonist in this story started his self-exploration in a primal group that had separated itself from Janov because of his narrow conceptual framework. Later, he participated in one of our Esalen month-long seminars, where we used the technique of holotropic breathing. During the time when Carl was reliving in primal therapy various aspects of his birth trauma, he started experiencing fragments of dramatic scenes that seemed to be happening in another century and in a foreign country. They involved powerful emotions and physical feelings and seemed to have some deep and intimate connection to his life, yet none of them made any sense in terms of his present biography. He had visions of tunnels, under round storage spaces, military barracks, thick walls, and ramparts that all seemed to be parts of a fortress situated on a rock overlooking an ocean shore. This was interspersed with images of soldiers in a variety of situations. He felt puzzled, since the soldiers seemed to be Spanish, but the scenery looked more like Scotland or Ireland. As the process continued, the scenes were becoming more dramatic and involved, many of them representing fierce combat and bloody slaughter. Although surrounded by soldiers, Carl experienced himself as a priest and at one point had a very moving vision that involved a Bible and a cross. At this point, he saw a seal ring on his hand and could clearly recognize the initials that it bore. Being a talented artist, he decided to document this strange process, although he did not understand it at the time. He produced a series of drawings and very powerful and impulsive finger paintings. Some of these depicted different parts of the fortress, other scenes of slaughter, and a few his own experiences, including being gored by a sword, thrown over the ramparts of the fortress, and dying on the shore. Among these pictures was a drawing of the seal ring with the initials. As he was recovering bits and pieces of this story, Carl was finding more and more meaningful connections with his present life. He was discovering that many emotional and psychosomatic feelings, as well as problems in interpersonal relationships that he had at that time in his everyday life, were dearly related to his inner process, involving the mysterious event in the past. A turning point came when Carl suddenly decided on an impulse to spend his holiday in Ireland. After his return, he was showing for the first time the slides that he had shot on the western coast of Ireland. 
He realized that he had taken eleven consecutive pictures of the same scenery that did not seem particularly interesting. He took the map and reconstructed where he stood at the time and in which direction he was shooting. He realized that the place which attracted his attention was the ruin of an old fortress called Dunanwar, or Forte de Oro, Golden Fortress. Suspecting a connection with his experiences from primal therapy, Carl decided to study the history of Dunanwar. He discovered, to his enormous surprise, that at the time of Walter Raleigh, the fortress was taken by the Spaniards and then besieged by the British. Walter Raleigh negotiated with the Spaniards and promised them free egress from the fortress, if they would open the gate and surrender to the British. The Spaniards agreed on these conditions, but the British did not hold their promise. Once inside the fortress, they slaughtered mercilessly all the Spaniards and threw them over the ramparts to die on the ocean beach. In spite of this absolutely astonishing confirmation of the story that he laboriously reconstructed in his inner exploration, Carl was not satisfied. He continued his library research until he discovered a special document about the Battle of Dunanwar. There he found that a priest accompanied the Spanish soldiers and was killed together with them. The initials of the name of the priest were identical with those that Carl has seen in his vision of the seal ring and had depicted in one of his drawings. E. Phylogenetic Experiences This type of transpersonal experience is closely related to animal identification, described earlier. It shares with it the sense of total anatomical, physiological, psychological, and even biochemical identity with various members of other species of living organisms. These experiences also resemble animal identification in that they offer amazing new insights into the life forms involved. The main difference is a convinced sense of regression in historical time. Instead of transcending only spatial barriers and identifying with currently existing animals, the subject identifies with the members of various species in the evolutionary history of life. Some of these experiences involve a feeling of exploring personal biological history and identifying with one's animal ancestors. They thus represent a logical extension of previously described embryonal, ancestral, and racial experiences. Others involve experiential identification with various aspects of the evolution of life on Earth or with the phylogenetic tree of life in its totality. The insights accompanying these experiences often provide intuitive understanding not only of the life forms the subject identifies with, but also of the forces that rule evolution, creative intentions of cosmic intelligence, archetypal dynamics, phylogenetic logic, and instinctual drives. In this context, the individual can identify with the totality of life and ask such questions as, is life a viable cosmic phenomenon? Does it have a built-in self-destructive propensity? Are the constructive aspects of life that foster survival and evolution stronger than the destructive and self-destructive ones? This report, from a high-dose LSD session, 250 micrograms, conducted in the context of the training program for mental health professionals at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in Baltimore, can be used here as a good example of a typical phylogenetic experience. Most of these experiences were related to the age of the large reptiles, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period, and seemed to focus on various forms of survival struggle. One of them is particularly vivid in my memory. I experienced a vicious fight with a monstrous carnivorous reptile of a Tyrannosaurus variety from the position of some kind of a large dinosaur. I would like to emphasize that the experience was unbelievably real. All its elements were absolutely authentic, far beyond anything I could possibly conjure up from my ordinary human experience. I was in a huge, clumsy body, experiencing a mixture of elemental fear and primitive blind rage. I felt the pain and sensed my flesh being torn, the quality of these experiences certainly was not human. But the most astonishing aspect of the situation was a peculiar taste in my mouth that was a combination of the taste of blood and of the stale putrid water of the primeval swamp. I experienced vividly my loss in this fight. My head was driven into the mud by the blows of the aggressor and I died. This was by far the clearest and most vivid episode, although there were sequences involving other specimens. F. Experiences of Planetary Evolution In this type of experience, the subject can witness panoramic images of the evolution of the entire planet, 
including its origin as part of the solar system, the early geophysical processes, the situation in the primeval ocean, and the origin and evolution of life. All this can be experienced in the role of the observer, the subject can also identify experientially with the totality of the planetary evolution or with any of its aspects. This is clearly related to the experience of identification with Gaia mentioned earlier, but with a dynamic evolutionary perspective. Like the other types of transpersonal experiences, sequences of this kind can provide deep understanding of the processes involved that clearly transcend the subject's intellectual knowledge of the specific areas and often also his or her general educational background. g. Cosmogenetic experiences Experiences of this group represent a logical extension of the previous one. Here the sense of evolutionary exploration involves the entire universe. The subject can witness or identify with the birth and development of the cosmos involving dimensions and energies of unimaginable scope. This can be various episodes from the cosmogenetic history, the Big Bang, the creation of matter, space and time, the birth of galaxies and their expansion, explosions of novas and supernovas, and the contraction of large suns ending in black holes. Occasionally, the entire history of the cosmos is played out with extraordinary changes of the subjective sense of time. Sophisticated subjects, some of them mathematicians and physicists, reported in this context remarkable experiential insights into various problems related to astronomy and astrophysics that can be expressed in mathematical equations, but cannot be fully intuited in the ordinary state of consciousness. These insights included Einstein's concept of an infinite but self-enclosed universe, non-Euclidean geometries of Lobachevsky and Riemann, Minkowski's space-time, the event horizon, the collapse of time, space and natural laws in a black hole, and other difficult concepts of modem physics. These insights from non-ordinary states indicating that consciousness and creative intelligence are intimately involved in cosmogenesis throw a new light on the so-called anthropic principle, a concept formulated recently by theoreticians of astrophysics. Davies 1983. It refers to the fact that the conditions during cosmogenesis required too many fortuitous accidents to result in a universe that could support life. This seems to suggest that the intention to create a universe in which life would exist was present in the process of creation from the very beginning. The following account from a psychedelic session of the famous British-American writer and philosopher Alan Watts is a vivid and articulate description of a psychedelic experience that retraced evolution through his personal history and the history of organic life to the origins of the galaxy and of the universe. I trace myself through the labyrinth of my brain, through the innumerable turns by which I have ringed myself off and, by perpetual circling, obliterated the original trail whereby I entered this forest. Back through the tunnels through the devious status and survival strategy of adult life, through the interminable passages which we remember in dreams, all the streets we have traveled, the corridors of schools, the winding pathways between the legs of chairs where one crawled as a child, the tight and bloody exit from the womb, the fountainous search through the channels of the penis, the timeless wanderings through the ducts and spongy caverns. Down and back through ever-narrowing tubes to the point where the passage itself is the traveler, a thin string of molecules going through the trial and error of getting itself into the right order to be a unit of organic life. Relentlessly back through endless and whirling dances in the astronomically proportioned spaces which surround the original nuclei of the world, the centers of centers, as remotely distant on the inside as the nebulae beyond our galaxy on the outside. Down and at last out out of the cosmic maze, to recognize in and as myself, the bewildered traveler, the forgotten yet familiar sensation of the original impulse of all things, supreme identity, inmost light, ultimate center, self more than myself. H. Psychic phenomena involving transcendence of time. Precognition, clairvoyance and clairaudience of past and future events, psychometry, time travels. The existence of psychic phenomena, and other types of transpersonal experiences, Transcending spatial barriers described earlier dearly suggests that events in the universe are connected in a way that disregards linear distances. This group of psi indicates that, in addition to these non-local or trans-local links, all events have also intricate non-temporal or trans-temporal connections that transcend linear time as we know and experience it in everyday life. 
The psi events in this category cannot be explained through conventional transfer of energy and information in the material world. In non-ordinary states of consciousness and occasionally in everyday life, it is possible to experience clear anticipation and precognitive flashes of future events that show far-reaching correspondence with the actual events to come. In some instances, subjects can experience complex and detailed scenes from the future involving all the senses. Particularly frequent are vivid pictorial representations of future sequences and their acoustic concomitants. These range from sounds, words, and sentences from ordinary life to dramatic noises accompanying accidents or injuries, fire engines, car brakes, crashing sounds, ambulance sirens, or blowing horns. Verification of these phenomena has to be done with particular care, unless these instances are reported and recorded at the time when they happen there is a great danger of contamination of data. Loose interpretation of events, memory distortions, and deja vu are the major pitfalls involved. Despite this fact, there is no doubt that genuine precognition and clairvoyance of the future can occur. Clairvoyance and clairaudience related to various events in the past can be observed as an isolated phenomenon or in connection with transpersonal experiences transcending time, ancestral, racial, collective, karmic, or evolutionary. A special example in this category is psychometry, where the experiences are triggered by holding an object and are specifically related to this object's history. This can involve emotions, thoughts, and a variety of sensory qualities, such as visions, sounds, smells, and physical sensations. I have observed repeatedly, in psychedelic sessions and in holotropic therapy, verified instances of precognition, clairvoyance of past and future events, and psychometry. I have also had the privilege to witness repeatedly reliable performance in these areas by such accomplished psychics as Anne Armstrong and Jack Schwartz. Of particular interest in this context are controlled experiments of future remote viewing conducted at the Stanford Research Institute by Russell Tark, Harold Puthoff, and Keith Harry not only with famous psychics, but also with many ordinary people not known for having special psychic ability. In their two recent successful remote viewing experiments, Russell Targ and Keith Harry used a Soviet subject who was able to describe not only a randomly chosen target location in the United States visited by the beacon person, the person who visits the target area at the time the psychic is trying to describe it, but also the one that would be visited in the future. In some instances, the subject can transcend the ordinary temporal limitations at will and choose the points of time that he or she wants to visit. This situation, somewhat reminiscent of H.G. Wells' time machine or similar contraptions of other science fiction writers, can be referred to as time travel. This is usually combined with a similar voluntary choice of the location where the events take place. The sense of free choice distinguishes these experiences from the spontaneous and involuntary reliving of historical events in childhood, birth, ancestral, racial, or collective experiences. Directed time travel can also be conducted under the influence of hypnosis, here the subject can be either guided to a specific time indicated by the hypnotist, or can look for a specific past event. A beautiful artistic representation of spontaneous and elemental time travels is Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse 5. Experiences involving transcendence of linear time represent a serious challenge to the Newtonian Cartesian worldview. The possibility of direct access to the information about various aspects of the past without the mediation of the central nervous system violates the basic metaphysical dogma of mechanistic science about the primacy of matter over consciousness. It suggests the astonishing possibility of memory without a material substrate. The possibility of obtaining information about the future then undermines the deeply ingrained belief of Western civilization in the linearity of time. However, these observations from modern consciousness research are compatible with some interesting alternative models of time and the future, such as the chronotopology of Charles Muses, or the probabilistic concepts of V. V. Nalamuth. The following example of a precognitive experience is an excerpt from the session with 30 mg of psilocybin that the famous American parapsychologist Stanley Krippner experienced in the context of the Harvard University psilocybin research project. It involved anticipation of the assassination of J.F. Kennedy, preceding by more than a year and a half the actual event. From Baltimore, I traveled to the nation's capital. 
I found myself gazing at a statue of Lincoln. The statue was entirely black, and the head was bowed. There was a gun at the base of the statue and someone murmured, he was shot. The president was shot. A wisp of smoke rose into the air. Lincoln's features slowly faded away, and those of Kennedy took their place. The setting was still Washington, D.C. The gun was still at the base of the black statue. A wisp of smoke seeped from the barrel and curled into the air. The voice repeated, he was shot. The president was shot. My eyes opened, they were filled with tears. In 1962, when I had my first psilocybin experience, I gave this visualization of Kennedy little thought, as so many other impressions came my way. However, it was the only one of my visualizations that brought tears in my eyes, so I described it fully in the report I sent to Harvard. Nineteen months later, on November 23, 1963, the visualization came back to me as I mourned Kennedy's assassination. 3. Physical introversion and narrowing of consciousness, organ, tissue, and cellular consciousness. In transpersonal experiences characterized by spatial extension of consciousness, the subject's awareness appears to transcend what is traditionally considered to be the individual, that is, the body ego. In this group, conscious awareness remains within the body, but extends to anatomical areas and to processes that are not available for conscious exploration under ordinary circumstances. Instead of experiencing the psychological inner space, the individual accesses the physical inner space. Phenomena of this kind thus involve spatial narrowing of consciousness and, simultaneously, its functional extension. In the holotropic mode, it is possible to enter various parts of one's body and witness the activities occurring there, or even to identify experientially with specific organs and tissues. One can literally become one's heart and experience the work of the cardiac musculature, the opening and dosing of the valves, the biodynamic flow of blood, and the action of the pacemaker. While identifying with the liver, it is possible to experience the drama of its detoxifying activities, or the production, collection, and excretion of gall. In a similar way, one can become one's reproductive system, various parts of the gastrointestinal tract or, for that matter, any other organ or tissue. In these states, consciousness often seems to regress all the way to the cellular level and even to subcellular structures and processes. On many occasions, subjects under the influence of psychedelic substances or in the sessions of holotropic breathing have reported that they experienced themselves as red or white blood corpuscles, cells in the gastrointestinal epithelium or in the uterine mucous membrane, sperms, and ova, or as neurons in their own brains. Another interesting phenomenon is conscious exploration of the cellular nucleus and of the chromosomes, associated with insights into the physiochemical code of the genes and a sense of reading one's DNA. Experiences of this group bear close resemblance to various scenes from Isaac Asimov's movie The Fantastic Voyage. This phenomenon is of particular interest for researchers trying to combine traditional medical therapy with psychological healing. This approach was pioneered by the oncologist and radiologist Carl Simonton. In our program of LSD therapy for cancer patients, we have repeatedly observed that individuals suffering from various forms of malignancy were able to connect experientially with their tumors on a tissue and cellular level. They have often made spontaneous attempts to use this experience for healing by creating psychologically positive energy fields, confronting negative emotions they felt were associated with the disease process mobilizing the defenses of the organism, or attacking mentally the tumors. Several instances of surprising temporary remissions which occurred in this context suggest that this possibility should be systematically explored. Many aspects of the organ, tissue, and cell consciousness are illustrated in the following account of a session with 125 mg of MDA, methylene dioxyamphetamine a psychedelic substance which belongs to a group that in terms of its chemical structure bridges between mescaline and amphetamine. Now my attention shifted from my mouth to the esophagus. I started a slow journey down my gastrointestinal tract, connecting with all the digestive processes on a cellular and even biochemical level. I literally became the cells of the epithelium lining my stomach and participated in the resorption of food and in the incredible alchemy of digestion. 
The distinct smell and taste of the gastric content entirely filled my consciousness. At first, I brought in my human value system and shuddered in disgust. Gradually, I was able to leave the human behind and respond on the level of biology. From there, the process continued to the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. As the focus of my awareness was gradually shifting downwards, I explored all the nuances of the bouquet of the intestinal juices, enzymes, and gall and their respective combinations. While I was becoming all the villi, membranes, and cells, I was astonished by the miracle of this incredible laboratory of life. Although I had studied all this from many different aspects during my medical studies, I have never fully appreciated what was involved. In the final stages of this fantastic journey, I encountered the complexity of feelings and attitudes our culture has developed toward feces. In addition to disgust and revulsion, I had to confront an incredible amount of disowned, repressed and unacceptable emotions of greed, avarice, envy, and malice. At one point they took on the personified form of grotesque, gnome-like, mythological creatures. I started to understand the process I was going through. It seemed essential that I accept the entire gastrointestinal tract with all its products and contents as part of myself and befriend it. To overcome the repression and denial appeared to be critical for genuine and unconditional self-acceptance and personal integration. And I could not help feeling that this peculiar sequence of experiences was in its essence healing. Experiential extension beyond consensus reality and space-time. In a large group of transpersonal experiences, the extension of consciousness seems to go beyond the phenomenal world and the time-space continuum as we perceive it in our everyday life. Here belong certain astral psychic phenomena, such as apparitions of and communication with deceased people or experiences of the chakras, auras, meridians, and other subtle energetic manifestations. Other important experiences of this category involve spirit guides in animal or human form and various superhuman entities. On occasion, subjects have reported fantastic adventures that seem to be happening in universes other than our own. In non-ordinary states of consciousness, the world of primordial images of the collective unconscious as described by Carl Gustav Jung can come alive and take the form of various mythological and legendary beings and sequences, fairy tale scenes, blissful and wrathful deities from different cultures, or transcultural archetypes and universal symbols. In its furthest reaches, individual consciousness can identify with the creator and tap sources of cosmic creativity, or merge with the universal mind with the supercosmic and metacosmic void, or with the absolute. a. Spiritistic and mediumistic experiences Experiences that belong to this category have been the primary focus of interest of the participants of spiritistic seances, researchers in the area of survival after death, and writers of occult literature. They involve encounters and telepathic communication with deceased relatives and friends, contacts with discarnate entities in general, and the experiences of the astral realm. In the simplest form of this experience, subjects see apparitions of deceased people and receive from them various messages. The content of these messages can be addressed to the experiencer, or the recipient is used as a channel to deliver them to other people. Experiences of this kind have been reported by psychedelic subjects, clients in experiential psychotherapies, and individuals who had near-death experiences, NDEs. Sometimes the subject does not perceive an individual discarnate entity, but an entire astral realm with various ghostly apparitions. Raymond Moody's description of the realm of confused spirits can be mentioned here as an example, Moody 1977. In a more complex form of this phenomenon, the subject actually enters a trance state and appears to be taken over by an alien entity or energy form. Events of this kind bear a striking resemblance to mediumistic trances occurring in spiritistic seances. In such a mediumistic trance, the subject's facial expression can be grotesquely transformed, his or her postures and gestures appear bizarre and alien, and the voice is dramatically changed. I have seen individuals in this state talk in languages they did not know, speak in tongues, write automatic texts, paint elaborate pictures, produce obscure hieroglyphic designs, and draw intricate unintelligible squiggles. These manifestations are, again, reminiscent of those described in spiritistic and occult literature. 
Most fascinating examples of this phenomenon can be observed in the Spiritist Church in the Philippines and in Brazil, inspired by the teachings of Allan Kardec. The Brazilian psychologist and psychic Luiz Antonio Gasparetto, closely related to the Spiritist Church, is capable of painting in a light trance in the style of a wide variety of painters of different countries of the world. During the time when he participated as an invited guest in our month-long seminars at the Salem Institute, we had the opportunity to witness the remarkable speed of his work when he was subjectively experiencing channeling of dead masters, up to 25 canvases in an hour. He was able to work in complete darkness or with red light that makes it virtually impossible to discriminate colors, could work on two paintings at a time, and occasionally painted with his feet while they were under the table where he could not see them. A selection of his mediumistic paintings has been reproduced in a special monograph. The phenomenon of psychic surgery, practiced in Brazil and in the Philippines, is also closely related to the teachings of Allan Kardec and to the Spiritist Church. If the experiences of communication with discarnate entities and spirits of dead friends and relatives involved only visions of these persons and a subjective sense of interaction, the situation would be relatively simple. In that case, these phenomena could be easily discounted as figments of imagination combining elements of memory, human fantasy, and wishful thinking. However, the situation is much more complex than that. Before we discard these phenomena as being absurd and not worth the interest of reputable researchers, let me mention some observations that deserve serious attention. As the following two examples indicate, experiences of this kind sometimes have certain extraordinary aspects that are not easy to explain. I have personally observed several instances where sequences involving discarnate relatives and friends provided some unusual and verifiable information that the recipients could not have possibly obtained through the ordinary means and channels. Similarly, individuals who receive messages from deceased strangers find sometimes to their great surprise that they have been given an existing address and correct name of the relatives of a person who actually recently died. Personal survival of physical death is not necessarily the only explanatory framework for these findings, and it is certainly possible to conceive of other interpretations than actual communication with objectively existing astral realms of discarnate beings. However, one thing is certain, none of the alternative explanations will be compatible with the traditional Newtonian Cartesian thinking. In any case, we are dealing here with fascinating phenomena of their own right that should be systematically studied. To discard the extraordinary features of these experiences and the conceptual challenges associated with them just because they do not fit the current paradigms in science certainly is not the best example of a scientific approach. We must accept the universe as it is, rather than imposing on it what we believe it is or think it should be. Our theories must deal with the facts in their totality, rather than with a convenient selection of them that fits our worldview and belief system. Until modern Western science is able to offer plausible explanation of all the observations surrounding such phenomena as spiritistic experiences and past incarnation memories, the concepts found in mystical and occult literature have to be seen as superior to the present approach of most Western scientists, who either do not know the facts or ignore them. The first illustrative example is from psycholytic treatment of a young depressed patient, whose history was briefly described in my book Realms of the Human Unconscious under the name Richard. In one of his LSD sessions, Richard had a very unusual experience involving a strange and uncanny astral realm. It had an eerie luminescence and was filled with discarnate beings that were trying to communicate with him in a very urgent and demanding manner. He could not see or hear them, however, he sensed their almost tangible presence and was receiving telepathic messages from them. I wrote down one of these messages that was very specific and could be subjected to subsequent verification. It was a request for Richard to connect with a couple in the Moravian city of Kromarize and let them know that their son Ladislav was doing all right and was well taken care of. The message included the couple's name, street address, and telephone number, all of these data were unknown to me and the patient. This experience was extremely puzzling. It seemed to be an alien enclave in Richard's experience, totally unrelated to his problems and the rest of his treatment. After some hesitation and with mixed feelings, I finally decided to do what certainly would have made me the target of my colleagues' jokes, had they found out. I went to the telephone, dialed the number in Chromarize, 
and asked if I could speak with Ladislav. To my astonishment, the woman on the other side of the line started to cry. When she calmed down, she told me with a broken voice, Our son is not with us anymore, he passed away, we lost him three weeks ago. The second illustrative example involves a close friend and former colleague of mine, Walter N. Pank, who was a member of our psychedelic research team at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in Baltimore. He had deep interest in parapsychology, particularly in the problem of consciousness after death, and worked with many famous mediums and psychics, including his friend Eileen Garrett, president of the American Parapsychological Association. In addition, he was also the initiator of the LSD program for patients dying of cancer. In summer 1971, Walter went with his wife Eva and his children for a vacation in a cabin in Maine, situated right on the ocean. One day, he went scuba diving all by himself and did not return from the ocean. An extensive and well-organized search failed to find his body or any part of his diving gear. Under these circumstances, Eva found it very difficult to accept and integrate his death. Her last memory of Walter when he was leaving the cabin involved him full of energy and in perfect health. It was hard for her to believe that he was not part of her life anymore and to start a new chapter of her existence without a sense of closure of the preceding one. Being a psychologist herself, she qualified for an LSD training session for mental health professionals offered through a special program in our institute. She decided to have a psychedelic experience with the hope of getting some more insights and asked me to be her sitter. In the second half of the session, she had a very powerful vision of Walter and carried on a long and meaningful dialogue with him. He gave her specific instructions concerning each of their three children and released her to start a new life of her own, unencumbered and unrestricted by a sense of commitment to his memory. It was a very profound and liberating experience. Just as Eva was questioning whether the entire episode was just a wishful fabrication of her own mind, Walter appeared once more for a brief period of time with the following request, I forgot one thing. Would you please do me a favor and return a book that I borrowed from a friend of mine? It is in my study in the attic. And he proceeded to give her the name of the friend, the name of the book, the shelf, and the sequential order of the book on this shelf. Following the instructions, Eva was actually able to find and return the book, about the existence of which she had had no previous knowledge. It would certainly have been completely consistent with Walter's lifelong search for a scientific proof of paranormal phenomena to add a concrete and testable piece of information to his interaction with Eva to dispel her doubts. Earlier during his life, he had made an agreement with Eileen Garrett that she would try to give him after her death an unquestionable proof of the existence of the beyond. B. Energetic Phenomena of the Subtle Body In non-ordinary states of consciousness, it is possible to see and experience various energy fields and energy flows that have been described by the mystical traditions of ancient and non-Western cultures. These descriptions do not make any sense in the context of the Western medical model, since they do not correspond to any known anatomical structures or physiological processes. However, the esoteric traditions never claimed that these were phenomena in the gross material realm, they have always described them as related to the subtle body. It came as a great surprise for me when Western subjects, even those totally unfamiliar with these esoteric systems, experienced and reported virtually identical experiences in unusual states of consciousness. A very common experience in the holotropic mode is to see energy fields of various colors around other people that correspond to the traditional descriptions of auras. Occasionally, these are associated with spontaneous specific insights into the health condition of the people involved. I have personally observed phenomena of this kind, not only in subjects in unusual states of consciousness, but also in accomplished psychics who can use their capacity to see auras in a reliable way in their everyday life. The extraordinary ability of one of these psychics, Jack Schwartz, to read the medical history of his clients and diagnose current diseases has been repeatedly tested and documented by medical researchers with impressive credentials. Another interesting group of phenomena is related to the concept of the serpent power, or kundalini, which plays an important role in the Indian spiritual tradition. According to the Hindu and Buddhist tantric schools, kundalini is seen as the creative energy of the universe that is feminine in nature. 
In her external aspect, she is manifested in the phenomenal world. In her internal aspect, she lies dormant at the base of the human spine. In this form, she is traditionally symbolically represented as a coiled serpent. Activated by spiritual practice, by contact with a guru, or spontaneously, it rises in the form of active energy, or shakti, up the conduits in the subtle body called nadis, opening and lighting up the psychic centers, or chakras. Although the concept of kundalini found its most elaborate expression in India, important parallels exist in many cultures and religious groups in the Taoist Yoga, Korean Zen, Tibetan Vajrayana, Sufism, the Freemasonic tradition, the Kone Bushmen of the African Kalahari Desert, North American Indian tribes, especially the Hopi, and many others. It is of special interest that similar phenomena have been reported repeatedly also in the Christian mystical tradition, particularly in the Hezi Chasm. They. Hezi Chasm is an Eastern Christian monastic practice and way of life, emphasizing prayer that involves the entire human being, the soul, mind, and body. The purpose of this so-called Jesus prayer is to achieve divine quietness, or Hezi Chia. The Tantric schools have developed intricate maps of the chakras, have described in detail the physical, emotional, and spiritual manifestations of Kundalini awakening, and have preserved elaborate mythologies related to this process. Although not without dangers and pitfalls, the process of Kundalini rising is seen, in general, as one conducive, at least potentially, to psychosomatic healing, to positive restructuring of the personality, and to consciousness evolution. However, because of its uncanny power, the scriptures treat this process very seriously and recommend the guidance of an experienced teacher for persons involved in it. The ascent of Kundalini Shakti, as described in the Indian literature, can be accompanied by dramatic physical and psychological manifestations called Kriyas. The most striking among these are powerful sensations of heat and energy streaming up the spine associated with intense emotions of various kinds, tremors, spasms, violent shaking, and complex twisting movements. Quite common is also involuntary laughing or crying, chanting of mantras or songs, talking in tongues, emitting of vocal noises and animal sounds, and assuming spontaneous yogic gestures, madras, and postures, asanas. Although the descriptions of Kundalini have been known in the West for a long time, they have been considered until recently to be an exclusively oriental phenomenon. Even Carl Gustav Jung, who showed keen interest in the Kundalini phenomenon, thought that it rarely, if ever, occurred in the West. He and his colleagues expressed the opinion that it might take a thousand years before Kundalini is set in motion in our culture through the influence of depth psychology. However, future development showed this estimate to be wrong. Whether this can be attributed to accelerated evolution, popularity, and rapid spread of various forms of spiritual practice, pressure of the dangerous global crisis, or the facilitating effect of psychedelic drugs, it is quite clear that unmistakable signs of Kundalini awakening can be observed these days in thousands of Westerners. Gopi Krishna, a world-known pandit from Kashmir, who had himself undergone a profound crisis of a stormy spiritual opening, tried to alert Western audiences to the paramount significance of the phenomenon of Kundalini in a series of articulate popular books, Krishna 1970 and others. The merit of bringing this fact to the attention of the professional circles belongs to the Californian psychiatrist and ophthalmologist Lee Sanella. I have myself observed repeatedly in psychedelic sessions and various non-drug states manifestations that matched closely the descriptions of the arousal of Kundalini, opening of the chakras and flow of the Kundalini energy through the main conduits, Ida and Pingala, and through the intricate network of the nadis, fine and ramified channels for pranic energy, as they have been described and depicted in tantric texts. However, it is important to emphasize that experiences of this kind, Kundalini-like phenomena that would in traditional Indian literature be described as pranic, have to be distinguished from true. Chakras, a Sanskrit term for wheels, are hypothetical centers of radiation of primal energy, prana, roughly corresponding to certain levels of the spinal cord and associated with specific organs of the body. Most systems distinguish seven chakras, 1, root chakra, maladhara, 2, genital chakra, 3, 
Navel Chakra, Manipura, 4, Heart Chakra, Anahata, 5, Throat Chakra, Visuddha, 6, Brow Chakra, Ajna, and 7, Crown Chakra, Sahasrara. The flow of prana is mediated by one central conduit, and two lateral conduits, Ida and Pingala. Awakening of Kundalini The latter is an involved process of profound significance and transformative power, the completion of which often requires years. In comparison with isolated pranic experiences, such an awakening of Kundalini occurs only very rarely as a result of psychedelic experiences or experiential psychotherapy and seems to be an independent phenomenon. The patterns of energy flow in the subtle body described in the literature on Kundalini do not seem to be universal and absolute. In several instances, subjects who tuned into the Chinese archetypal world experienced the energy flow in a way that exactly followed the maps of meridians found in Chinese medicine and became aware of the special significance of the acupuncture points. This was followed by philosophical insights into the Chinese system of five elements, wood, fire, earth, water, and metal, which is distinctly different from the one found in the European tradition. I have also observed subjects who gained deep experiential understanding of the special role of the abdominal center, hara, and the dynamics of the key energy underlying the Japanese martial arts. Various energetic phenomena of the subtle body are extremely frequent in the sessions of holotropic breathing. The energy fields and the streaming of energy can be experienced in a tangible way and can even be visually perceived with the eyes closed. The following holotropic experience of a participant in one of our five-day workshops bore close resemblance to the descriptions from tantric literature. As I continued to breathe, I started feeling an incredible upsurge of energy in my pelvis. In my sacral area was a powerful source of light and heat that was radiating in all directions. And then this energy started to stream upward along my spinal cord, following a clearly defined line. On the way, it was lighting up additional sources of energy in the places where the esoteric maps place the different chakras. As this was happening, I was experiencing very blissful orgiastic feelings. One of the most powerful experiences of this session was when this energy reached the area of my heart. I felt such incredible love toward the world and toward other people that I wanted to get up and give a big hug to everybody in the group. It was strange how close I felt toward people whom I had met last night for the first time and whom I did not really know. But I stayed with the experience and the energy continued to flow upward. When it reached the top of my head, it exploded into a fantastically beautiful aureole that had a rosy orange hue, like the pictures of the thousand petal lotus. I felt the need to flex my legs and join the solace of my feet to create a closed circuit of energy. My energetic field was now extended far beyond the boundaries of my physical body, I suddenly understood why the esoteric maps show the subtle energy body as much larger than the material body, one can actually experience it that way in these states. The energy was flowing upward, leaving through the top of my head and then returning to the lower parts of my body to participate again in the upward flow. I stayed in this state for a long time, drawing a lot of strength and emotional nourishment from this energy. C. Experience of Animal Spirits In this type of experience, subjects have the feeling of profound connection with various animals, not their concrete physical forms, but their archetypal essence. This can occasionally be triggered by an actual encounter with a representative of a particular species who is perceived in a deified form by the individual in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Experiences of this kind have been repeatedly reported by people who have taken psychedelics in the wilderness or in the presence of various domesticated animals. More frequently, experiences of this kind occur as independent events in the inner world. In many instances, animal spirits encountered in unusual states of consciousness are perceived not only as divine in nature, but as teachers and friends offering help and spiritual guidance. This can be associated with deep insights into the sacred function of various animals in certain cultures, such as the cow in India, the cat, crocodile, and falcon in Egypt, or the vulture among the Parsis. Experiences of this kind can also impart unique insights into the psychology of totemistic cultures and the function of the totem animals. However, particularly frequent are references to shamanism and understanding of the role of various animals as spirit helpers of the shaman. 
The inner process of a Western subject can occasionally take on the form known from shamanic cultures. This involves powerful death-rebirth sequences with descent into the underworld and ascent to the supernal realms that the anthropologists have described as shamanic illness. Another important characteristic of this process is a strong sense of special connection with nature and an abundance of experiences of animal identification and of encounters with spirit guides in animal form. Shamanism is the oldest religion of humanity, reaching back tens of thousands of years. It is also a phenomenon that is practically universal. Its different varieties can be found in Siberia and other parts of Asia, in North and South America, Australia, Oceania, Africa, and Europe. Shamanic and totemistic experiences thus connect the individual with deep and primordial aspects of the psyche. Before concluding this section, I would like to compare the experiences of animal spirits with other types of transpersonal phenomena involving animals. They all have specific characteristics that make it possible for experienced subjects to differentiate them from each other. In general, it is important to distinguish experiential identification with various animals who are part of the phenomenal world from symbolic representations of the individual unconscious and from archetypal images of the psyche. Subjects who work on various biographical issues in experiential psychotherapy often report visions of various animals or even identification with them. Analysis of these phenomena makes it clear that they are complex formations with a dynamic structure that is similar to Freudian dream images. On this level, animal autosymbolic visions or transformations represent a more or less cryptic message about the subject's personality or life situation and can be easily recognized as such. An autosymbolic identification with a predator, such as a tiger, lion, or black panther, can be deciphered as an expression of the person's intense aggressive feelings. A strong sexual drive can be symbolized by a stallion or a bull, if it has the objectionable form of sheer lust and base instincts, it might be symbolized by a wild boar or so masculine vanity and sexually tainted exhibitionism can be ridiculed by an auto-symbolic identification with a noisy cock on the dunghill. Similarly, a hog can represent self-neglect, sloppiness, and moral flaws, a monkey, polymorphous perversion and indulgence in genital and pregenital pleasures, a mule, hard-headedness and stubbornness, and an ass, stupidity. In comparison with auto-symbolic transformation, true animal identification is a clearly transpersonal phenomenon that cannot be derived from other unconscious contents or interpreted symbolically. The same subjects who earlier readily cooperated in deciphering symbolic animal experiences will refuse to approach genuine identifications in that way. I have heard in this context repeatedly statements like, no, you do not understand. There is nothing to analyze here, I really was an elephant. I knew what an elephant feels like when he is angry or sexually aroused, and what it is like when water enters his trunk. An elephant does not stand for anything, an elephant is an elephant. Phylogenetic experiences have all the characteristics of true animal identification but are associated, in addition, with the sense of historical regression in the evolutionary pedigree. An interesting phenomenon that seems to represent a transition between auto-symbolic transformation and true animal identification is the experience of being a werewolf or a vampire. It is clearly related to Transylvanian folklore, the stories about lycanthropy, and its Malaysian parallel of Tigeranthropy. Instead of identifying with one particular member of a species, it is also possible to experience something like the animal soul of a species which seems to be a composite experience of all its members in a historical perspective, all the learning of the species, its instinctive behaviors, intraspecies communication patterns, habits, etc. Experiences of this kind seem to be closely related to the concept of morphic resonance described by Rupert Sheldrake and Gregory Battison's understanding of mind in nature. This suggests that this phenomenon can be discussed in the context of natural sciences. The animal spirits and spirit guides as they are experienced in various non-ordinary states, while dearly related to and superordinated to specific species, belong to the world of mythical and archetypal forms. However, their immediate connection with nature distinguishes them from various theriomorphic deities who have an animal form but are not intimately anchored in nature, or those who combine animal and human elements. The elephant god, Ganesha 
of the Hindu pantheon has much less in common with the actual Indian elephant than, for example, the deer spirit of the Mexican Huacal Indians has with the forest deer. The symbolic meanings related to his function as a deity by far supersede his connections to the elephant species. This is even more evident when the deity involved is an animal-human composite image, such as the Egyptian ibis-headed Thoth and jackal-headed Anubis, or the Indian Narasimha, who combines human and leonine characteristics. These deities do not even share the full physical form of the animal they are connected with. A separate interesting group of animals appears in the role of vehicles for divine beings. Here belong, for example, the mouse that carries the Hindu god Ganesha, Shiva's bull Nandi, the lion or tiger who serves the goddess Durga, the peacock who supports Brahma's consort Sarasvati, and the Tibetan Lamaistic deities, the stallions of the sun chariot of the Greek god Helios, or the rams of the Nordic goddess Fricka. An excellent example of the experience of animal spirits can be found in the account of a visionary state of the shaman of the Javaro, a head-hunting tribe in Ecuador, it was induced by the ingestion of ayahuasca. He had drunk and now he softly sang. Gradually, faint lines and forms began to appear in the darkness, and the shrill music of the Tsensak, the spirit helpers, arose around him. The power of the drink fed them. He called and they came. First, Pengi, the anaconda, coiled about his head, transmuted into a crown of gold. Then Wampang, the giant butterfly, hovered above his shoulder and sang to him with his wings. Snakes, spiders, birds and bats danced in the air above him. On his arms appeared a thousand eyes as his demon helpers emerged to search the night for enemies. The sound of rushing water filled his ears, and listening to its roar, he knew he possessed the power of Sanji, the first shaman. Now he could see d. Encounters with spirit guides and superhuman beings. Experiences of encounters with guides, teachers, and protectors from the spiritual world belong to the most valuable and rewarding phenomena of the transpersonal domain. The subjects perceive these beings as superhuman entities existing on higher planes of consciousness and higher energy levels. Sometimes they appear quite spontaneously at a certain stage of the spiritual development of the individual, other times they suddenly emerge during an inner crisis, responding to an urgent call for help. In many instances, they continue appearing to the subject either on their own terms or at the request of their protege. Sometimes the spirit guides have a human form with a distinctly numinous quality. Other times they appear as a source of radiant light or a powerful energy field. Many subjects explain that they do not actually have any sensory perceptions of their guides, they simply sense their presence. Only exceptionally do the guides communicate with the subject verbally. In most instances, the messages, explanations and instructions are conveyed by telepathic transfer of thoughts or through other extrasensory means. The assistance that the spirit guides offer has many different forms and degrees. Sometimes they intervene in difficult and dangerous experiences on the subject's behalf. Other times they accompany him or her through various critical situations on the inner plane, as Virgil guided Dante in the Divine Comedy. They give intellectual, moral and spiritual support, help to combat evil and destructive forces, or create protective shields of positive energy. They can also occasionally give specific directives and suggestions concerning the subject's problems or the general direction of his or her life. Some spiritual guides remain anonymous and unrecognized, others introduce themselves by name, or the subject is able to identify them by some clues. On occasion, persons in non-ordinary states of consciousness report direct experiences of great religious personages of the stature of Jesus Christ, Buddha, Mohammed, Zoroaster, Sri Ramana Maharshi, or Moses. These are usually one-time appearances, it is uncommon for personalities of this rank to be claimed as personal guides, except in a metaphorical sense. The most interesting aspect of the experiences involving guides from other planes is that they occasionally mediate access to information that the subject did not possess in the conventional sense before the event. A good example is the famous parapsychologist Thelma Moss, who connected in one of her psychedelic sessions with an entity who introduced himself as Benjamin Franklin, she prefers to think about him as the old wise man archetype. For about one year following this session, 
she was able to evoke his presence in a meditative state, conduct conversations with him, and ask him for information and guidance. At one time, when she was in an impasse in her research of bioenergies, Benjamin Franklin directed her to get a specific book by the researcher Becker, where she found the critical information she needed. It seems appropriate to mention in this context a phenomenon that has been recently receiving increasing popularity. It is channeling, which is a contemporary term for the process where a person transmits through automatic writing, speaking in trance, or mental dictation messages from a source external to his or her consciousness. The source often identifies itself as a being from a non-physical reality, the hierarchical rank of this entity can range from a deity or angel to a superhuman advanced being or a discarnate individual. Historical examples of channeled spiritual teachings include the Quran, Muhammad, and the Book of Mormon, Smith. An entity who called himself the Tibetan was acknowledged by Alice Bailey as the real author of a large series of her spiritual writings. Roberto Asagio accredited the same entity as the source of his psychological system of psychosynthesis. Among the most popular modem texts are Seth Speaks, Roberts, Messages from Michael, Yarbrough, Course in Miracles, Schuchman, New Age Transformation, Revelations, Spangler, Starseed Transmissions, Raphael, Urantia Book, Anonymous, Emmanuel's Book, Rodegast, and Rantha, Knight. Channeling is a phenomenon and its specific manifestations in religion, philosophy, art, and science will be explored in the forthcoming comprehensive book by Arthur Hastings. E. Visits to other universes and meetings with their inhabitants. In this type of experience, subjects get involved in wild adventures in strange, alien worlds that have reality of their own, although not within the range of our cosmos. These universes seem to exist on other levels of reality or in other dimensions, parallel with and coexistent with ours. The entities inhabiting them possess bizarre physical forms, have physiological and metabolic processes completely different from our own, and operate on the basis of some incomprehensible laws. Many of them are obviously intelligent creatures, but their emotional and ideational characteristics do not resemble anything known to humans. These alien universes can be much smaller or infinitely bigger than ours, and their inhabitants can be friendly, neutral, or hostile to visitors from other dimensions. Experiences of this kind are usually perceived as dangerous, sometimes this is due to the obvious hostility of the creatures involved, other times to uncertainty in facing the unknown. In some instances, the danger seems to stem from the fact that the visitor appears to be so insignificant in the alien world that he or she could be destroyed by negligence or by an unfortunate accident. People describing these extraordinary cosmic adventures often liken them to the most ingenious science fiction stories ever written. I should mention, in this context, experiences with alien aircrafts, spaceships, and flying saucers. According to the descriptions by subjects who have seen them, have experienced meetings with their crews, or have reported that they had been taken for a ride or had visited their interiors, these experiences have a strange quality that puts them in the twilight zone between physical reality and the archetypal world. In some instances, the ex brains were more inclined to see them as actual extraterrestrial spacecraft from another part of our universe, in others, as visitors from a different dimension or as intrapsychic phenomena. I will return to this subject later in connection with transpersonal experiences of psychoid nature. These reports often involve descriptions of physical examinations and operations using various mysterious gadgets, mental communications with the aliens and their intelligent machines, lessons in higher dimensional thinking, and the like. Systematic analysis of the content of abduction experiences conducted by Alvin Lawson has shown a surprising abundance of perinatal elements and themes. Although this is certainly not a proof that these phenomena are nothing but fantasies derived from the memory of the birth trauma, this fact deserves further attention. Particularly good examples of extraterrestrial contacts and visits to other universes can be found in the writings of the famous researcher and unrelenting psychedelic self-explorer John Lilly, in whose non-ordinary states of consciousness they seem to be unusually rich and frequent. The following example is the experience of a 35-year-old writer who took in an exploratory group setting two empathogenic amphetamine derivatives, first 150 mg of MDMA, atom or ecstasy, 
and 4 hours later 20 mg of 2 CB. About an hour and a half into the trip I was seeing my visions with my eyes open or closed, and I was traveling to other planets and dimensions. In each realm a religious ceremony was in progress. On one plane, there were huge, mantis-like beings that were wise, sepulchrally dignified, welcoming me with their ritual. On another plane, green, gold, blue, and purple beings that looked like small, crystalline insects shaped and reshaped in kaleidoscopic formations, sending me urgent messages of mute support. Finally, a dimension appeared where all was crystal life forms, all were incredibly beautiful energy beings, on both micro and megascopic scales. F. Experiences of mythological and fairy tale sequences. In this type of transpersonal experience, the world of myths, legends, and fairy tales literally comes to life. The subject can witness numerous scenes from the mythology and folklore of any culture in the world and visit any number of mythical landscapes. He or she can also experientially identify with legendary and mythical heroes and heroines, or fantastic mythological creatures. It is possible to experience the labors of Hercules or the adventures of Theseus and Jason. One can become the legendary Polynesian hero Maui, or suffer through the ordeals of the twins in the Mayan Popolva. Among the archetypal creatures that subjects have identified within psychedelic sessions and during holotropic breathing were Euroboros, Typhon, Centaurus, Cerberus, Sphinx, various European, Oriental, and Pre-Columbian dragons, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Legendary Knights, Mermaids, Fairies, Elves, gnomes, Scandinavian trolls, and others. Such sequences can emerge as independent transpersonal themes or in meaningful connection with personal problems of the subject. Among the motifs that often associate with biographical issues are that of the evil stepmother and battered stepdaughter, Cinderella, the good brother and the bad brother, Cain and Abel, love for one's mother and aggression toward one's father, Oedipus, love for one's father and hatred toward one's mother, Electra, loving siblings endangered by evil adults, Hansel and Gretel, conflict between love and power, Alberich, and the great love endangered by circumstances, Tristan and Isolde. All these can appear in a specific cultural form or in a more abstract archetypal form. I have already mentioned earlier some specific associations between certain mythological themes and the basic perinatal matrices. For BPM-1, these are images of heavens or paradises of different cultures, for BPM-2, images of hells, BPM-3 is similarly connected with experiences involving purgatories. In addition, sequences of BPM-1i often involve mythological scenes of eternal damnation and the figures of tragic heroes that embody suffering without redemption, Prometheus, Tantalus, Sisyphus, Ixion, the wandering Jew Ahasuerus, and others. Mythological motifs characteristic of BPM-3 and BPM-4 portray labors, ordeals, and struggles of heroes that have a positive resolution, killing of monsters, victory over evil, overcoming of death, personal liberation, or redemption, and sacred marriage. In principle, every individual seems to have experiential access to mythological themes of all times and all cultures. On many occasions, Unsophisticated subjects have described in detail complex mythological images and even entire scenes from Central or South America, Polynesia, Mesopotamia, India, Egypt, Japan, and other areas that they definitely did not know intellectually. These observations clearly support Carl Gustav Jung's concept of the collective unconscious based on emergence of often obscure and unknown mythological motifs in dreams, even those of children and uneducated persons and in the manifest symptoms of neurotic and psychotic patients. To illustrate this category of transpersonal experience, I will use the description of a session of holotropic breathing conducted in the context of one of our five-day experiential seminars. The participant was a woman of Japanese origin. At the beginning of the session I experienced deep grief which was so overwhelming that I could not cry. I thought about the possible cause of my grief. Then I remembered that there existed a formless darkness which had taken my baby out of my hands. I had felt powerless against the darkness. When I remembered the reason for my grief, intense anger arose. I felt powerful and strong, 
and the anger showed itself as fiery extensions to my body. I fought against the darkness and took back my child, but the child was dead. It made me sad to see the body of my own child being burnt by my fiery hands. The burnt body turned to ashes and spread on the soil. I became a very quiet goddess-like figure walking around the place where the ashes had fallen to the ground. My tears nurtured seedlings which sprouted where the ashes lay. One plant grew and a flower bloomed. In the middle of the blossom a glowing sphere appeared. The sphere turned into a precious baby. At that time I felt that the circle had closed. I realized it would repeat itself again and again. I felt I had completed the work. Then I felt my body and had three more experiences, although I am not certain in which order they occurred. 1. My left side turned into mountains and I experienced the geological cycle of mountain building and erosion. 2. My right side turned into a forest. 3. Between my legs I felt the ocean with the ebb and flow of the tides. I felt that the cycle I had experienced was endless, if I were caught in it, it would continue forever. But I found that there was a direct path from each of the stages to the center which would allow me to break the cycle. G. Experiences of specific blissful and wrathful deities. This category is closely related to the previous one and could be considered its special subgroup. Mythological images belonging here are endowed with special power and numinosity that gives them divine status. They are also very specific and can be clearly identified as deities from the pantheons of different cultures. In some instances, the subjects are familiar with the deities they are experiencing and can give their names and the cultural areas they belong to. However, the experience often conveys much new information that is far beyond the previous knowledge of the person involved. Other times, the deities are entirely unknown to the experient, but he or she is able to draw their pictures, describe in great detail their functions, and identify the general cultural area from which they come. This information then makes it possible to consult the appropriate sources and assess its accuracy. There also exist situations where the identity of the experienced deities remains obscure or uncertain in spite of combined research efforts of the client and the therapist. Most deities encountered in non-ordinary states of consciousness fall into two clearly dichotomized groups, the blissful and beneficent divinities associated with the forces of light and good and the wrathful and malefic ones representing the forces of darkness and evil. However, this distinction is in no way absolute, there exist deities that seem to fall in between and there are others that are encompassing and have beatific and horrific aspects. A typical example of the last group are the Dhyani Buddhas of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Bardo, the Troll, or the Dal, who first appear to the dying person in their radiant forms and later in their demonic aspects. For many individuals on the spiritual path, the first encounter with archetypal deities occurs in the context of the death-rebirth process. The dark deities, such as Satan, Lucifer, Hades, Ahriman, Hutzilapakli, Kali, Lilith, Ranga, Kotlaku, or Moloch, would typically appear in connection with BPM-2, BPM-3, and with the ego death. Deities symbolizing death and rebirth, Osiris, Pluto, and Persephone, Attis, Adonis, Quetzalcoatl, Dionysus, Votan, Baldur, Christ, have a specific affiliation with BPM-3 and with the transition to BPM-4, the blissful deities, the Virgin Mary, Aphrodite, Apollo, Isis, Ahura Mazda, Lakshmi, or Kuan Yin, Canon, appear in ecstatic episodes related to BPM-4 or BPM-1. Archetypal images of specific deities can also be encountered quite independently in the context of psychedelic or holotropic experiences that are purely transpersonal in nature. They typically appear in the form of powerful visions that the subject is witnessing, however, an important alternative is full experiential identification with these deities. In addition to separate individual appearances, various deities can also participate in complex cosmic dramas, such as the battle between the forces of Ahriman and Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrian pantheon, the war between the Olympian gods and the Titans, the fall of Lucifer and his peer angels, the churning of the ocean by the Hindu gods and demons to obtain the nectar Amrita, and Ragnarok, or the twilight of the gods of the Nordic mythology. Subjects experiencing encounters with various blissful and wrathful deities usually have very powerful emotional reactions, 
ranging from ecstatic rapture and extreme bliss to metaphysical terror, abysmal pain, and feelings of insanity. However, as powerful as these images can be, the experience does not have the sense of confrontation with the Supreme Being, or the ultimate force in the universe. This feeling is reserved for experiences of a higher order that will be described later. The example I have chosen as an illustration for this category of experiences, is an excerpt from a high-dose LSD session. It describes an encounter and identification with the twin figures of Christ and Antichrist. The most difficult part of the experience was the identification with the devil, with the evil principle in the universe. Somewhere across from me was a most vile and nasty creature squatting down and overlooking the entire region. I had to become him, identify with this most despicable entity. I became Hitler, a general of death. I was feeling pure hate, all I wanted to do was to kill, to inflict pain, to make people suffer. It was very painful, but I had to do it. I could not believe there was so much hate in me. I could perceive hate as something tangible, as black evil substance, or dark thick kind of energy. I felt the presence of a demonic existence right next to Christ, this was the Antichrist. He too was part of the cosmic journey. All the Hitlers of the world, all the despotic rulers and tyrants were manifestations or personifications of this evil principle. The difficult realization was how close Christ and Antichrist were to each other. It was very confusing, how could one know which was which? I understood how difficult it would be on earth to find the right spiritual teacher to follow. How could one know whether a particular spiritual leader was emanating from Christ or from Antichrist? Spiritual goodness and evil were just two sides of the same coin. In a way, this close paradoxical association of the two opposite cosmic energies explained seemingly confusing human events, such as the rise of the Nazi party in Germany or the problematic developments in certain religious cults. This encounter with archetypal evil continued in the next LSD session of the same subject. At another point, I had a brief, but extremely powerful experience which I will never forget. I felt the presence of Lucifer and then saw him clearly. He was a huge dark creature, partly human and partly animal, with a hairy body, large claws, and the wings of a dragon. He was coming out of a dark cave, flying through the pitch black sky in the middle of the night like a gigantic bat. As I was looking at him from a distance, I noticed to my astonishment that his head was on fire. The devil, Lucifer himself, was being transmuted by the light into the light. I understood now why Lucifer means literally the carrier of light. He was being consumed by the purifying fire right in front of my eyes. I knew that I would no longer be afraid of evil or of the devil himself. H. Experiences of Universal Archetypes The term archetype was introduced into psychology by Carl Gustav Jung, he used this name alternately with the terms primordial image and dominant of the collective unconscious in its broadest sense, an archetype can be described as any static pattern and configuration, as well as dynamic happening in the psyche that is trans-individual and has a universal quality. Such a definition is extremely general and would apply to many transpersonal phenomena described in this section. In the Jungian literature, one can find hierarchical descriptions of various orders of archetypes. I will take the liberty to narrow the term here to those archetypes that represent truly universal patterns, rather than their specific cultural manifestations, variations, and inflections. Some of such universal archetypes represent generalized biological, psychological, social, and professional roles. Examples of biologically defined universal archetypes would be the woman, man, mother, father, child, the Jew, and the member of the white, black or yellow race. Additional psychological characteristics would then define the archetypes of the good or terrible mother, tyrant father, lover, martyr, fugitive, outcast, avarice, despot, vicious spoiler, trickster, wise old man and woman, ascetic, hermit, and many others. In some of these, the archetype reaches mythological dimensions and has a special numinous power. This is true for the images of the great and terrible mother goddess, the great hermaphrodite, or the cosmic man. Examples of archetypes representing certain professional and social types and roles would be the scientist, 
the healer, the enlightened ruler, the dictator, the worker, the revolutionary, or the capitalist. These experiences are closely related to, but not identical with, the experiences of group consciousness described earlier. In the latter, the subject feels simultaneously identified with all individual members of a particular group, the former represent personified concepts of the roles involved, something like the Platonic ideas. An example of these two types of phenomena would be the experience of the group consciousness of all the revolutionaries of the world, as compared with the experience of becoming the archetypal revolutionary. Archetypal images of this kind can be beautifully illustrated by holographic pictures created by sequential exposure of a number of people of the same category without changing the angle of the laser. At a holographic exhibition that took place several years ago in Honolulu, one of the holograms with the title The Child of Hawaii consisted of a large number of three-dimensional images of Hawaiian children occupying the same space. It was an amazing illustration of the type of experience I am discussing here. A less dramatic simulation of this phenomenon can be achieved by cumulative exposure in conventional photography, as exemplified by Francis Galton's composite photographs used by Rupert Sheldrake to illustrate his concept of morphic resonance. Another special category of archetypes represents certain personified aspects of human personality, these are C.G. Jung's famous animus, anima, and the shadow. The example I would like to use here is an experiential sequence from my own session with 200 mg of MDMA, atom or ecstasy. It combines the archetype of the apocalypse with personified archetypes of the universal principles. I started experiencing strong activation in the lower part of my body. My pelvis was vibrating as enormous amounts of energy were being released in ecstatic jolts. At one point, this streaming energy swept me along in an intoxicating frenzy into a whirling cosmic vortex of creation and destruction. In the center of this monstrous hurricane of primordial forces were four giant Herculean figures performing what seemed to be the ultimate cosmic saber dance. They had strong Mongolian features with protruding cheekbones, oblique eyes, and clean-shaven heads decorated by large braided ponytails. Whirling around in a frantic dance craze, they were swinging large weapons that looked like scythes or L-shaped scimitars, all four of these combined formed a rapidly rotating swastika. I joined the dance, becoming one of them, or possibly all four of them at once, leaving my own identity behind. Then the experience opened up into an unimaginable panorama of scenes of destruction. In these visions, natural disasters, such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, crashing meteors, forest fires, floods and tidal waves, were combined with images of burning cities, entire blocks of collapsing high-rise buildings, mass death, and horror of wars. Heading this wave of total annihilation were four archetypal images of macabre writers symbolizing the end of the world. I realized these were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The continuing vibrations and jolts of my pelvis now became synchronized with the movements of this ominous horseback riding and I became one of them. The above descriptions might create the impression that the experience was unpleasant and frightening. However, Possibly due to the generally benevolent nature of the amphetamine-related M pathogens, the dominant feeling was ecstatic merging with the unleashed energies and fascination by the incredible philosophical and spiritual insights associated with this session. I realized that the concept of the apocalypse should not be taken literally, as it is the case in the concretistic interpretations of mainstream Christianity. Although it is possible that the apocalypse will in the future be actually manifested on a planetary scale as a historical event, it is above all an archetype. As such it seems to reflect the stage in consciousness development where the individual recognizes the illusory nature of the material world. As the universe reveals its true essence as a cosmic play of consciousness, the world of matter is destroyed in the psyche of the individual. The situation here resembles an earlier stage in which identification with the archetype of crucifixion and resurrection of Christ terminates one's philosophical identification with the body. The apocalyptic visions were interspersed with archetypal images from various cultures, symbolizing the unreality of the phenomenal world. Probably the most impressive of these was the image of Plato's cave. The final major sequence of the session was a magnificent parade of personified universal principles, archetypes that through a complex interplay, 
create the illusion of the phenomenal world, the divine play that the Hindus call Lila. They were protean personages with many facets, levels and dimensions of meaning that kept changing their forms in extremely intricate holographic interpenetration as I was observing them. Each of them seemed to represent simultaneously the essence of his or her function and all the concrete manifestations of this element in the world of matter. There was Maya, a mysterious ethereal principle symbolizing the world illusion, Anima, embodying the eternal female, a Mars-like personification of war and aggression, the lovers, representing all the sexual dramas and romances throughout ages, the royal figure of the ruler, the withdrawn hermit, the elusive trickster, and many others. As they were passing across the stage, they bowed in my direction, as if expecting appreciation for the stellar performance in the divine play of the universe. I, intuitive understanding of universal symbols. Among the most interesting archetypal experiences are found insights into their esoteric meaning. Experiences of this kind support the understanding of symbols suggested by Carl Gustav Jung. In contrast to Sigmund Freud's interpretation of symbols as representing something already known but objectionable, Jung saw symbols as the best possible representations of something that belongs to a higher level of consciousness and cannot be in principle expressed in any other way. Far from being cryptic statements about simple biological functions, universal symbols refer to complex transcendental realities. What? Freud described as symbols, cryptic allusions to elements on the same level of consciousness, can best be referred to as signs. In non-ordinary states of consciousness, visions of various universal symbols can play a significant role even in experiences of individuals who previously had no interest in mysticism or were strongly opposed to anything esoteric. These visions tend to convey instant intuitive understanding of the various levels of meaning of these symbols and generate a deep interest in the spiritual path. The most frequent of these symbols that I have observed in my research were the cross, the quadrate circle, the Indo-Iranian swastika in both its ominous and peace-bestowing form, the ancient Egyptian Ankh, Nile cross or crux and seda, the lotus blossom, the Taoist yin-yang, the Hindu sacred phallus, Shiva lingam, and vulva, yoni, the diamond, and other precious stones, the Buddhist wheel, and the six-pointed star, both in its Hebrew form of the Star of David and its tantric form as the symbol of the union of the male and female energy. As a result of experiences of this kind, subjects can develop accurate understanding of various complex esoteric teachings. In some instances, persons unfamiliar with the Kabbalah had experiences described in the Zohar and Sefer Yetzirah and obtained surprising insights into Kabbalistic symbols. Others were able to describe the meaning and function of intricate mandalas used in the Tibetan Vajrayana and other tantric systems. Subjects who had previously ridiculed astrology, alchemy, and the ancient forms of divination, such as the I Ching and Tarot, suddenly discovered their deeper meaning and found genuine appreciation of their metaphysical relevance. Similarly, such illuminating insights can suddenly open skeptical individuals to Gnostic teachings or the Pythagorean theories of geometrical solids and of the numerical order in the universe. An interesting example of an entire series of images and insights related to the universal symbol of the cross can be found in the book Varieties of Psychedelic Experience by Robert Masters and Jean Houston. It comes from a psychedelic session, 100 micrograms of LSD-25, of an attorney and former divinity student who had left the seminary because of religious doubts. This experience was triggered by looking at an ornate cross offered to the subject by the experimenters. I saw Jesus crucified and Peter martyred. I watched the early Christians die in the arena, while others moved hurriedly through the Roman back streets, spreading Christ's doctrine. I stood by when Constantine gaped at the vision of the cross in the sky. I saw Rome fall and the Dark Ages begin and observed as little crossed twigs were tacked up as the only hope in ten thousand wretched hovels. I watched peasants trample it under their feet in some obscene forest rite, while, across the sea in Byzantium, they glorified it in jeweled mosaics and great domed cathedrals. My hand trembled, the cross glimmered, and history became confused. Martin Luther walked arm in arm with Billy Graham followed by Thomas Aquinas and the armies of the Crusades. 
Inquisitorial figures leveled bony fingers at demented witches and a great bout of blood poured forth to congeal in a huge, clotted cross. Pope John XXIII called out good cheer to a burning, grinning Joan of Arc, and Savonarola saluted a red-necked hellfire and brimstone Texas preacher. Bombers flew in cross formation and St. Francis preached to the birds. A hundred thousand episodes erupted from the glinting facets of that cross and I knew that a hundred thousand more were waiting for their turn. But then, and I don't know when or how it happened, I was immersed in it, my substance, physical, mental, and spiritual, was totally absorbed in the substance of the cross. My life became the glinting, sparkling episodes of the history of the cross, and the hundred thousand remaining events were those of my own life's history. The shame and victory of the cross was endlessly repeated in the minutiae of my own life. Mine was the shame and mine was the victory. I had been inquisitor and saint, had falsely damned and sublimely reasoned. And, like the cross, I too had died and lived and died, and lived and died to live again and again. And perhaps once more I would die. But now I knew, and now I know, that redemption is a constant thing and guilt is only transitory.